dedication to Jay Lake and Elmore Leonard. Gentlemen, it has been a pleasure. Prologue, Bobby Draper. A thousand worlds, Bobby thought as the tube doors closed. And not just a thousand worlds, a thousand systems. Suns, gas giants, asteroid belts. Everything that humanity had spread to a thousand times over. The screen above the seats across from her showed a newsfeed, but the speakers were broken the man's voice too fuzzed to make out the words. The graphic that zoomed in and out beside him was enough for her to follow. New data had come in from the probes that had gone through the gates. Here was another image of an unfamiliar sun, circles to mark the orbits of new planets, all of them empty. Whatever had built the protomolecule and fired it toward Earth back in the depths of time wasn't answering calls anymore. The bridge builder had opened the way, and no great gods had come streaming through. It was astounding, Bobby thought, how quickly humanity could go from what unimaginable intelligence fashioned these soul-wrenching wonders to, well, since they're not here, can I have their stuff? Excuse me, a man's phlegmy voice said. You wouldn't have a little spare change for a veteran, would you? She looked away from the screens. The man was thin, gray-faced. His body had the hallmarks of a childhood in low G. Long body, large head. He licked his lips and leaned forward. Veteran, are you? She said. Where'd you serve? Ganymede, the man said nodding and looking off with an attempt at nobility. I was there when it all came down. When I got back here, government dropped me on my ass. I'm just trying to save up enough to book passage to Ceres. I've got family there. Bobby felt a bubble of rage in her breast, but she tried to keep her voice and expression calm. You try veterans' outreach? Maybe they could help you. I just need something to eat, he said, his voice turning nasty. Bobby looked up and down the car. Usually there would be a few people in the cars at this time. The neighborhoods under the Aurori Sinus were all connected by evacuated tube, part of the great Martian terraforming project that had begun before Bobby was born and would go on long after she was dead. Just now there was no one. She considered what she would look like to the beggar. She was a big woman, tall as well as broad, but she was sitting down, and the sweater she'd chosen was a little baggy. He might have been under the misapprehension that her bulk was fat. It wasn't. What company did you serve with? She asked. He blinked. She knew she was supposed to be a little scared of him, and he was uneasy because she wasn't. Company? What company did you serve with? He licked his lips again. I don't want to... Because it's a funny thing, she said. I could have sworn I knew pretty much everyone who was on Ganymede when the fighting started. You know, you go through something like that, and you remember, because you see a lot of your friends die. What was your rank? I was gunnery sergeant. The gray face had gone closed and white. The man's mouth pinched. He pushed his hands deeper into his pockets and mumbled something. And now? Bobby went on. I work thirty hours a week with veterans outreach, and I'm just fucking sure we could give a fine, upstanding veteran like you a break. He turned, and her hand went out to his elbow faster than he could pull away. His face twisted with fear and pain. She drew him close. When she spoke, her voice was careful, each word clear and sharp. Find another story. Y yes, ma'am. The beggar said. I will. 
I'll, I'll do that. The car shifted, decelerating into the first breech candy station. She let him go and stood up. His eyes went a little wider when she did. Her genetic line went back to Samoa, and she sometimes had that effect on people who weren't expecting her. Sometimes she felt a little bad about it. Not now. Her brother lived in a nice middle-class hole in Breach Candy, not far from the lower university. She'd lived with him for a time after she got back home to Mars, and she was still putting the pieces of her life back together. It was a longer process than she'd expected, and part of the aftermath was that she felt like she owed her brother something. Family dinner nights was part of that. The halls of Breach Candy were sparse. The advertisements on the walls flickered as she came near, face recognition tracking her and offering up the products and services they thought she might want. Dating services, gym memberships, takeout shawarma, the new Mbeki Soon film, psychological counseling. Bobby tried not to take it personally. Still, she wished there were more people around, a few more faces to add variety to the mix. To let her tell herself the ads were probably meant for someone walking nearby, not for her. But Breach Candy wasn't as full as it used to be. There were fewer people in the tube stations and hallways, fewer people coming to the Veterans Outreach Program. She heard that enrollment at the upper university was down 6%. Humanity hadn't managed a single viable colony on the New Worlds yet, but the probe data was enough. Humanity had its new frontier, and the cities of Mars were feeling the competition. As soon as she stepped in the door, the rich scent of her sister-in-law's gumbo thickening the air and making her mouth water, she heard her brother and nephew, voices raised. It knotted her gut. But they were family. She loved them. She owed them. Even if they made the idea of take-out shawarma seem awfully tempting. Not what I'm saying, her nephew said. He was in upper university now, but when the family started fighting, she could still hear the six-year-old in his voice. Her brother boomed in reply. Bobby recognized the percussive tapping of his fingertips against the tabletop as he made his points drumming as a rhetorical device. Their father did the same thing. Mars is not optional. Tap. It is not secondary. Tap. These gates and whatever's on the other side of them isn't our home. The terraforming effort... I'm not arguing against the terraforming, her nephew said as she walked into the room. Her sister-in-law nodded to her from the kitchen wordlessly. Bobby nodded back. The dining room looked down into a living space where a muted newsfeed was showing long-distance images of unfamiliar planets with a beautiful black man in wire-rimmed glasses speaking earnestly between them. All I'm saying is that we're going to have a lot of new data. Data! That's all I'm saying! The two of them were hunched over the table like there was an invisible chessboard between them, a game of concentration and intellect that wrapped them both up until they couldn't see the world around them. In a lot of ways, that was true. She took her chair without either of them acknowledging she'd arrived. Mars, her brother said, is the most studied planet there is. It doesn't matter how many new data sets you get that aren't about Mars. They aren't about Mars. It's like saying that seeing pictures of a thousand other tables will tell you about the one you're already sitting at. Knowledge is good, her nephew said. You're the one who always told me that. I don't know why you're getting so bent about it now. How are things for you, Bobby? Her sister-in-law said sharply, carrying a bowl to the table. Rice and peppers to use as a bed for the gumbo, and a reminder to the others that there was a guest. The two men scowled at the interruption. Good, Bobby said. 
The contract with the shipyards came through. It should help us place a lot of vets in new jobs. Because they're building exploration ships and transports, her nephew said. David. Sorry, Mom, but they are. David replied, not backing down. Bobby scooped the rice into her bowl. All the ships that are easy to retrofit, they're retrofitting, and then they're making more so that people can go to all the new systems. Her brother took the rice and the serving spoon, chuckling under his breath to make it clear how little he respected his son's opinion. The first real survey team is just getting to the first of these places. There are already people living on New Terra, Dad. There were a bunch of refugees from Ganymede. He broke off, shooting a guilty glance at Bobby. Ganymede wasn't something they talked about over dinner. The survey team hasn't landed yet, her brother said. It's going to be years before we have anything like real colonies out there. It's going to be generations before anyone walks on the surface here. We don't have a fucking magnetosphere. Language, David. Her sister-in-law returned. The gumbo was black and fragrant with a sheen of oil across the top. The smell of it made Bobby's mouth water. She put it on the slate trivet and handed the serving spoon to Bobby. And how's your new apartment? She asked. It's nice, Bobby said. Inexpensive. I wish you weren't living in Ennis Shallow, her brother said. It's a terrible neighborhood. No one's going to bother Aunt Bobby, her nephew said. She'd rip their heads off. Bobby grinned. No, I just look at them mean and they... From the living room, there was a sudden glow of red light. The newsfeed had changed. Bright red banners showed at the top and bottom, and on the screen, a jowly earth woman looked soberly into the camera. The image behind her was of fire, and then a stock image of an old colony ship. The words, black against the white of the flames, read, Tragedy on New Terra. What happened? Bobby said. What just happened? Chapter One Bossia Bossia Merton had been a gentle man once. He hadn't been the sort of man who made bombs out of old metal lubricant drums and mining explosives. He rolled another one out of the little workshop behind his house and toward one of First Landing's electric carts. The little stretch of buildings spread to the north and south, and then ended, the darkness of the plain stretching to the horizon. The flashlight hanging from his belt bounced as he walked, casting strange moving shadows across the dusty ground. Small alien animals hooted at him from outside the circle of light. Nights on Illus, he wouldn't call it New Terra, were very dark. The planet had thirteen tiny, low-albedo moons, spaced so consistently in the same orbit that everyone assumed they were alien artifacts. Wherever they'd come from, they were more like captured asteroids than real moons to someone who grew up on the planet-sized satellites of Jupiter. And they did nothing to catch and reflect the light of Illus's sun once it set. The local nighttime wildlife was mostly small birds and lizards, or what Illus knew human inhabitants thought of as birds and lizards. They shared only the most superficial external traits and a primarily carbon base with their terrestrial namesakes. Basia grunted with effort as he lifted the barrel onto the back of the cart, and a second later an answering grunt came from a few meters away. A mimic lizard. Curiosity drawing it right up to the edge of the light, its small eyes glittering. It grunted again, its wide, leathery, bullfrog-shaped head bobbing, and the air sac below its neck inflating and deflating with the sound. It waited for a moment, staring at him, and when he didn't respond, it crawled off into the dark. 
Basia pulled elastic straps out of a toolbox and began securing the barrels to the bed of the cart. The explosive wouldn't go off just from falling on the ground. Or that was what Coop said. Anyhow, Basia didn't feel like testing it. Baz, Lucia said. He flushed with embarrassment like a small boy caught stealing candy. Lucia knew what he was doing. He'd never been able to lie to her. But he'd hoped she would stay inside while he worked. Just her presence made him wonder if he was doing the right thing. If it was right, why did it make him so ashamed to have Lucia see him? Boz, she said again, not insisting, her voice sad, not angry. Lucy, he said, turning around. She stood at the edge of his light, a white robe clutched around her thin frame against the chill night air. Her face was a dark blur. Thalcia's crying, she said, her tone not making it an accusation. She's afraid for you. Come talk to your daughter. Basia turned away and pulled the strap tight over the barrels, hiding his face from her. I can't. They're coming, he said. Who? Who's coming? You know what I mean. They're going to take everything we made here if we don't make a stand. We need time. This is how you get time. Without the landing pad, they've got to use the small shuttles. So we take away the landing pad, make them rebuild it. No one's going to get hurt. If it gets bad, she said, we can leave. No, Basia said, surprised to hear the violence in his voice. He turned and took a few steps, putting her face in the light. She was weeping. No more leaving. We left Ganymede left Katoa and ran away, and my family lived on a ship for a year, while no one would give us a place to land. We're not running again. Not ever running again. They took all the children from me they get to take. I miss Katoa, too, Lucia said. But these people didn't kill him. It was a war. It was a business decision. They made a business decision. And then they made a war, and they took my son away. And I let them, he didn't say. I took you and Felsia and Jasek, and I left Katoa behind because I thought he was dead, and he wasn't. The words were too painful to speak, but Lucia heard them anyway. It wasn't your fault. Yes, it was. Floated at the back of his mouth but he swallowed. These people don't have any right to Willis, he said, struggling to make his voice sound reasonable. We were here first. We staked claim. We'll get the first load of lithium out, get the money in. Then we can hire lawyers back home to make a real case. If the corporations already have roots here when that happens, it won't matter. We just need time. If you do this, Lucia said, they'll send you to jail. Don't do that to us. Don't do that to your family. I'm doing this for my family, he said softly. It was worse than yelling. He hopped up behind the controls and stomped on the accelerator. The cart lurched off with a whine. He didn't look back, couldn't look back and see Lucy. For my family, he said again. He drove away from his house and the ramshackle town that they'd started out calling First Landing back when they'd picked the site off the Barba Piccola's sensor maps. No one had bothered to rename it when it had moved from being an idea to being a place. He drove toward the center of town, two rows of prefab buildings, until he hit the wide stretch of flattened dirt that served as the main road and turned toward the original landing site. The refugees who'd colonized Illus had come down from their ship in small shuttles, 
so the only landing pad they'd needed was a flat stretch of ground. But the Royal Charter Energy people, the corporate people, who had a UN charter giving the world to them, would be coming down with heavy equipment. Heavy lift shuttles needed an actual landing pad. It had been built in the same open fields that the colony had used as their landing site. That felt obscene to Bossia, invasive. The first landing site had significance. He'd imagined it someday being a park, with a monument at the center commemorating their arrival on this new world. Instead, RCE had built a giant and gleaming metal monstrosity right over the top of their site. Worse, they'd hired the colonists to build it, and enough of them had thought it was a good idea that they'd actually done it. It felt like being erased from history. Scotty and Coop were waiting for him at the new landing pad when he arrived. Scotty was sitting on the edge of the metal platform, legs dangling over the side, smoking a pipe and spitting on the ground below his feet. A small electrical lamp that sat beside him colored him with an eerie green light. Coop stood a little way off, looking up at the sky with bared teeth. Coop was an old-school belter, and the agoraphobia treatments had been harder for him than others. The thin-faced man kept staring up at the void, fighting to get used to it like a kid pulling off scabs. Bossia pulled the cart up to the edge of the pad and hopped out to undo the straps holding the barrel bombs down. Give me a hand, he said. Illus was a large planet, slightly over one gravity. Even after six months of pharma to build his muscles and bones, Everything still felt too heavy. The thought of lifting the barrels back to the ground made the muscles in his shoulders twitch in anticipated exhaustion. Scotty slid off the landing pad and dropped a meter and a half to the ground. He pushed his oily black hair out of his eyes and took another long puff on his pipe. Bossia caught the pungent, skunky smell of Scotty's bathtub-grown cannabis mixed with freeze-dried tobacco leaves. Coop looked over, his eyes fighting for focus for a moment, and then the thin, cruel smile. The plan had been Coop's from the start. Mmm, Coop said. Pretty. Don't get attached, Basia said. They won't be around long. Coop made a booming sound and grinned. Together, they pulled the four heavy barrels off the cart and stood them in a row next to the pad. By the last one, they were all panting with effort. Basia leaned against the cart for a moment in silence, while Scotty smoked off the last of his pipe, and Coop set the blasting caps on the barrels. The detonators sat in the back of the cart like sleeping rattlesnakes, the red LEDs dormant for now. In the darkness, the township sparkled. The houses they'd all built for themselves and one another glittered like stars brought down from the sky. Beyond them, there were the ruins. A long, low alien structure with two massive towers rising up above the landscape, like a termite hill writ large. All of it was run through with passageways and chambers that no human had designed. In daylight, the ruins shone with the eerie colors of Mother of Pearl. In the night, they were only a deeper darkness. The mining pits were off past them, invisible as all but the dimmest glow of the work lights on the belly of the clouds. Truth was, Basia didn't like the mines. The ruins were strange relics of the empty planet's past, and like anything that was uncanny without posing a threat, they faded from his awareness after the first few months. The mines carried history and expectations. He'd spent half a lifetime in tunnels of ice, and tunnels that ran through alien soil smelled wrong. Coop made a sharp noise and shook his hand, cursing. Nothing blew up, so it couldn't be that bad. 
You think they'll pay us to rebuild it? Scotty asked. Fasia cursed and spat on the ground. We wouldn't have to do this if it wasn't for people wanting to suck on RCE's tit, he said as he rolled the last barrel into place. They can't land without this. All we had to do was not build it. Scotty laughed out a cloud of smoke. They were coming anyway. Might as well take their money. That's what people said. People are idiots, Basia said. Scotty nodded, then smacked a mimic lizard off the passenger seat of the cart with one hand and sat down. He put his feet up on the dash and took another long puff on his pipe. We're gonna have to get gone if we blow this. That blasting powder makes serious boom. I might, Coop shouted. We're good. Let's make the place, huh? Scotty stood and started walking toward the pad. Basia stopped him, plucked the lit pipe from between his lips, and put it on the hood of the cart. Explosives, Basia said. They explode. Scotty shrugged, but he also looked chagrined. Coop was already easing the first barrel down onto its side when they reached him. It's buena work, this. Solid. Thank you, Basia said. Coop lay down, back against the ground. Basia lay beside him. Scotty rolled the first bomb gently between them. Basia climbed under the pad, pulling himself through the tangle of crisscrossed eye beams to each of the four barrels, turning on the remote detonators and sinking them. He heard a growing electric whine and felt a moment of irritation at Scotty for driving off with the cart, before he realized the sound was of a cart arriving, not leaving. Hey! Peter's familiar voice yelled. Kayla Moog bastard doing here? Coop muttered, wiping his hand across his forehead. You want me to go find out? Scotty asked. Boss ya, Coop said. Go see what Peter needs. Scotty hasn't got his back dirty yet. Basia shifted himself out from under the landing and made room for Scotty and the last of the four bombs. Peter's cart was parked beside his own, and Peter stood between them, shifting from one foot to the other like he needed to piss. Basia's back and arms ached. He wanted this all over and to be back home with Lucia and Felsia and Yasek. What? Basia said. They're coming, Pete said, whispering as if there were anyone who could hear them. Who's coming? Everyone. The provisional governor, the corporate security team, science and tech staff, everybody. This is serious. They're landing a whole new government for us. Basia shrugged. Old news. They've been burning eighteen months. That's why we're out here. No. Pete said, prancing nervously and looking up at the stars. They're coming right now. Edward Israel did a breaking burn half an hour ago. Got into high orbit. The copper taste of fear flooded Basia's mouth. He looked up at the darkness. A billion unfamiliar stars. His same Milky Way galaxy, everyone figured, just seen from a different angle. His eyes shifted frantically, and then he caught it. The movement was subtle as the minute hand on an analog clock, but he saw it. The dropship was dropping. The heavy shuttle was coming for the landing pad. I was going to get on the radio, but Coop said they monitor radio spectrum and— Pete said. But by then, Basia was already running back to the landing pad. Scotty and Coop were just pulling themselves out— Coop clapped clouds of dust off his pants and grinned. We got a problem, Basia said. Ship's already dropped. Looks like they're in the atmosphere already. Coop looked up. The brightness from his flashlight threw shadows across his cheeks and into his eyes. Huh, he said. 
I thought you were on this, man. I thought you were paying attention to where they were. Coop shrugged, neither agreeing nor denying. We've got to get the bombs back out, Basia said. Scotty started to kneel, but Coop put a restraining hand on his shoulder. Why? he asked. They try to land now? They could set it all off, Basia said. Coop's smile was gentle. Good, he said. And what if? Basia balled his fists. They're coming down now. See that? Coop said. Doesn't inspire a great sense of obligation. And however you cut it, there ain't time to pull them. Can take off the primers and caps, Basia said, hunkering down. He played his flashlight over the pad's superstructure. Maybe could, maybe couldn't, Coop said. Questions should, and it's a limp little question. Coop, Scotty said, his voice thin and uncertain. Coop ignored him. Opportunity, looks like to me, Coop said. There's people on that thing, Basia said, crawling under the pad. The nearest bomb's electronics were flat against the dirt. He put his aching shoulder against it and pushed. Isn't time, mate, Coop called. Might be if you got your ass in here, Basia shouted. The blasting cap clung to the barrel's side like a tick. Basia tried to dig his fingers into the sealant goo and pry the cap away. Oh, shit, Scotty said with something too much like awe in his voice. Buzz! Oh, shit! The cap came loose. Basia pushed it in his pocket and started crawling toward the second bomb. No time, Coop shouted. Best we get clear. Try to blow it while they can still pull up. In the distance, he heard one of the carts taking off, Pete going for distance, and under that, another sound, the bass roar of breaking engines. He looked at the three remaining bombs in despair and rolled out from under the pad. The shuttle was massive in the black sky, so close he could make out the individual thrusters. He wasn't going to make it. Run! He shouted. He and Scotty and Coop sprinted back toward the cart. The roar of the shuttle rose, grew deafening. Basia reached the cart and scooped up the detonator. If he could blow it early, the shuttle could pull out, get away. Don't! Coop shouted. We're too close! Basia slammed his palm on the button. The ground rose up, hitting him hard, the rough dirt and rocks tearing at his hands and cheek as he came to a stop. But the pain was a distant thing. Some part of him knew he might be hurt very badly, might be in shock, but that seemed distant and easy to ignore, too. What struck him most was how quiet everything was. The world of sound stopped at his skull. He could hear his own breath, his heartbeat. Everything past that had the volume turned down to one. He rolled onto his back and stared up at the star-speckled night sky. The heavy shuttle streaked overhead, half of it trailing fire, the sound of its engines no longer a bass roar, but the scream of a wounded animal that he felt in his belly more than heard. The shuttle had been too close, the blast too large, some unlucky debris thrown into just the right path. No way to know. Some part of Bossia knew this was very bad, but it was hard to pay much attention to it. The shuttle disappeared from view, shrieking a death wail across the valley that came to him as a faint, high piping sound then sudden silence. Scotty was sitting beside him on the ground, staring off in the direction the ship had gone. Basia let himself lie back down. 
when the bright spots it had left in his vision faded, the stars returned. Basia watched them twinkle and wondered which one was Sol. So far away, but with the gates close, too. He'd knocked their shuttle down. They'd have to come now. He'd left them no choice. A sudden spasm of coughing took him. It felt like his lungs were full of fluid, and he coughed it up for several minutes. With the coughing, the pain finally came, racking him from head to foot. With the pain came the fear. Chapter 2 Elvi The shuttle bucked, throwing Elvi Okoy against her restraints hard enough to knock the wind out of her and then pushing her back into the overwhelming embrace of her crash couch. The light flickered, went black, and then came back. She swallowed, her excitement and anticipation turning to animal fear. Beside her, Eric Vanderwert smiled the same half-leering, half-hopeful smile he'd flickered toward her over the past six months. Across from her, Fayez's eyes had gone wide, his skin gray. It's okay, Elvie said. It's going to be okay. Even as she spoke the words, a part of her cringed away from them. She didn't know what was going on. There was no earthly way she could know that anything was going to be okay. And still, her first impulse was to assert it. To say it as if saying it made it true. A high whine rippled through the flesh of the shuttle, overtones crashing into each other. She felt her weight lurch to the left, the crash couches all shifting on their gimbals at the same time, like choreographed dancers. She lost sight of Fayez. A tritone chime announced the pilot, and her voice came over the shuttle's public address system. Ladies and gentlemen, it appears there has been a critical malfunction at the landing pad. We will not be able to complete the landing at this time. We will be returning to orbit and docking with the Edward Israel until such time as we can assess— She went quiet, but the hiss of an open line still ran through the ship. Elvie imagined the pilot distracted by something. The ship lurched and stuttered, and Elvie grabbed her restraints, hugging them to her. Someone nearby was praying loudly. Ladies and gentlemen, the pilot said. I'm afraid the malfunction at the landing pad has done our shuttle some damage. I don't think we're going to make it back upstairs right away. We have a dry lake bed not too far from here. I think we're going to take a look at that as a secondary landing site. Elvie felt a moment's relief. We still have a landing site. Followed at once by a deeper understanding and a deeper fear. She means we're going to crash. I'm going to ask everyone to remain in their couches, the pilot said. Don't take off your belts, and please keep your arms and legs inside the couch's shell where it won't bang against the side. The gel's there for a reason. We'll have you all down in just a couple minutes here. The forced, artificial calmness terrified Elvie more than shrieking and weeping would have. The pilot was doing everything she could to keep them all from panicking. Would anyone do that if they didn't think panic was called for? Her weight shifted again, pulling to the left and then back, and then she grew light as the shuttle descended. The fall seemed to last forever. The rattle and whine of the shuttle rose to a screaming pitch. Elvie closed her eyes. We're going to be fine, she said to herself. Everything's okay. The impact split the shuttle open like lobster tail under a hammer. She had the brief impression of unfamiliar stars in a foreign sky, and her consciousness blinked out like God had turned off a switch. Centuries before, Europeans had invaded the plague-emptied shell of the Americas, climbing aboard wooden ships with vast canvas sails, 
and trusting the winds and the skill of sailors to take them from the lands they knew to what they called the New World. For as long as six months, religious fanatics and adventurers and the poverty-stricken desperate had consigned themselves to the uncharitable waves of the Atlantic Ocean. Eighteen months ago, Elvi Okoy left Ceres Station under contract to Royal Charter Energy. The Edward Israel was a massive ship. Once, almost three generations before, it had been one of the colony ships that had taken humanity to the belt and the Jovian system. When the outpouring had ended and the pressure to expand had met its natural limits, the Israel had been repurposed as a water hauler. The age of expansion was over, and the romance of freedom gave way to the practicalities of life. Air, water, and food, in that order. For decades, the ship had been a workhorse of the solar system, and then the ring had opened. Everything changed again. Back at the Bush shipyards and Tycho Station, a new generation of colony ships was being built, but the retrofit of the Israel had been faster. When she'd stepped inside it the first time, Elvi had felt a sense of wonder and hope and excitement in the hum of the Israel's air recyclers and the angles of her old-fashioned corridors. The age of adventure had come again, and the old warrior had returned, sword newly sharpened and armor shining again after tarnished years. Elvi had known that it was a psychological projection, that it said more about her own state of mind than anything physical about the ship, but that didn't diminish it. The Edward Israel was a colony ship once more, her holds filled with prefabbed buildings and high-atmosphere probes, manufacturing labs, and even a repeat-scatter femtoscope. They had an exploration and mapping team, a geological survey team, a hydrology team, Elvie's own exozoological workgroup, and more. A university's worth of PhDs and a government lab's load of postdocs. Between crew and colonists, a thousand people. They were a city in the sky and a boat of pilgrims bound for Plymouth Rock and Darwin's voyage on the Beagle all at the same time. It was the grandest and most beautiful adventure humanity had ever been on, and Elvie had earned a place on the exobiology team. In that context, imagining that the steel and ceramic of the ship was imbued with a sense of joy was a permissible illusion. And all of it was ruled over by Governor Trying. She'd seen him several times in the months they'd spent burning and breaking, then making the slow, eerie transit between rings, and then burning and breaking again. It wasn't until just before the drop itself that she'd actually spoken with him. Trying was a thin man. His mahogany skin and snowdust hair reminded her of her uncle's, and his ready smile reassured and calmed. She had been in the observation deck, pretending that the high-resolution screens looking down on the planet were really windows, that the light of this unfamiliar sun was actually bouncing off the wide, muddy seas and high-frosted clouds and passing directly into her eyes, even though the deceleration gravity meant they weren't in free orbit yet. It was a strange, beautiful sight. A single, massive ocean scattered with islands. A large continent that sprawled comfortably across half of a hemisphere, widest at the equator and then tapering as it reached north and south. The official name of the world was Bering Survey 4, named for the probe that had first established its existence. In the corridors and cafeteria and gym, they'd all come to call it New Terra. So at least she wasn't the only one swept up by the romance. What are you thinking, Dr. Okoy? Trying's gentle voice asked, 
and Elvi had jumped. She hadn't heard him come in, hadn't seen him beside her. She felt like she was supposed to bow or make some sort of formal report. But his expression was so soft, so amused, she let it go. I'm wondering what I did to deserve all this, she said. I'm about to see the first genuinely alien biosphere. I'm about to learn things about evolution that were literally impossible to know until now. I must have been a very, very good person in a past life. In the screens, new Terra glittered brown and gold and blue. The high atmospheric winds smudged greenish clouds halfway around the planet. Elvi leaned in toward it. The governor chuckled. You will be famous, he said. Elvi blinked and coughed out a laugh. <laughs> I guess I will be, won't I? She said. We're doing things humanity's never done before. Some things, Trying said. And some things we have always done. I hope history treats us gently. She didn't quite know what he'd meant by that, but before she could ask, Adolphus Murtry came in. A thin man with hard, blue eyes, Murtry was the head of security, and as hard and efficient as trying was a vuncular. The two men had walked off together, leaving Elvie alone with the world that was about to be hers to explore. The heavy shuttle was as large as some ships Elvie had been on. They'd had to build a landing pad on the surface just to support it. It carried the first fifty structures, basic array laboratories, and, most important, a hard perimeter dome. She had filed through the close-packed hallway of the shuttle, letting her hand terminal lead her toward her assigned crash couch. When the first colonies had begun on Mars, the perimeter domes had been a question of survival, something to hold in air and keep out radiation. On New Terra, it was all about limiting contamination. The corporate charter that RCE had taken required that their presence have the smallest possible footprint. She'd heard that there were other people already on the planetary surface, and hopefully they were also being careful not to disturb the sites they were on. If they weren't, the interactions between local organisms and the ones that had been shipped in would be complex, maybe impossible to tease apart. You look troubled. Fayez Sarkis sat on a crash couch, strapping the wide belts across his chest and waist. He'd grown up on Mars and had the tall, thin frame and large head of low gravity. He looked at home in a crash couch. Elvie realized her hand terminal was telling her that she'd found her own place. She sat, the gel forming itself around her thighs and lower back. She always wanted to sit up in a crash couch, like a kid in a wading pool. Letting herself sink into it felt too much like being eaten. Just thinking ahead, she said forcing herself to lie back. Lot of work to be done. I know, Fayez said with a sigh. Break time's over. Now we have to actually earn our keep. Still, it was fun while it lasted. I mean, apart from burning at a full G. New Terra's a little over that, you know. Don't remind me, he said. I don't know why we couldn't start with some nice balsa wood planet with a civilized gravity well. Luck of the draw, Elvie said. Well, as soon as we get papers for a decent Mars-like planet, I am transferring. You and half of Mars. I know, right? Some place with maybe a breathable atmosphere. A magnetic field, so we don't all have to live like mole rats. It's like having the terraforming project done already, except I'm alive to see it. Elvie laughed. 
Fayez was on the geology team and the hydrological work group both. He'd studied at the best universities outside Earth, and she knew from long acquaintance that he was at least as frightened and delighted as she was. Eric Vanderwert came by, easing himself into the couch beside Elvi. She smiled at him politely. In the year and a half out from Ceres, there had been any number of romantic, or if not romantic, at least sexual connections made between members of the science teams. Elvi had kept herself out of that tangle. She'd learned early that sexual entanglements and work were a toxic and unstable mixture. Eric nodded to Fayez, then turned his attention to her. Exciting, he said. Yes, Elvi said, and across from her, Fayez rolled his eyes. Murtry walked through, stepping between the crash couches. His gaze flickered over everything, the couches, the belts, the faces of the people preparing for drop. Elvi smiled at him, and he nodded to her sharply. It wasn't hostile, just businesslike. She watched him size her up. It wasn't the sexual way that a man considered a woman. It was like a loader making sure a crate's magnetic clamps were firing. He nodded to her again, apparently satisfied that she'd gotten her belts right, and moved on. When he was out of sight, Fayez chuckled. Poor bastards chewing the walls, he said, nodding after Murtry. Is he? Eric said. Had us all under his thumb for a year and a half, hasn't he? Now we're going down and he's staying in orbit. Man's petrified that we're all going to get ourselves killed on his watch. At least he cares, Elvie said. I like him for that. You like everyone, Fayez teased. It's your pathology. You don't like anyone. That's mine, he said, grinning. The tritone alert came and the public address system clicked. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Patricia Silva, and I'm your pilot on this little milk run. A chorus of laughter rose from the crash couches. We're going to be detaching from the Israel in about ten minutes, and we're expecting the drop to take about fifty. So an hour from now, you're all going to be breathing entirely new air. We've got the governor on board, so we're going to make sure this all goes smooth and easy, so we can put in for a performance bonus. Everyone was giddy then, even the pilot. Elvi grinned and Fayez grinned back at her. Eric cleared his throat. Well, Fayez said with mock resignation, we came all this way. I suppose we should finish it. The pain didn't have a location. It was too large for that. It spread everywhere, encompassed everything. Elvi realized that she'd been looking at something, a massive, articulated crab leg, maybe, or a broken construction crane. The flat ground of the lake bed stretched out toward it, and then grew rougher until it reached the thing's base. She could imagine it had pushed its way out of the dark, dry soil, or that it had crashed down into it. Her agonized mind tried to make it into debris from the shuttle and failed. It was an artifact. Ruins. Some arcane structure left from the alien civilization that had designed the protomolecule and the rings. Abandoned and empty now. Elvie had the sudden, powerful and disjointed memory of an art exhibit she'd seen as a girl. There had been a high-resolution image of a bicycle in a ditch outside the ruins of Glasgow. The aftermath of disaster in a single image, as compressed and eloquent as a poem. At least I got to see it, she thought. At least I got to be here before I died. Someone dragged her out of the ruined shuttle. When she turned her head, she could see construction lights burning yellow-white 
and the others laid out on the flat ground in rows. Some were standing, moving among the injured and the dead. She didn't recognize their faces or the way their bodies moved. After a year and a half on the Israel, she knew everyone on sight, and these were strangers. The locals, then. The squatters. Illegals. The air smelled like burning dust and cumin. She must have blacked out, because the woman seemed to appear at Elvie's side in the blink of an eye. Her hands were bloody, and her face smeared with dirt and gore, not her own. You're banged up, but you're not in any immediate danger. I'm going to give you something for the pain, but I need you to stay still until we can splint your leg, all right? She was beautiful in a severe way. Her dark cheeks had dots of pure black scattered across them like beads in a veil. Threads of white laced the black waves of her hair like moonlight on water. Only there was no moonlight on New Terra. Only billions of strange stars. All right? The woman asked again. All right, Elvie said. Tell me what you just agreed to. I don't remember. The woman leaned back, her hand pressing gently against Elvie's shoulder. Tori, I'm going to need a scan on this one's head. She may be concussed. Another voice, a man's, came from the darkness. Yes, Dr. Merton. As soon as I'm done with this one. Dr. Merton turned back to her. If I get up right now, are you going to stay where you are until Tori gets here? No, it's all right. I can come help, Elvie said. I'm sure you can, the beautiful woman said with a sigh. Let's just wait for him, then. A shadow loomed up from the darkness. She recognized Fayez by the way he walked. Go ahead. I'll sit with her. Thank you. Dr. Merton said, and then vanished. Fayez lowered himself to the ground with a grunt and crossed his legs. His hair stood out from his slightly oversized head at all angles. His lips were pressed thin. Elvie took his hand without intending to, and she felt him pull back for a second, before permitting her fingers to stay touching his. What happened? she asked. The landing pad blew up. Oh, she said, and then, do they do that? No, no, they really don't. She tried to think through that. If they don't, then how could it have happened? Her mind was clearing enough for her to notice how compromised she was. Unnerving, but probably a good sign. How bad is it? She felt Fayez's shrug more than saw it. Bad. Only significant good news is that the village is close, and their doctor's competent. Trained on Ganymede. Now, if our supplies weren't all on fire or smashed under a couple tons of metal and ceramics, she might be able to do something. The work group? I saw Gregorio. He's all right. Eric's dead. I don't know what happened to Sophie, but I'll go look some more once they get to you. Eric was dead. Minutes before, he'd been in the couch beside her, trying to flirt and being annoying. She didn't understand it. Sudyam? she asked. She's back on the Israel. She's fine. That's good, then. Fayez squeezed her hand and let it go. The air felt cool against her palm where his skin had abandoned it. He looked out over the rows of bodies toward the wreckage of the shuttle. It was so dark, she could hardly make him out except where he blotted out the stars. Governor Trying didn't make it, he said. Didn't make it? Dead as last week's rat. We're not sure who's in charge of anything now. She felt tears forming in her eyes, and an ache bloomed in her chest that had nothing to do with her injuries. She recalled the man's gentle smile, the warmth of his voice. 
His work was only starting. It was strange that Eric's death should skip across the surface of her mind like a stone thrown over water, and Governor Trying's should strike so deep. I'm so sorry, she said. Yeah, well, we're on an alien planet a year and a half from home with our initial supplies and toothpick-sized splitters, and the odds-on bet for what happened is sabotage by the same people who are presently giving us medical care. Dead's not good, but at least it's simple. We may all envy trying before this is over. You don't mean that. It's going to be okay. Elvie? Fayez said with a sardonic chuckle. I believe that it isn't. Chapter 3 Havelock Hey! The engineer said blearily from the cell. Havelock, you're not still pissed, are you? Not my job to be pissed, Williams. Havelock replied from where he floated beside his desk. The internal security station of the Edward Israel was small. Two desks, eight cells, a space as much brig as office. And with the ship in high orbit, the loss of effective gravity made it seem even smaller. Look, I know I got out of line, but I'm sober now. You can let me out. Havelock checked his hand terminal. Another fifty minutes, he said, and you'll be free to go. Come on, Havelock, have a heart. It's policy. Nothing I can do about it. Dimitri Havelock had worked security contracts for eight different corporations over thirteen years. Pinkwater, Star Helix, El Hashem Cooperative, Stone and Sibbets, among others. Even briefly, Protogen. He'd been in the belt, on Earth, Mars, and Luna. He'd done long-haul work on supply ships heading from Ganymede to Earth. He'd dealt with everything from riots to intimate violence, to drug trafficking, to one idiot who'd had a thing for stealing people's socks. He hadn't seen everything, but he'd seen a lot. Enough to know he'd probably never see everything. And enough to recognize that how he reacted to a crisis was more about the people on his team than with the crisis itself. When the reactor had gone on Atten base, his partner and supervisor had both panicked, and Havelock remembered the overwhelming fear in his own gut. When the riots had started on Ceres after the ice hauler Canterbury had been destroyed, his partner had been more weary than fearful, and Havelock had faced the situation with the same grim resignation. When the Ibisu had been quarantined for Nipah virus, his boss had been energized, almost elated, running the ship like a puzzle that had to be solved, and Havelock had been caught up in the pleasure of doing an important thing well. Humans, Havelock knew from long experience, were first and foremost social animals, and he himself was profoundly human. It was more romantic, hell, more masculine, to pretend he was an island, unaffected by the waves of emotion around him. But it wasn't true, and he'd made his peace with that fact. When the word came that the heavy shuttle's landing pad had exploded and the reports of casualties started coming in, Murtry's response had been an efficient and focused rage, and so Havelock's had been too. All the activity was on the planetary surface, so the only outlet had been on the Edward Israel itself, and how things went on the Israel were firmly in Havelock's wheelhouse. Please! Williams whined from the cell. I need to get some clean clothes. It's not going to make any difference, is it? A few minutes? If it's not going to make any difference, it won't matter if you see it through. Havelock said. Forty-five minutes, and you're on your way. 
Just sit back and try to enjoy them. Can't sit back when you're floating in orbit. It's a metaphor. Don't be a literalist. The Edward Israel assignment had been a great contract. Royal Charter Energy was the first real expedition out into the new systems that the rings had opened up, and the importance of the company put on the mission's success were reflected in the size of the benefit package they were willing to put together. Every day on the Israel had been paid a hazard bonus, even when they were just loading on supplies and crew from Luna. And with almost a year and a half out, a six-year stretch before the scheduled return to Earth, and another eighteen months back, all at full pay, it was almost less a contract than a career plan. And still, Havelock had hesitated before he signed up. He'd seen the footage from Eros and Ganymede, the bloodbath in the so-called slow zone, when the alien defenses had stopped the ships suddenly enough to slaughter a third of the people in them, with the massive density of scientists and engineers packed into the Israel, it was impossible to forget that they were going into the unknown. Here there be monsters. And now Governor Trying was dead. Severn Astrapani, the statistician who'd sung real pop classics in the talent competition, was dead. Amanda Chu, who'd flirted with Havelock one time when they were both a little tipsy, was dead. Half the men and women on the first team were injured. The supplies on the heavy shuttle and the heavy shuttle itself were gone. And the quiet that came over the Edward Israel was like the moment of shock between the impact of a blow and the pain. And then the rage and the grief. Not only the crews. Havelock's, too. His hand terminal chimed. The message was tagged for security services. Murtry, Way, Trajan, Smith, and himself. Havelock opened it with a sense of pleasure. He might be the least senior person in the room, but he was still in the room. Being included made him feel like maybe he'd have some control over events after all. It was an illusion, but that didn't bother him. He took in the message quickly, nodded to himself, and keyed the release code for the cell. You're in luck, he said. I've got a meeting I have to be at. Williams pulled himself out of the cell. His salt and pepper hair was disarrayed, and his skin looked grayer than usual. Thank you, he said sullenly. Just don't do that again, Havelock said. Things are going to be hard enough without people who should know better making it worse. I was just drunk, the engineer said. I didn't mean anything by it. I know, Havelock said. Just don't let it happen again, all right? Williams nodded not making eye contact, then pulled himself along the handholds and launched himself up the tube toward the crew quarters and clothes that weren't ripped or stained with vomit. Havelock waited until he'd gone, then shut down the security station and headed toward the meeting room. Murtry was already there. He was a small man, but with an energy that seemed to radiate from him like heat. Havelock knew that the security chief had worked corporate prisons and high-end industrial security his whole career. Between that and the simple fact that he'd been put in charge of the Israel, he didn't have to work for respect from the team. Floating beside him, information specialist Chandra Way and ground operations second Hassan Smith looked serious and grim. Havelock? Murtry said. Sir. Havelock nodded back, taking hold of a handhold and turning himself so that his head was in the same basic orientation as everyone else's. A few seconds later, Reeve, Murtry's second, floated in. Murtry nodded. 
Close the door, Reeve. Trajan? Wei asked, but from the bleak sound of her voice, she already suspected the answer. Trajan died in the shuttle, Murtry said. Smith, you're getting promoted. Sorry to hear that, sir, Smith said. Trajan was a good officer and a professional. She'll be missed. Yeah, Murtry said. So we're here to talk about the response plan. Drop a rock on the squatters? Wei said, her voice joking in a way that had nothing to do with humor. Murtry smiled anyway. We're going to play it a little more by the book for now, Murtry said. Besides, we still have people down there. I've sent back to the home office and I've asked for latitude in how we engage the issue. I'm fairly sure, given the circumstances, we'll have cover from them if it comes to that. We're a year and a half from anywhere, Wei said. The implication, no one can stop us from doing anything we choose, hung in the air. We're also hours away from every screen and news feed from Earth to Neptune, Reeve said. This sucks, but we've got the moral high ground. If we overreact, it'll be another round of the evil corporations oppressing the poor belters. We're in a post-protogen world. We don't win that. Didn't know they'd made you a political officer, Wei said, and Reeves' jaw went tight. When Murtry spoke, his voice was calm and level and threatening as a rattlesnake. That. We're not doing that. Sir, Reeves said. The thing where we start sniping at each other. We don't do that here. Way and Reeve looked at each other. I'm sorry, sir, Way said. I was out of line. Not a problem, because it's not going to happen again, Murtry said. What action have we seen from the Barba Piccola? Nothing, Way said. The Belters sent condolences and offers of aid, as if there was a damn thing they could do. Are they warming up the engines? Not that I can tell, Wei said. We're keeping an eye on that, Murtry said. It was a statement and a question. We could take custody of the ship, Wei said. It was Mao Kukowski before they got broken up. Its salvage status is very murky. Call it illegal, put a few people on her, and we could shut her down. Noted, Murtry said. How's the crew, Havelock? Shocked, sir. Scared, angry. They're scientists. They looked on the squatters as an annoyance and a threat to their data. For most of them, this is outside their experience. Murtry stroked his chin with the back of his hand. What are they going to do about it? So far, get drunk, yell at each other or at us, design theoretical judicial systems. Most of them seem to want the whole thing to just go away so that they can get on with their research. Murtry chuckled. God bless the eggheads. All right. We still have the two light atmospheric shuttles, Havelock went on. I can get pilots for them, and we can evacuate the people we have on the ground. No evac. The squatters don't get to win this, Murtry said. No one that goes down there comes back up. We put more people down there to support them. Whatever their research is, we make damn sure it's moving forward, and everyone down there sees. It's moving forward. Yes, sir, Havelock said, feeling vaguely embarrassed. Reeve, you're going down. Deal with the locals. Find out what you can. Keep our people safe. We want to show a force. But nothing strong enough they can use it for sympathy on the news feeds back home. Reeve said, as if he were agreeing. Way, I want your eyes on the enemy ship. If it starts warming up its drive, I want to know. Permission to put my comm laser upgrade into effect? The Edward Israel didn't have torpedo tubes or gauss guns. 
The closest they had to a weapon was an ancient comm laser that could be hacked to cutting strength. The ship had been designed when the dangers of space were all about radiation and air supply, not intentional violence. It was almost quaint. No, Mercury said. Just monitor what they're doing. Listen to the chatter and bring it back to me. If someone needs to make a call, that's me. No initiative. Understood? Yes, sir. Havelock, you're going to be up here coordinating with the team on the ground. Use the shuttles however they need to be used to get personnel and materials down to the surface. We're here to establish a base. We'll start establishing it. And if there's another attack, sir? Wei asked. Then that's a decision the squatters will have made, and we'll respect their choice. Mertry said. I'm not sure what you mean, sir, she said. Mertry's smile didn't reach his eyes. There's a dignity in consequences. Havelock's quarters were only slightly larger than the cells in the brig, but much more comfortable. He was webbed into his crash couch at the end of his shift when a soft knock came at the door and Murtry pulled himself in. The security chief was scowling, but no more so than usual. Anything up, chief? Havelock asked. You've worked with belters, Murtry said. What do you think of them? They're people, Havelock said. Some are better than others. I still have friends on Ceres. Fine. But what do you think of Belters? Havelock shifted, the motion setting him drifting up against his restraints as he thought. They're insular, tribal almost. I think what they have most in common is that they don't like inner planet types. A Martian can sometimes pass, though. They have the whole low-G physiology thing. So mostly they hate Earthers, Mertry said. That's what pulls them together. That thing where they're oppressed by Earth is just about the one thing they have in common. So they cultivate it. Hating people like us is what makes them them. Mertry nodded. You know, there are people that would call you prejudiced for saying that. It's only prejudice when you haven't been there. Havelock said. I was on Ceres Station just before it broke for the OPA. For me, it's all lived experience. Well, I think you're right, Murtry said. That's why I wanted to talk to you, off the record. Most of the people we've got on the ship are Earthers, or at least Martian. But there are a few belt types, like that mechanical tech. What's his name? Fission? Him. Just keep an eye on those ones. Is there something going on? Just that the squatters are mostly belt and outer planets, and the RCE is an Earth company. I don't want anyone getting their loyalties confused. Yes, sir. Havelock said, and then, more tentatively, Is something happening, sir? Not right away, but... Well, you might as well know. I've had word from the home office. My request for latitude was respectfully declined. Apparently there's some politicking about how this gets handled. The OPA and the UN are talking about what they want to have happen. Want to make sure the squatters are treated well. Murtry's anger was understated but profound, and Havelock found himself resonating with it. But we have the charter. We have a right to be here. We do. And we aren't the ones who started killing people. We're not. So what are we supposed to do? Sit on our hands while the Belters kill us and take our things? The sale of the lithium from their illegal mining operations has been frozen, Murtry said. We are instructed not to do anything to incite further conflict. That's bullshit, 
How are we supposed to do our work if we're being all careful not to offend the bastards who are shooting at us? Murtry's shrug was an agreement. When he spoke, his calm, laconic tone barely covered his contempt. Apparently, they're sending us a mediator. Interlude The Investigator It reaches out, it reaches out, it reaches out, it reaches out. One hundred and thirteen times a second, nothing answers, and it reaches out. It is not conscious, though parts of it are. There are structures within it that were once separate organisms, aboriginal, evolved, and complex. It is designed to improvise, to use what is there and then move on. Good enough is good enough, and so the artifacts are ignored or adapted. The conscious parts try to make sense of the reaching out, try to interpret it. One imagines an insect's leg twitching, twitching, twitching. One hears a spark closing a gap, the ticking so fast it becomes a drone. Another, oblivious, re-experiences her flesh falling from her bones, the nausea and fear, and begs for death as she has for years now. Her name is Maria. It does not let her die. It does not comfort her. It is unaware of her, because it is unaware. But unaware is not inactive. It finds power where it can, nestled in a bath of low radiation. Tiny structures, smaller than atoms, harvest the energy of the fast-moving particles that pass through it, subatomic windmills. It eats the void, and it reaches out, it reaches out, it reaches out. In the artifacts that are conscious, memories of vanished lives still flicker. Tissues that were changed without dying hold the moment that a boy heard his sister was leaving home. They hold multiplication tables. They hold images of sexuality and violence and beauty. They hold the memories of flesh that no longer exists. They hold metaphors, mitochondria, starfish. Hitler's brain in a jar. Hell realm. They dream. Structures that were neurons twitch and loop and burn and dream. Images and words and pain and fear. Endless. An overwhelming sense of illness. An old man's remembered voice whispering dry words that it is unaware of. Full fathom five, thy father lies. Of his bones are coral made. If there had been a reply, it could end. If there had been anyone to answer, it would have come to rest like a marble at the bottom of a hill. But nothing answers. The scars know that no answer will ever come. But the reflex triggers, the reflex triggers, the reflex, and it reaches out. It has solved a billion small puzzles already in cascades of reflex. It has no memory of having done so, except in its scars. There is only reaching out, delivering the message that its task is complete. Nothing answers, and so it cannot end. It reaches out. It is a complex mechanism for solving puzzles using what there is to be used. Those are pearls that were his eyes. And so it has the investigator. Of all the scars, there is one that came last. That is most intact. It is useful, and so it is used. It builds the investigator from that template, unaware that it is doing so, and tries another way of reaching out. And something answers. Something wrong and foreign and aboriginal, but there is an answer. So over the course of years, it builds the investigator again and reaches out. The investigator becomes more complex. It will not stop until it makes that final connection, and it will never make that final connection. It stretches 
tries new combinations, different ways to reach out, unaware that it is doing so, unaware that it exists. Empty, except in the insignificant parts. The insectile leg will twitch forever. The scar that wails for death will wail forever. The investigator will search forever. The low voice will mutter forever. Nothing of him doth fade, but suffers a sea change. Into something rich and strange, it reaches out. Chapter 4 Holden MCRN Sally Ride, this is independent vessel Rosinante, requesting permission to pass through the ring with one ship. OPA Heavy Freighter Callisto's Dream. Transmit authorization code now, Rosinante. Transmitting. Holden tapped the screen to send the codes and stretched out his arms and legs, letting the motion pull him out of his chair in the microgravity. Several abused joints at various places on his skeleton responded with popping sounds. You're getting old. Miller said. The detective stood in a rumpled gray suit and pork pie hat a few meters away, his feet on the deck as though there were gravity. The smarter the Miller simulation had gotten, and over the last two years it had become damned near coherent, the less it seemed to care about matching the reality around it. You're not. Of my bones are coral made. The ghost said as if in agreement. It's all about the trade-offs. When the Sally Ride sent the go-ahead code, Alex took them through the ring nice and slow, the Callisto matching speed and course. The stars vanished as the ship moved into the black nothingness of the hub. Miller flickered as they passed through the gate, started to re-solidify, and vanished in a puff of blue fireflies as the deck hatch banged open and Amos pulled himself through. We landing? The mechanic asked without preamble. No need on this trip, Holden said, and opened a channel to Alex up in the cockpit. Keep us here until we see the Callisto dock, then take us back out. Sure could use a few days station side, Chief, Amos said pulling himself over to one of the op stations and belting in. His gray coverall had a scorch mark on the sleeve, and he had a bandage covering half of his left hand. Holden pointed at it. Amos shrugged. We've got a pair of soil ships waiting at Tycho Station, Holden said. No one's had the balls to try and rip off any of the ships on this route. This many Navy ships hanging around? It'd be suicide. And yet, Fred pays us very well to escort his ships out to Medina Station, and I like taking his money. Holden panned the ship's telescopes around, zooming in on the rings. And I don't like being in here any longer than necessary. Miller's ghost was an artifact of the alien technology that had created the gates, and a dead man. It had been following Holden around for the two years since they'd deactivated the ring station. It spent its time demanding, asking, and cajoling Holden to go through the newly opened gates to begin its investigation on the planets beyond them. The fact that Miller could only appear to Holden when he was alone, and on a ship the size of the Rosinante he was almost never alone, had kept him sane. Alex floated down from the cockpit, his thinning black hair sticking out in every direction from his brown scalp. There were dark circles under his eyes. We're not landing? Could really use a couple days station side. See? Amos said. Before Holden could reply, Naomi came up through the deck hatch. Aren't we going to dock? Captain wants to rush back for those soil transports at Tycho. Amos said, his voice somehow managing to be neutral and mocking at the same time. I could really use a few days. 
Naomi started. I promise we'll take a week on Tycho when we get back. I just don't want to spend my vacation time, you know. He pointed at the view screens around them, displaying the dead sphere of the ring station and the glittering gates. Here. Chicken, Naomi said. Yep. The comm station flashed an incoming tight beam alert at them. Amos, who was closest, tapped the screen. Rosinante here, he said. Rosinante, a familiar voice replied. Medina Station here. Fred, Holden said with a sigh. Problem? You guys aren't landing? I'm betting you could use a few... Can I help you with something? Holden said over the top of him. Yeah, you can. Call me after you've ducked. I have business to discuss. Damn it. Holden said after he'd killed the connection. You ever get the sense that the universe is out to get you? Sometimes I get the sense the universe is out to get you. Amos said with a grin. It's fun to watch. They changed the name again, Alex said, zooming in on the spinning station that had until recently been called Behemoth. Medina Station. Good name for it. Doesn't that mean fortress? Naomi said with a frown. Too martial, maybe. No, nah, Alex said. Well, sort of. It was the walled part of a city, but it sort of became the social center, too. Narrow streets designed to keep invaders out also kept motorized traffic or horse-drawn carts out. So you could only get around by walking. So the street vendors gathered there. It turned into the place to shop and congregate and drink tea. It's a safe place where people gather. Good name for the station. You've put a lot of thought into this. Holden said. Alex shrugged. It's interesting. The evolution of that ship and its names. Started out as the Nauvoo, a place of refuge, right? Big city in space. Became the behemoth, the biggest, baddest warship in the system. Now it's Medina Station, a gathering place. Same ship, three different names, three different things. Same ship, Holden said feeling a little surly as he instructed the Rosinante to begin the docking approach. Names matter, boss, Amos said after a moment, a strange look on his big face. Names change everything. The interior of Medina Station was a work in progress. Large sections of the central rotating drum had been covered with transplanted soil in preparation for food production, but in many places the metal and ceramic of the drum was still visible. Most of the damage the former colony ship had sustained during her battles had been cleaned up and repaired. The office and storage space in the walls of the drum was becoming the hub of efforts to explore the thousand new worlds that had opened up to humanity. If Fred Johnson, former Earth Colonel and now head of the respectable wing of the OPA, was positioning Medina Station as the logical location for a fledgling League of Planets-type government, he at least had the good sense not to say it out loud. Holden had watched too many people dying there to ever see it as anything but a graveyard, which made it pretty much the same as any other government he could think of. Fred had set up his new office in what had once been the Colonial Administration Building back when Medina Station was still called the Nauvoo. They'd also been used as the offices of Radio Free Slow Zone. Now they were patched up, repainted, and decorated with atmosphere-renewing plants and video screens of the ring space around the ship. To Holden, it made for an odd juxtaposition. Sure, humans had invaded an extra-dimensional space with wormholes to points scattered across the galaxy, but they'd remembered to bring ferns. 
Fred puttered around the office, making coffee. Black, right? Yep, Holden said, and accepted the steaming cup from him. I don't like coming here. I understand. I appreciate you doing it anyway, Fred said, and collapsed into his chair with a sigh that seemed excessive in the one-third G of the station's spin. But then the pressures pushing down on Fred had little to do with gravity. The five years since Holden had met him hadn't treated the man kindly. His formerly salt-and-pepper hair had gone entirely gray, and his dark skin was lined with tiny wrinkles. No sign it's waking up? Holden said, pointing his coffee cup toward a wall screen that was displaying a blown-up image of the spherical ring station. I need to show you something, Fred said, as though Holden hadn't asked the question. At Holden's nod, Fred tapped on his desk, and the video screen behind him came to life. On it, Chris Jen Avasarala's face was frozen mid-word. The undersecretary of executive administration had her eyes at half-mast and her lips in a sneer. This is the part that concerns you. Really just an excuse to wave their cocks at each other, Avasarala said when the video started. So I'm thinking we send Holden. Send Holden? Holden said, but the video kept playing and Fred didn't answer him. Send Holden where? Where are we sending Holden? He's close when he's out at Medina and everybody hates him equally, so we can argue he's impartial. He's got ties to you, Mars, me. He's a fucking awful choice for a diplomatic mission, so it makes him perfect. Brief him, tell him the UN will pay for his time at double the usual rates, and get him on new Terra as fast as possible, before this thing gets fucked up any worse than it already is. The old lady leaned in toward the camera, her face swelling on the screen until Holden could see the fine detail of every wrinkle and blemish. If Fred is showing this to you, Holden, know that your home planet appreciates your service. Also, try not to put your dick in this. It's fucked enough already. Fred stopped the recording and leaned back in his chair. So, what the hell is she talking about? Holden said. What's New Terra? New Terra is the unimaginative name they gave to the first of the explored worlds in the Gate Network. No, I thought that was Illus. Illus, Fred said with a sigh, is the name the Belters who landed there gave it. Royal Charter Energy, the corporation with the contract to do the initial exploration, call it New Terra. Can they do that? People already live there. Everyone calls it Illus. Everyone here calls it Illus. You see the problem, Fred said. He took a long sip of his coffee, buying himself time to think. No one was ready for this. A ship full of Ganymede refugees commandeered a Mao-quick heavy freighter and blew through the ring at high speed as soon as the first probe results came out, before we'd had time to pick up the pieces from our initial incursion, before the military blockade before Medina was ready to enforce a safe speed limit in the ring space. They came through so fast, we didn't even have time to hail them. Let me guess, Holden said. The Illus Gate is on the opposite side from the Soul Gate. Not quite. They were smart enough to come in at an angle to avoid slamming into the ring station at 300,000 kph. So they've been living on Illus for a year. And suddenly... R.C.E. shows up and tells them that, oops, it's really their planet. R.C.E. has the U.N. Charter for Scientific Exploration on Illus, New Terra, whatever you want to call it. And they're there because the Ganymede refugees landed there first. The plan was to study these worlds for years before anyone lived on them. Something in Fred's tone of voice tickled at Holden's mind for a second. And he said, 
Wait. UN Charter? When did the UN get to be in charge of the Thousand Worlds? Fred smiled without humor. The situation is complex. We have the UN making a power grab to administrate all these new worlds. We have OPA citizens settling one without permission. We have an energy company getting the exploration contract on a world that also just happens to have the richest lithium deposits we've ever seen. And we have you, Holden said. Setting up to run the turnpike everyone has to take to get there. I think it's safe to say the OPA has fundamental disagreements with the idea that the UN is unilaterally in charge of handing out those contracts. So you and Avasarala are back-channeling this to keep it from turning into something bigger. There are about five more variables than that, but as a start, yes. Which is where you come in, Fred said, pointing at Holden with his coffee mug. Printed on the side of the mug were the words, The Boss. Holden stifled a laugh. Nobody owns you, but Avasarala and I have both worked with you, and think we can do it again. That's a really stupid reason. Fred's smile gave away nothing. It doesn't hurt that you have an atmosphere-rated ship. You know we've never actually used it, though, right? I'm not keen on the first in-atmosphere maneuver happening a million kilometers from the closest repair bay. The Rosinante is also a military design, and... Forget it. No matter what your coffee cup says, I'm not going to be the boot on the colonist's neck. I won't do that. Fred sighed, sitting forward. When he spoke, his voice was soft and warm as flannel but it didn't hide the steel underneath it. The rules of governing how a thousand planets are run are about to be made. This is the test case. You'll be going in as an impartial observer and mediator. Me, as a mediator. The irony's not lost on me, but things have already started to go bad there and we need someone keeping it from getting worse while three governments decide how the next one will work. You mean you want me to make it look like you're doing something while you figure out what to do? Holden said. And going bad, how? The colonists blew up an RCE heavy lift shuttle. The provisional governor was on it. He's dead, along with a few scientists and RCE employees. It won't help our negotiations if Illus turns into a full-blown war between Belters and a UN corporation. So I keep the peace. You get them talking, and you keep them talking. And you do what you always do. You maintain absolute transparency. This is one time secrets won't help anyone. Should be right up your alley. I thought I was the galaxy's biggest loose cannon to you guys. Is Avasarala sending the match in to meet the powder keg because she wants this to fail? Fred shrugged. I care less what she wants you for than what I do. Maybe the old lady likes you. Don't ask me to explain it. Miller was waiting for Holden outside Fred's office. There are 3,000 people on Medina Station right now, Holden said. How is it that not one of them is here to keep you from bugging me? You going to take the job? Miller said. I haven't decided, Holden said. Which, since you are running a simulation of my brain, you already know. So you asking is really you telling me to take it. Stop me when I'm wrong. Holden headed off down the corridor, hoping to run into another human and make the Miller ghost go away. Miller followed, his footsteps echoing on the ceramic floor. The fact that those echoes existed only inside Holden's mind made the whole thing even creepier. You're not wrong. You should take it, Miller said. The man's right. It's important. 
something like that goes from a few pissed-off locals to a meat grinder without much time in between. This one time back on series. Okay, no. No folksy cop stories from the dead guy. What's on Illus that you want? Holden asked. It might help if you just came out and told me what it is you want on the other side of those rings. You know what I am looking for, the old detective said. He actually managed to look sad. Yeah, whatever weird alien civilization made you. And I already know you won't find it. Hell, you know you won't find it. Still got a look. Miller vanished. A woman in a blue Medina Station security uniform walked by, looking at her hand terminal. She grunted something approximating a greeting without looking up. Holden took the stairs up to the inner surface of Medina's rotating habitation drum. No chance Miller would surprise him there. The drum was full of activity, with some workers spreading imported soil for the eventual farms and others raising prefab buildings that would be houses and storage. Holden waved cheerily at them as he walked past. With his increasingly frequent Miller hauntings, he had come to appreciate the value of having other humans within line of sight. They made his life a little less weird just by existing. He avoided the elevator to the engineering transition point that would take him out of the rotating drum and into the microgravity of the stern of the former colony ship. The Rosinante was docked at the airlock there. Instead, he walked up the long curling ramp that kept him in sight of everyone in the rotating drum. The last time he'd climbed that ramp, people had been shooting and dying all around him. It wasn't a pleasant memory, but it was better than being trapped alone in an elevator car with Miller. The universe was getting a little thick with his personal history. Before he passed through the transition point and into the engineering decks, he floated for a moment and looked out across the inside of the habitation drum. From his elevation, the plots of soil looked like checkerboard squares of dark brown against the gray of the drum's skin. Equipment moved across them like metal insects, busy at unguessable tasks turning a bubble of metal into a tiny, self-contained world. We'll forget how to do this, Holden thought. Humanity had only just started learning how to live in space, and now they'd forget. Why develop new strategies for surviving on tiny stations like Medina when there were a thousand new worlds to conquer, with air and water free for the taking? It was an astounding thought, but it also left Holden just a little melancholy. He turned his back on the workers busy at their obsolete work and returned to his ship. So, Naomi said as the crew sat together in the Rosinante's galley, are we going to Illus? Holden had spent several minutes explaining what Fred Johnson and Chris Jen Alasarala wanted from them, and then just sort of trailed off. The truth was he didn't know the answer to Naomi's question. There are a lot of reasons to do this, he finally said, tapping out a quick rhythm on the metal tabletop. It is a really big deal. It's the test case for a thousand worlds to follow. And I admit there's some attraction to the idea that we'd get to help set the perspectives. Maybe get to help create the template for everything that follows. That's pretty damn exciting. And the money's good, Amos said. Don't forget the money's good. But, Naomi prompted, putting her hand on his arm and smiling, letting him know it was okay to share whatever his fears were. He smiled back and patted her hand. But I have one pretty compelling reason to say no, he said. Miller really wants me to go. They were silent for a long moment. Naomi was the first to speak. You're going to take it. Am I? 
You are, she said, because you think you'll be able to help. You think we can't? No, Naomi said. I think you can. And even if we're wrong, not trying would make you cranky. Other thing to consider? Amos said. Money's really good. Chapter 5 Basia Jesus wept, Basia, my child, Coop said. We're winning. How much of a sister are you turning into if it gets rocky? The others all looked at him, waiting. Scotty and Pete, but also Loris and Katerine, Ibrahim and Zadie. Basia crossed his arms. They find out who killed their governor. Basia began, but Coop waved a hand like shooing flies. Won't. If they haven't now, it's just going down as one of those things that happened. Hell, I don't remember who did it. You remember, Zadie? Zadie shook her head. Ne savi me, she said, like the belter that she was, that she'd been before. Coop gestured toward her like he'd proven a point. I don't like how it came out either, Pete said. But if we hadn't done it, they'd have been here this whole time instead of just dribs and drabs. Holden'd be here with a domed city already up, and then what would we be looking at? Exactly, Coop said. Slow them down we wanted, and slow them down we did. Question now is what to do with the time we've got left. Could kill them all and drop their bodies down to mine pits, Loris said, her smile making it clear that she was mostly joking. I was thinking that we could push their transmitter, Ibrahim said. All their signal goes through one repeater in their technical hut. Something happened to that, they'd be choked for bandwidth, like the rest of us. Would it take their hand terminals down too? Coop asked. Might, Ibrahim said. It would certainly make them local and line of sight. Worth considering, Coop said. The ruins where they met were a half hour's fast walk from the town itself. Great towers of strange, bone-like material rose up out of the ground, leaning against one another in patterns that seemed almost random until he caught them at just the correct angle and some ornate symmetry revealed itself. The lower structures were soft at the edges, curved like vertebrae or the gears of some unimaginably nimble machine. A soft breeze shifted through the ruins with a sound like reed flutes playing in the distance. Something had lived here once, but it was gone now, and its bones were a hiding place for Basia and his cabal. He had the sudden memory of a video he'd seen once of brine shrimp living in the bones of a dead whale. Question I have, Basia said, is what we're aiming for. We knock out their bandwidth. What does that get us? Makes it harder for them to show value, Loris said. I've read the charter same as everyone else. Yes, it's got a lot of conversation and basic science writers and requirements, but let's all be clear. RCE is here to make a profit. If we can make it clear that they won't be able to... That doesn't matter, Ibrahim said. What we need to do is establish our own claim to the planet. Profit and loss comes later. I don't agree, Bram, Loris said. If you look at the history of colonialism, legal precedent and title claims are almost always rationalized after the fact. What you see is... What I see, Coop cut in, is the time until the joint OPA-UN observer gets here and changes the game, getting shorter. Basia, you want to weigh in? Basia cracked his knuckles. What he needs to see is that RCE isn't organized, and we've got a ship full of refined lithium ready for market. So, let's make that happen, 
Coop said, smiling his vicious smile. After the meeting, they left one by one, or in pairs, so as not to attract attention. First Pete and Ibrahim, together because they were lovers. Then Scotty, puffing on his pipe. Loris and Katerin. Then, usually, Zadie and Coop. But not today. Today, Coop nodded Zadie on ahead. She made the one-handed nod, the physical idiom of belters who had to communicate in vacuum suits, and strode out, her two long limbs giving her a gait that was awkward and graceful at once, like a giraffe. Having a hard time with this, you? Coop said. Basia shrugged. Got off to a bad start, that's all. You were one of them before. Didn't fight. Coop said. Didn't, he said bitterly. They had lived together on the ship with all the others for years after Ganymede. They had argued together, the two of them, for the exodus to the new planets that the ring gates had opened. Basia knew Coop, knew he'd fought with a splinter of the OPA that had never accepted compromise with the inner planets. The split circle of the Outer Planets Alliance was etched in the man's skin, just over his left shoulder blade. It occurred to Basia, not for the first time, that Outer Planets had taken on a very new meaning in the last couple years. Can be hard, Coop said, especially on the big stations. Ceres, Eris, before, Ganymede, all kind of inners there. You live around them, work with them, come to like some of them, maybe. And then the order comes, and you have to pop a seal and let someone die. Can't pass, because then they start looking for the pattern. Who lived that shouldn't? Compromises the cell. Basia nodded, but his mouth tasted sour. That what we are? An OPA cell? Resisting Earth's corporate power grab, no? There's worse models. Yeah, Basia said. I get your point. You do? Because what I'm seeing is you putting a lot of questions in a lot of heads, thinking about whether we're on the path we should be. Basia bristled. That a problem for you? Problems for you, mate. Because the more you wonder, the more they wonder. And no matter what I pretend, we all remember who meshed that button. The walk back from the meetings always left Basia upset. Everywhere, there were little reminders of what the group of them, his cell, had done, and also what they hadn't. The little hydrology lab down by the wash, with its geodesic dome and its drills, like the mining pits in miniature. The exobiologists hut out alone on the edge of the township, the unfamiliar faces in the square, the clothing that had been fabricated with RCE templates. On the flats north of the town, a soccer game was kicking up dust, townsmen, including his own son Yasek, playing with the corporation's people. At least they were still on different teams. Basia looped around, entering the town proper on the path that led to the mining pits. The breeze was rising toward a wind, stirring dust devils. High above in the blue arc of sky, a wedge of vast creatures like aerial jellyfish trailed golden streamers from pale, white bodies. Lucius said each one was as large as the ship, but he couldn't bring himself to believe that. He wondered whether anyone had given the creatures a name. Basia! Carol! He said with a nod as the big woman fell in step beside him. Carol Chewiwi had been everyone's first choice for coordinator when they'd landed. Smart and focused and strong-minded without being bullish. She almost certainly guessed that he was involved in what had happened at the landing pad, but it didn't matter. Some secrets stayed secrets because nobody knew them, some because nobody told. 
I'm putting together a maintenance crew to head out for the pits. Going out tomorrow. Probably stay for five, six days. You in? There a problem? No, and I think we should keep it that way. Only a few more loads to get up the whale before we can ship out. Be good to have a full hold before the observer arrives, Basia said. Wouldn't it just... Carol said with a smile. Glad you're in. Meet at the square at nine. Okay, Basia said, and she clapped him on the shoulder, turning back to whatever errand she'd been on when she saw him. It was another twenty minutes before he noticed that he hadn't ever exactly said yes. That was why she ran things, he figured. His own home was near the edge of town. They'd made the bricks from the local earth, processed through some of the mining equipment, and fired in a kiln powered by combustion. It could only have been more primitive if they'd dug a cave and painted bison on the walls. Lucia was on the little porch area, sweeping the bricks with a broom made from a local grass analog that smelled like manure and peppermint, and turned from black to gold when you cut it. You don't know what that thing's off-gassing, he said. It was a little joke between them. How she answered would tell a lot about where they stood. A litmus test for the pH of his marriage. A third of it's carcinogenic, a third's mutagenic, and a third, we don't know what it does, she said with a smile. So things were good. Basia felt a knot loosen in his belly. He kissed her cheek and ducked into the cool of the house. You might as well stop that, he said. Wind is just going to push it back. Lucia made a few more desultory passes, the grass hissing against the brick, then followed him in. By the standards of Ganymede or the ship, the house was massive. A sleeping room for each of the children and a shared one for them a room dedicated entirely to food preparation. The captain's suite on the Barba Piccola boasted fewer square meters than Basia's home. It was a barbarian palace, and it was his. He sat on a chair by the front window and looked out at the plain. Where's Felsia? he asked. Out? Lucia said. You sound just like her. Felsia is my primary source of information about Felsia, Lucia said. She was smiling, laughing a little even. It was as good a mood as she'd been in for weeks. Basia knew it was a choice. She needed him in a good mood for something, and if he was wise, he'd fight against the manipulation. He didn't want to, though. He wanted to be able to act for a while as if everything were fine. And so he played along. I blame your side of the family. I was always very compliant as a boy. Do we have anything worth eating? More ships' rations. Basia sighed. No salad? Soon, she said. The new crop is doing well. As long as we don't find anything strange in them, you'll be able to have all the carrots you want starting next week. Someday... We'll be able to grow in the soil here. Maybe north of here, Lucia said, and rested her hand on his shoulder as she looked out the window with him. Even the native fauna have a hard time around here. North, south, Ellis is all here as far as I'm concerned. She turned, walking to the kitchen. Basia felt a tug of longing for her, a nostalgia of the body that belonged to a time when they'd been younger, childless, and horny all the time. He heard the pop and hiss of the rations canisters. The smell of sag alu wafted through the air. Lucia came back in with a palm-sized plate of food for each of them. Thank you, he said. Lucia nodded and sat in her own chair, her leg curled up under her. Gravity had changed her. The muscles of her arms and shoulders were more pronounced now. The curve of her back when she sat was at a different angle. 
Illus was changing them in ways he had never expected, though perhaps he should have. He took a forkful of the sag alu. Going to the mines tomorrow, he said. Lucia's eyebrows rose a fraction. What for? Maintenance, he said, and then, because he knew what she was thinking. Carol asked me. That's good, then. Meaning that it was Carol who had asked him to go, and not Coop. He felt a stab of shame, and then an annoyance that he was ashamed. He pressed his lips together a little more tightly. The observer's coming, Lucia said, as if she meant nothing by it. James Holden. I'd heard. It's good. Gives us leverage against the RCE. I suppose so. He could remember a time when they'd laughed together, when Lucia had come from the hospitals on Ganymede, full of stories about the patients and the other doctors. They'd eat vat-grown steak, as tender as anything harvested from an animal, and drink beer fermented there on the little moon. They'd talked for hours, until it was long past time to sleep. Now, their conversations were so careful, it was like the words all had glass bones. So he changed the topic. It's strange to think about it, he said. I'll probably never weld in a vacuum again. All those years apprenticing and working, and now everything I do has air around it. Tell me about it. If I'd known how it would all play out, I'd have spent my rotations in the general clinics. Well, you're the best hand surgeon on the planet. The best hand surgeon on the planet is doing a lot of reading on digestive disorders and gynecological exams, Lucia said dryly. Her eyes went hard, distant. We need to talk about Falcia. And here it was. The gentleness, the calm, the soft memories. This was where it had been leading. He sat forward, his eyes cast on the ground. What's to say? She's been talking about what happens next. For her. Same as happens for any of us. Basia said. Lucia put another bite in her mouth chewing slowly, though the food hardly required it. A gust of hard wind pressed in at the window with the soft ticking of grit against the glass. When she spoke, her voice was soft but implacable. She's thinking of university, Lucia said. She's done the tutorials and examinations on the network. She needs us to give permission before the applications move forward. She's too young, Basia said, knowing as the words came out that it was the wrong tack. Frustration knotted his throat, and he put his dinner, half-eaten, on the armrest. She won't be by the time she gets there, Lucia said. If she went with the first shipment and transferred at Medina, she could be on Ganymede or Ceres Station in nineteen months. Twenty! We need her here, Basia said, his tone hard and definitive. The conversation was over, except that it wasn't. I don't regret coming here, Lucia said, and you didn't force me to come. The months after Ganymede, when we were all living like rats packed too tight, all the ports that wouldn't take us in, I remember that. When Mao Kwiatkowski was dissolved, I was the one who helped Captain Andrada draw up the salvage papers. I made the Barba Piccola our ship. I know. When we took the vote, my voice was with yours. Maybe living so long as refugees made us wild or brave. I don't know, but to come here, to begin everything again under a sky? Under some new star? I thought it was as obvious as you did. And I don't regret coming. Her tone was fierce now. Her dark eyes glittered and flashed, daring him to disagree. He didn't. If we spend the rest of our lives mining lithium and trying to grow carrots, I will be delighted with that. 
she went on. If I never reattach another ligament or regrow a lost thumb, then fine. Because I chose it. Yasek and Falcia didn't make that choice. I'm not sending my children back, Basia said. What would they get back there? With all the work that needs to be done here, with all the things there are to be learned and discovered here, how is going backward a good idea? His voice was getting louder than he'd meant, but he wasn't shouting, not really. Being here is our choice, Lucia said. Felcia's choice is where her choice is. We can stand in the way, or we can help. Helping her get back into that isn't helping, Basia said. She belongs here. We all belong here. Where we came from, we came from here. Nothing that happened before matters. We are from here now. Illus. I will go down dying before I let them bring their wars and their weapons and their corporations and their science projects here. And I will be damned if they get any more of my children. Dad? Yasek stood in the doorway. He had a soccer ball on his hip and an expression of concern in his eyes. Son, Basia said. The moaning of the wind was the only sound. Basia stood up, took his canister, and then Lucia's. Taking her leavings to the recycler was a small olive branch, but it was all he had. The sense of impotent rage and shame boiled up in his throat and found to release there. Katoa, the landing pad, the concern in Yasek's eyes. The years they had spent fleeing only to land in a brick palace that his daughter wanted to leave. All of it mixed into a single emasculating anger as hot as solder. Is everything okay? Yasek asked. Your mother and I were just talking. We aren't from here, Lucia said, as if Yasek hadn't come in, as if the adult conversation could go on with the boy there. We're making it that way. But it isn't true yet. It will be, Basia said. Chapter 6 Elvi Elvi sat in the high meadow, her legs stretched out before her, and watched quietly. The plant analogues, she couldn't really call them plants, lifted up above the dry, beige soil, straining toward the sunlight. The tallest stood hardly more than half a meter with a flat, corrugated top that shifted to follow the sun and glittered the iridescent green of a beetle's carapace. A gentle breeze shifted the stalks and cooled Elvie's cheek. She didn't move. Four meters away, a mimic lizard cooed. This time, the answering coo was closer. Elvie fought not to bounce with excitement. She wanted to wave her hands in glee, wanted to giggle. She stayed still as a stone. The prey species waddled closer. About the size of a sparrow, it had a soft rill of something like feathers or thick hair that ran down its sides. It had six long, ungainly legs, each ending in a doubled hook. She wanted to see them as fingers or toes, but she hadn't seen any of the little things use the hooks to manipulate anything. It cooed again, a soft, guttural chuffing halfway between a dove's call and a tambourine. The mimic lizard waited a moment, its wide-set eyes shifting toward the little animal. Elvi watched for the tremor in the lizard's side, an almost invisible fluttering of its scale-like skin. With the speed of a gun, the lizard's mouth unhinged and a mass of wet pink flesh shot out. The prey animal didn't so much as squeak as the lizard's inverted stomach drove it to the ground. Elvie's fists wriggled in delight as the mimic lizard began hauling its internal organs, 
back across the dry ground. The prey species was dead or paralyzed, adhering to the pink flesh. Dirt and small stones stuck to the stomach, too. Eventually, the whole mass reached the mimic lizard's too wide jaw, and it began the long process of drawing the messy complex back through its mouth. From her previous observations, Eldie knew it would take the better part of an hour before the mimic lizard's newly concave sides filled out again. She stood up, dusting herself off, and hobbled over. Her foot was still in the cast she'd gotten on that terrible first night. The pain from the broken bone was only a dull ache now, more an annoyance than a problem, but the cast made mobility an issue. She opened her satchel, the black lattice fabric ticking under her fingers, then gently lifted the feeding lizard into it. Its gaze flickered across her, untrusting. That was fair. Sorry, little one, she said. It's in the name of science. She closed the satchel and triggered the collection sequence. The lizard died instantly, and the internal assay sequence began, cataloging the gross structures of the animal's body, firing hair-thin needles through the corpse to gather samples at every boundary between tissues and feeding the data up to the dedicated system in the satchel's strap. By the time she got back to her little hut and took the corpses out for storage and cataloging, the mimic lizard and its prey would be modeled in her computer, terabytes of information ready to stream up to the Edward Israel, and from there back to the labs on Luna. It would take the signal a few hours to travel the distance that had taken her eighteen months, but for those hours, she and her work group would be the only people in all the billions of humans scattered throughout the planets who would know this little being's secrets. If God had come and offered her the Library of Alexandria in exchange, she wouldn't have taken the trade. As she tramped down the gentle slope toward her hut, the mining village spread out before her. It was tiny two parallel streets with a gap in the middle that passed for a town square. The buildings were cobbled together from the supplies they'd brought and what they could find on the planetary surface. Everything stood at slightly wrong angles, like a handful of dice had been scattered there. She was used to the strict rectilinear architecture that came from living where space was precious. That didn't apply here, and it made the little town seem more organic, like it had simply grown there. Fayez was sitting on the small porch outside her hut. His skin had darkened in the weeks since the crash. The preliminary hydrological study had kept him and several of the others from the team out in the field for almost two weeks. You know what I love about this planet? Fayez said instead of hello. Nothing? He scowled at her, feigning hurt feelings. I love the period of rotation. Thirty hours. You can get in a full day's work, stay up getting drunk at the saloon, and still get a full night's sleep. I don't know why we didn't think of this back home. There are advantages, Elvie said, unlocking her door and stepping into the hut. Of course it means we've been here almost six weeks in the past month, Fayez said. But thank God we didn't get one of those little spinning tops with sundown every six hours. Now if they can just fix the gravity. The unit was a single four-by-six meter room with bed, shower, toilet, kitchen, and workstation all hunched together. As she put the satchel into the archiving unit, it struck her how much her work was about inferring things from design. As soon as she'd seen the mimic lizard's forward-facing eyes, she'd assumed it was a predator. Anyone looking at her hut would know it had been made with the assumption that space would be at a premium. Everything was an artifact of its function. 
That was what made evolution so gorgeous. She looked in the mirror over her little sink. Her skin was covered in a thin layer of beige dust, like stage makeup. I don't want to do this, she said, wiping her cheeks with a damp tissue. Look on the bright side, Fayez said. They've only tried to kill us once so far. You aren't helping. I'm not trying, he said, then winced at the unintentional reference to the dead man. They had cremated Governor Trying and the other casualties of the crash. Apart from one villager who'd arrived with non-responsive bone cancer, they had been the first human deaths on the world. Certainly, they were the first murders. But after that, the people from the village had been nothing but kind. Lucia Merton, the doctor who'd come to help them after the crash, had followed up with each of the survivors. A belter from Ceres named Jordan had brought Eldy food that his wife had cooked for the injured. The holy man had invited her to the services at the village temple. Everything about the inhabitants of New Terra said that they were kind, gentle, authentic people except that someone had killed the governor and almost a dozen others. The RCE encampment stood south of the village proper. With Elvi and Fayez included, a little less than half the RCE employees on the surface had chosen to attend the village's community meeting. The others were involved in their work or still too badly injured. If she hadn't felt it was part of her job to educate everyone about the contamination hazards, Elvie would probably have stayed back at her hut, too. Most of the RCE personnel were field scientists. They dressed for comfort, herself included. The only ones in formal clothes were the security team. Hobart Reeve, Murtry's second, led three armed guards in RCE uniforms that made them look like soldiers or police. They hadn't been on the big shuttle, but had arrived on a light shuttle almost immediately. When the order had come in from RCE that no new personnel were going planetside until the UN observer arrived, Reeve had already been investigating what he always called the incident. The community hall was one side of the village's central square set across the bare dirt and stone from the temple. Apart from the collection of religious iconography at the temple's eaves, the two were hard to tell apart. The chairs were made from industrial cowling and modified crash couches. If the village had been in a more temperate part of the planet, there would have been more local flora, some sort of wood analog to use. But this was where the lithium was nearest the surface, and lithium was what would bring money to the community. So, like a microorganism moving along a concentration gradient, all of humanity had come to these twenty square kilometers. Elvi sat at the back with the other RCE employees, except Reeve and the security detail, who sat closer to the front with the locals. She watched them all segregate without a word. No one enforced the separation, but it was there. Michaela, an atmospheric physicist, sat beside her with a smile. Anik and Tor, both geoengineers, sat on her other side, hand in hand. Fayez in the couch beyond her, talking with Sudyam, who had come down with the first small shuttle after the accident. The incident. The attack. Anik leaned in and murmured something to Tor. He blushed and nodded a little too vigorously. Elvie tried to ignore the sexual byplay. The mayor of First Landing was a thick-featured Martian woman with a broad accent and finger-cut hair named Carol Chuiwi, only they called her the coordinator, not the mayor. She called the meeting to order, and Elvie felt her heart starting to beat faster. The Belters had set the agenda, and so it started off with issues that were more important to them than to Elvi or RCE. 
the maintenance schedule for the water purification systems, whether to accept a credit line from an OPA-backed bank at unfavorable terms, or wait until the first load of lithium came back and try for better. Everything was talked about in calm, considered terms. If there was anger or fear or murder, they had buried it so deeply that the mound didn't show. Reeves' turn came, and he stepped smartly to the front of the room. His lips made a thin, forced smile. Thank you, Madam Coordinator, for inviting us to speak, he said. We have confirmation that the Independent Observer is on the way with a commission from the UN, the Martian Congress, and the OPA to assist with moving the development of the colony forward. It is our hope to have the security issues addressed before they arrive. We hope to hang the bad guys on a rope before anyone gets here and says we can't. Fayez translated quietly enough for the words to reach Elvie's ears and no farther. We have definitely identified the explosive used in the attack, and we are looking into which individuals had access to it. We don't have a goddamn clue who did it, and since you hicks store mining explosives in an unlocked shed, we aren't going to figure it out any time soon. I don't have to explain the gravity of this situation, but Royal Charter Energy is committed to the success of this colony for both our employees and this community. We're all in this together, and my door is always open to anyone with questions or concerns, and I hope that we can rely on the same kindness and collaboration that you've extended to us since we came. So since we've got nothing, we'd really appreciate it if those of you who know who set the charges would just tell us. And also, please consider not murdering us in our sleep. Thanks for that. Sudyam coughed to hide her laughter, and Fayez flashed a grin. At the front of the room, Reeve nodded and stepped down. The coordinator stood up, looking toward the back of the room. Elvie felt the sudden, powerful need to urinate. Dr. Akoy? The coordinator said. You wanted to speak? Elvie nodded and rose to her feet. It was about ten meters to the front of the room, and Elvie walked forward with her nerves screaming. The heat of the crowd's bodies seemed suddenly oppressive, the smell of sweat and dust overwhelming. Her tongue felt sticky and thick in her mouth, but she smiled. At an estimate, two hundred people sat before her, their eyes on her. Her heart ticked over so fast she had to wonder whether there was enough air in the room. She remembered someone telling her once to look for a friendly face in the crowd and pretend she was only speaking to them. Four rows in on the left, Lucia Merton was sitting with her hands folded in her lap. Elvie smiled, and the woman smiled back. I just wanted to take a minute, Elvie said, to talk about how we can limit cross-contamination with the environment, because we lost the dome, the hard perimeter dome. Lucia looked grave. Elvie chanced a look at the rest of the crowd, and then wished she hadn't. Part... Um, part of the RCE's agreement with the UN was that we do a complete environmental study. We're in just the second biosphere that we've ever seen, and there's so much we don't know about it that the more we can keep it pristine, the better we'll be able to understand it. Ideally, we'd have a totally enclosed system here on the surface, tight as a ship, airlocks and decontamination rooms and... She was babbling. She grinned, hoping that someone would smile back. No one did. She swallowed. Every time we breathe, we're taking in totally unknown microorganisms. And even though we've got different proteomes, we're still big blobs of water and minerals. Sooner or later, one of the indigenous species is going to find a way to exploit that. And it goes the other way, too. Every time we defecate, we're introducing billions of bacteria into the environment. 
So now you're going to tell us how we can shit? A man's voice said. Elvie felt the sudden heat of a blush in her neck and cheeks. Even Lucia's expression had gone cold and distant, the woman's gaze fixed on nothing. I only meant that if we were doing this right, we'd have a protected, sterile environment, and we wouldn't be going out into the ruins or cultivating crop plants in the open air because... Because you think we did it wrong, the man sitting at Lucia's side said. He was a big man, with a dusting of gray at his temples and in the stubble of beard and a permanently angry face. Only you don't get to decide that. I understand that we're working with a complex situation here, Elvie said, her voice getting rough with desperation. But we're all living in this massive petri dish already, and I have a list of a few little sacrifices that we can all make that, from a scientific perspective... The man beside Lucia Merton flushed, and he leaned forward, his fists on his thighs, his eyes fixed on her like a predator's. I'm done sacrificing things to science, he said, and the buzz in his voice was a promise of violence. Lucia put a restraining hand on the man's wrist, but others around the room had taken up the man's disdain. The sounds of their bodies shifting in the seats, the murmur of voices in small conversations of their own, filled the air. Whoever killed trying is probably in this room, she thought, and then immediately after that, What the hell am I doing here? Carol Chewiwi stood up, her expression pained, embarrassed on Elvie's behalf. Maybe we better come back to that another time, Dr. Okoy she said. It's late, and people are tired, ne? Yes, Elvie muttered. Yes, of course. Her skin burning with shame, she walked back toward her seat, and then past it, out into the street, and alone in the deepening night toward her hut. Her shoes scraped in the gravel and dirt. The air was cool and smelled like coming rain, she wasn't more than halfway there, moving slowly in the near-black starlight, when a voice stopped her. I'm sorry about my dad. Elvie turned. The girl was little more than a deeper darkness in the night, a slightly more solid shadow. Elvie found herself thankful that the voice wasn't a man's. It's okay, she said. I don't think I did that very well. No, it's him, the girl said, stepping closer. You couldn't have done right with him. My brother died, and now Dad's not that kind of man anymore. Oh, Elvie said, and then, I'm sorry. The girl nodded, shuffled with something, and a pale green light, no brighter than a candle, bloomed in her palm, casting shadows up over the girl's face. She was pretty the way youth is always pretty, but when she got older, Elvie thought she might be beautiful the way her mother was. You're Dr. Merton's daughter, Elvie said. Felsia, the girl said. Good to meet you, Felsia, Elvie said. I can walk you home if you don't have a light. I don't, Elvie said. I should have brought one. Everyone forgets sometimes, the girl said, setting off. Elvie trotted a little to catch up with her. For a dozen meters, they walked in silence. Elvie sensed that the girl was building up to something, a confession or threat, something dangerous. Elvie hoped that she wasn't just being paranoid, and was certain that she wasn't. When the girl spoke at last, her voice was tight with anxiety and longing, and her words were the last thing Elvie would have guessed. What's it like going to a real university? Chapter 7 Holden There should be fanfare, Holden thought. Passing through a ring into another star system, 
halfway across the galaxy from Earth, should be a dramatic moment. Trumpets or loud alarms, tense faces locked on view screens. Instead, there was nothing. No physical sign that the Rosinante had been yanked 50,000 light years across space. Just the eerie black of the hub replaced by the unfamiliar star field of the new solar system. Somehow, the fact that it was so mundane made it stranger. A wormhole gate should be a massive, swirling vortex of light and energy, not just a big ring of something sort of like metal with different stars on the other side. He resisted the urge to hit the general quarters alarm, just to add tension to the moment. The new sun was a faint dot of yellow-white light, not all that different from Sol when viewed from the ring sitting just outside Uranus' orbit. It had five rocky inner planets, one massive gas giant, and a number of dwarf planets in orbits even farther out than the ring. The fourth inner planet, sitting smack dab in the middle of the Goldilocks zone, was Illus, New Terra, Bearing Survey 4, RCE Charter 24771912-F23, whatever you wanted to call it. All those names were too simple for what it really was. Mankind's first home around an alien star. Humans kept finding ways to turn the astonishing events of the last few years mundane. A few decades from now, when all the planets had been explored and colonized, the hub and its rings would just be a freeway system. No one would think twice about them. Wow, Naomi said, staring at Illus's star on the display with wide-eyed awe. Holden felt a rush of affection for her. I was just thinking that, he said. Glad I'm not the only one. He opened a channel up to the cockpit. Yo, Alex said. How fast can you get us there? Pretty damn fast. If you're willing to be uncomfortable, put us on a fast burn schedule and get some dirt under my feet, Holden said with a grin. High burn will get us on the ground in about seventy-three days. Seventy-three days, Holden said. Well, seventy-two point eight. Space, Holden said, trading his grin for a sigh. Is too damn big. Five hours into their burn, the messages started to come in. Holden had Alex bring them down to one-third G for dinner and played the first recording on the galley screen while he helped Amos make pasta. An older man, brown-skinned and gray-haired, stared out of the screen at him. He had the features and large cranium of a belter and just a hint of a series accent. Captain Holden, he said once the recording started. Fred Johnson notified us you were coming, and I wanted to thank you for your help. My name is Kasim Andrada, and I'm captain of the independent freighter Barba Piccola. Let me fill you in on the situation as it stands. This should be good, Amos grunted, dumping steaming spaghetti noodles into a colander to drain them. Holden handed him the pot of red sauce he'd been stirring, then leaned against the counter to watch the rest of the broadcast. The colony finally got a working mining operation running about four months ago. In that time, we've brought up several hundred tons of raw ore from our mine. At the purity levels we're seeing, that should translate to almost a dozen tons of lithium after refining. It's enough to buy equipment, medicine, soil, and seeds, everything this colony needs to get a real toehold. Naomi came into the galley, tapping away furiously at her hand terminal. Smells good. I... She stopped when she saw the video playing and sat down to watch. The Edward Israel, Captain Andrada continued has stated that they will not allow us to leave orbit until the arbitration is complete. 
Royal Charter's position being that they own this lithium until someone says they don't. One of your first priorities will be to get the Israel to lift the blockade and let us take this ore to the palace refineries, where we already have buyers lined up and waiting. Oh, Amos said, dumping the pasta and sauce into a large bowl and putting it on the table. Is that our priority? Holden passed the playback. Did come across as an order, didn't it? He's OPA, Naomi said. He thinks you're here as Fred's mouthpiece. This guy's gonna give me indigestion, Holden said, killing the recording. I'll watch the rest of this crap after we eat. Five more broadcasts were queued up for viewing by the next day. The captain of the Edward Israel, an older Earthman named Marwick, with flaming red hair and a British accent, demanded that Holden enforce the RCE charter by disabling the engines of the Barba Piccola if it tried to leave the system. Fred sent along encouragement and a reminder that Avasarala was shotgunning threats about the consequences for screwing the mission up. Three different news organizations asked for interviews, including a personal request from Monica Stewart for a live interview when he returned. Miller watched them over his shoulder until Naomi came into their room and the detective disappeared in a blue shower of sparks. I think Monica likes you, Naomi said with a grin, then flopped down onto the double-sized crash couch they used as a bed. Alex is taking us back up to Highburn in twelve minutes, and I want to die. Monica would flirt with a lizard if she thought it would get her a good interview. Tell Alex to give us another half hour so I can send a few responses. And hold on, I'll get my gun. Naomi pushed herself up with a groan. I'll get some coffee while you find your bullets. Don't leave, Holden said, reaching for her arm. I don't want to record these broadcasts with Miller standing behind me. He's only in your head, she said, but she sat back down anyway. He won't show up on the recording. Do you think that makes it less uncomfortable? Really? Naomi crawled across the bed and curled up next to him, putting her head on his chest. He tugged on a lock of her hair, and she let out a long, contented sigh. I like long flights when we aren't doing these bone-crushing mad dashes, she said. Nothing to do but read, listen to music, stay in bed all day. You being famous sucks. It's also the reason we're sort of rich now. We could sell the ship, go get jobs at Pern Clean again, do the Saturn ice run. Holden stayed silent and played with her hair. It wasn't a serious suggestion. They both knew there was no going back to the people they used to be. Him, the XO, and her, the chief engineer on an ice hauler that no one in the universe cared about unless it was late for a delivery. Anonymous people living anonymous lives. Would anyone even need Pern Clean anymore with a thousand new worlds full of water and air? You going to be okay without me down there? Naomi said. The Belter colonists from Ganymede had spent months on the Barba Piccola preparing for landing on Illus. Loading up on bone and muscle growth hormones, working out under a full G, until their bodies would be able to handle the slightly heavier-than-Earth gravity of the planet. Naomi didn't have the time or inclination to radically alter her physiology for this one job. Holden had argued that she would have then been able to come to Earth with him after. She replied that she was never going to Earth, no matter what. They'd left it at that, but it was still a sore spot for him. No, I won't, he said, deciding not to revisit the argument. But there it is. Amos will look after you. Great, Holden said. 
I'll land in the middle of the tensest situation in two solar systems, and instead of the smartest person I know, I'll bring the guy most likely to get into a bar fight. You might need that, she said, her fingers tracing some of the scars he'd picked up over the last couple years. She stopped at a dark spot on his stomach. You still taking your cancer meds? Every day. For the rest of my life, he didn't add. Have their doctor look at this after you land. Okay. They're using you, she said, as if they'd been talking about it all along. I know. They know this is all going to go wrong. There's no solution that doesn't leave someone angry and out in the cold. That's why they're sending you. You're an easy scapegoat. They hired you because you won't hide anything. But that's the same thing that makes you easy to blame for the inevitable failure of these talks. If I thought it was inevitable, I wouldn't have taken the job, Holden said. And I know why they hired me for this. It's not because I'm the most qualified. But I'm not quite the idiot they think I am. I think I've learned a few new tricks. Naomi reached up and pulled a hair out of his temple. Before he could say, ouch, she held it up in front of him. It was the gray of damp ashes. Old dog, she said. The flight to Illus was grueling in more ways than just the long periods at high G. Every time the Rosinante dropped to a tolerable rate of acceleration for meals and maintenance, Holden would have dozens of messages waiting to be viewed and responded to. The captain of the Edward Israel became increasingly forceful in his demands for Holden to issue threats to the captain of the Barba Piccola. The colonists and their belter compatriots in orbit were increasingly demanding that the Barba Piccola be released from lockdown. Both sides accused the other of escalating the conflict, though in Holden's opinion, the fact that only the colonists had so far shed blood lessened their claim in that regard. Their argument that only the sale of their lithium ore could make them a viable colony, and that the blockade of the shipment was effectively starving them out, was, however, a compelling one. RCE continued to insist that since they had the UN Charter, the mining rights and the load of lithium in orbit were theirs. A thousand new worlds to explore and we're still fighting over resources, Holden said to no one after a particularly long and angry message from the RCE Legal Council on the Israel. Alex, who was lounging at the ops station nearby, answered anyway. Well, I guess lithium is like real estate. Nobody's making any more of it. You did hear the part about a thousand new worlds, right? Maybe some of them have more lithium, but maybe they don't. And this one definitely does. People used to think gold was worth fighting over. And that shit gets made by every supernova, which means pretty much every planet around a G2 star will have some. Stars burn through lithium as fast as they make it. All the available ore got made at the Big Bang, and we're not doing another one of those. Now that's scarcity, friend. Holden sighed and aimed an air vent at his face. The cool breeze from the recyclers made his scalp tingle. The ship wasn't hot. The sweat had to be coming from stress. We're astonishingly short-sighted. Just you and me? Alex said, exaggerating his drawl to make a joke of it. A vast new frontier has opened up for us. We have the chance to create a new society with untold riches beyond every gate. But this world has treasure. So instead of figuring out the right way to divide up the damned galaxy, we'll fight over the first crumbs we find. Alex nodded, but didn't reply. I feel like I need to be there right now, Holden continued after a moment. I'm worried by the time we land, everyone will be so locked into their positions that we won't be able to help. Huh, Alex said, 
then laughed. <laughs> you think we're going there to help? I think I am. I'll be down in engineering if anyone needs me. One hour to burn, Alex replied to his back. Holden kicked the deck hatch release, and it slid open with a hiss. He climbed down the ladder past the crew decks to the machine shop, where Amos was taking apart something complex-looking on one of the benches. Holden nodded to him and kicked open the final hatch into the reactor room. Amos shot him a questioning look, but Holden just shook his head and the mechanic turned back to his work with a shrug. When the hatch slid closed above him, the reactor room flashed with a blue light. Holden slid down the ladder to the deck, then leaned back against the wall. Hey, Miller said, coming around the reactor that dominated the center of the room, as though he'd been standing on the other side of it, waiting for Holden to arrive. We need to talk, Holden replied. That's my line. The detective gave him a sad, basset hound smile. We're doing what you wanted. We've come through a ring into one of the other systems. You'll get to, I assume, ride me to the planet and take your look around. Miller nodded, but didn't speak. How much of what I'm about to say does he already know? How predictive is the brain model they've made of me? Holden decided wondering that was the path to madness. I need to know two things, Holden said or this trip ends right now. Okay, Miller said with a palms-up, belter version of a shrug. First, how are you following me around? You first showed up on this ship after Ganymede, and you've been everywhere I go ever since. Am I infected? Is that how you stay with me? I've gone through two gates without ditching you, so either you're inside my head, or you're a galaxy-wide phenomenon. Which is it? Yeah, Miller said, then took off his hat and rubbed his short hair. Wrong on both counts. First answer is, I live here. During the Ganymede incident, which is a stupid name for it, by the way, the protomolecule put a local node inside this ship. Wait, this protomolecule stuff in the Rossi? Holden said, fighting down the surge of panic. If Miller wanted to hurt him and had the means to do so, it would already have happened. Yeah, Miller said with a shrug, like it wasn't a big deal. You had a visitor, remember? You mean I had a half-human monster, Holden said, that almost killed Amos and me, and that we vaporized in our drive trail. Yeah, that'd be him. To be fair, he wasn't exactly running a coherent program, that one. But he had enough of the old instructions left that he placed some material on the ship. Not much, and not what you'd call live culture. Just enough to keep a connection between the ring station's processing power and your ship. You infected the Rossi? Holden said, fear and rage briefly warring in his gut. Don't know I'd use that verb, but all right, if you want. It's what lets me follow you around, Miller said, then frowned. What was the other thing? I don't know if I'm done with this thing, Holden said. You're safe. We need you. And when you don't? Then no one's safe, Miller said, his eerie blue eyes flashing. So stop obsessing. Second thing? Holden sat down on the deck. He hadn't wanted to ask how Miller was in his head, because he was terrified the answer would be that he was infected. The fact that he wasn't, but his ship was, was both a relief and a new source of fear. What will we find down on Ellis? What are you looking for? Same thing as always. Who done it? Miller said. 
After all, something killed off the civilization that built all this. And how will we know when we've found it? Oh, Miller said, his grin vanishing. He leaned toward Holden, the smell of acetate and copper filling the air, or else only his senses. We'll know. Chapter 8 Elvi. The sandstorms tended to start in the late afternoon and last until a little after sundown. They began as a softening of the western horizon. Then the little plant analogues in the plain behind her hut would fold their photosynthetic surfaces into tight puckers like tiny green mouths that had tasted lemon, and twenty minutes later the town and the ruins and the sky would all disappear in a wave of dry sand. Elvi sat at her desk, Falcia at the foot of the bed, and Fayez with his back against the headboard. Falcia had become a regular visitor, more often than not to talk with Elvi or Fayez or Sudyam. Elvi liked having her around. It made the division between the township and the RCE teams seem not less real, but less terrible, permeable. Today, though, felt different. Felsia seemed more tightly wound than usual. Maybe it was the fact that the UN mediator's ship was getting close. Maybe it was the weather. So our solar system only has one tree of life, Elvi said, moving her hands in the air as if to conjure it up. It started once, and everything we've ever found shares that ancestry, but we don't know why. Why we all share? Falcia asked. Why it didn't happen twice? Elvi said. Only one kind of Schrodinger crystal, one coden map. Why? If all the materials were there for amino acids to form and connect and interact, why wasn't there one schema that started in one tide pool, and then another someplace else, and another and another? Why did life arise just the one time? So what's the answer? Falcia asked. Elvi let her hands wilt a little. A particularly strong gust drove a wave of hard grit against the side of the hut. Which answer? Why it only happened once? Oh, I don't know. It's a mystery. Same reason there's only one tool-using hominid left. The ones that still exist killed all the competition, Fayez said. That's speculation, Elvi said. Nothing in the fossil record indicates that there was more than the one beginning of life on Earth. We don't get to just make things up because they sound good. Elvi is very comfortable with mysteries. Fayez said to Felsia with a wink. It's why she has a hard time relating with those of us who feel anxious with our ignorance. Well, you can't know everything, Elvi said, making it a joke to hide a tinge of discomfort. God knows I can't, especially not on this planet, Fayez said. There was no point sending a geologist here. I'm sure you're doing fine, Elvi said. Me? Yes, I'm wonderful. It's the planet's fault. It's got no geology. It's all manufactured. How do you mean? Felsia asked. Fayez spread his hands as if he were presenting her with the whole world. Geology is about studying natural patterns. Nothing here is natural. The whole planet was machined. The lithium ore you people are mining? No natural processes exist that would make it as pure as what you're pulling out of the ground. It can't happen. So, apparently, whatever built the gates also had something around here somewhere that concentrated lithium in this one spot. That's amazing, though, Elvi said. If you're into industrial remediation, which I'm not, and the southern plains, 
You know how much they vary? They don't. The underlying plate is literally as flat as a pane of glass. Somewhere about fifty clicks south of here, there's some kind of tectonic Zamboni machine, about which I am qualified to say absolutely nothing. Those tunnel complexes? Yeah, they're some kind of old planetary transport system. And yet here I am. I need a letter of recommendation, Felcia blurted, then looked down at her hands, blushing. Elvi and Fayez exchanged a glance. The wind howled and muttered. For what? Elvi asked gently. I'm going to apply for university, the girl said. She spoke quickly, like the words were all under pressure, and then more slowly until at last she trailed away. Mother thinks I'll probably get in. I've been talking with the Hadrian Institute on Luna, and Mother arranged that I can get back to Palace when the Barba Piccola takes the oar, and then take passage on my own from there. Only the application needs a letter of recommendation, and I can't ask anyone in the town, because we haven't told Daddy... And, oh, L.V. said, well, I don't know. I mean, I've never seen your academic work. Seriously? Fayez said with a snort. L.V., it's a letter of recommendation. You're not under oath for it. Cut the kid a break. Well, I just thought it would be better if I could actually say something I know about. When I went to Lower University, I wrote my own letters of recommendation. Two of them came from people I made up. No one checks. Elvie's jaw dropped a centimeter. Really? You are an amazing woman, Elvie, but I don't know how you survive in the wild. Fayez turned to Felcia. If she won't, I will. You'll have it by morning, okay? I don't know how I can repay you, Felcia said, but she already looked calmer. Fayez waved the comment away. Your undying gratitude is thanks enough. What's your field of study going to be? For the next hour, Felcia talked about her mother's medical career and her dead brother's immune disorder and intracellular signaling regulation. Elvie began to realize that she'd unconsciously thought of the girl as younger than she really was. She had the long, slightly gangly build and comparatively large head of a belter, and somewhere in Elvie's mind she'd mistaken it for youth. Felcia would have fit right in at the commons of Lower University. The light shifted from beige to deep brown to a burnt umber and then darkness. The wind calmed. When Elvie opened her door, two centimeters of fine dust covered the walkway, and the stars glimmered in the sky. The air smelled like fresh-turned earth. Some sort of actinomycete analog, Elvie thought. Maybe one that was actually carried by the wind. Or maybe something else. Something stranger. Felcia headed back for the town, Fayez for his own hut. As far as she could tell, Fayez was one of maybe two or three other people on the science team who was still sleeping alone. Sudyam and Tollerson were the latest pairing. Laberge and Maravallis had just broken off the relationship they'd started on the journey out, and each of them was already involved with someone else. Sex wasn't a strange thing among the scientific teams. That it was unprofessional behavior was set in balance against the fact that, especially on a years-long field expedition like this, the pool of potential mates was both very restricted and generally fairly high value. People were people. If she felt any jealousy at all, it wasn't for any of the particular relationships but for intimacy itself. It would be nice to have someone to walk with in the darkness after the storm, someone to wake up with in the morning. She wondered what the sexual politics were among the families of First Landing. 
If RCE had thought to send a social science team, it might have made a good paper. Ahead of her and to the right, the alien ruins stood against the horizon, hardly more than a deeper darkness. Only a light was moving in them. It was small and faint, less than a star, and only visible at all because it was moving. Someone was in the ruins again, contaminating the sight. She knew intellectually that she was letting herself be angry about it because it was better than feeling lonesome or guilty, but that didn't keep the rage from feeling real. She turned back to her hut, her lips pressed together. She scooped up a flashlight, checked the battery charge, and stalked out toward the ruins, the thin blue circle of light bobbing ahead of her and illuminating her way. The fine dust shifted under her feet like snow, and her thighs ached from the speed of her hike. As she neared the ruins, she thought she saw a dim light heading the other way, back toward the town. But when she called after it, no one answered. She stood in the darkness for almost a minute, feeling first unsure of herself, then embarrassed, then angry at feeling embarrassed. A path led into the ruins that even the recent dustfall couldn't conceal. Tracks as wide as a wagon where wheels had gone over the land often enough to leave ruts. Elby shook her head and followed the path up, twisting around a high shoulder of land and into the huge alien structures. Inside, the beam of her flashlight caught the walls and surfaces, sending off glittering reflections that seemed to shift whether she did or not. Where there was shelter from the wind, there were footprints, lots of them. It wasn't just someone from town exploring on their own. They were treating the ruins like some sort of clubhouse. Any samples the science team took from the soil here would already be compromised. The microorganisms, a mixture of known and unknown, and whatever emerged when the two encountered each other in a totally uncontrolled environment. That the same was true of the whole township seemed insignificant. These were alien structures. They'd been built by a vast, vanished civilization about which humanity still knew almost nothing. It wasn't some kind of treehouse. Hello? she shouted. Is anyone in here? Nothing answered her, not even the wind. Shaking her head, she stalked deeper into the shadows. If anyone was here, she'd give them the talk she'd meant to give before. She would make them understand the issues, even if it took hectoring them all night. The walls around her rose at strange and unsettling angles from the ground, organic and also not like a machine that was built to pass for the product of nature. Arches rose, looking out over the bare, dark land. The deeper LV went, the more there seemed to be, until she had the illusion that the ruins were larger inside than out. She was about to give up and turn back home when she saw something square. Simply being rectilinear made it stand out. The boxes were plastic and ceramic, functional gray where they weren't the bright red and yellow of warning labels. Danger. High explosive. Do not store near heat or Class Three radiation sources. Oh, no, Elvie said to herself. Oh, hell no. Dr. O'Coy, Reeve said. I'm hearing you tell me that you found explosives outside of the town. Yes, Elvie said. Of course, that's what you're hearing me say. And that there is evidence of several people having been to this clandestine site. They were sitting in Reeve's office now. The light from his lamp shone warm and soft, and his rough pants and untucked shirt suggested she'd rousted him out of bed. It felt like the middle of the night, though the extended rotational period meant the darkness would be stretching on for almost another ten hours. 
Yes, she said. All right, Reeve said. That's all right. This is a good thing. I need you to tell me how to find this place. Yes, of course. I'll take you. No, I need you to stay right here. Not back to your hut. Not out to the ruins. I need you right here where it's safe. You understand? There was someone out there. I saw the light, and that's why I went. What if they'd still been there? We don't have to worry about that, because it didn't happen, Reeve said in a carefully reassuring tone of voice that meant, You'd be dead. Elvie dropped her head into her hands. Can you give me directions? She did her best, her voice trembling. Reeve constructed a map on his hand terminal, and she was fairly sure it was accurate. Her mind seemed to be shifting on her a little, though. All right, Reeve said. I'm going to have you stay here for a little while. But my work is all back at the hut. The security man put a reassuring hand on her shoulder, but his gaze was already focused inward, planning some next step that didn't include her. We're going to see you're safe first, he said. Everything else will come after that. For the next hour, she sat in the little room, or paced. The voices of Reeve and his security team filtered in through the wall, the tones serious and businesslike. And then there were fewer of them. A young woman came to get her. Elvie had seen her before, but didn't know her name. It seemed wrong that they could have spent almost two years traveling out here together, and Elvie still didn't know her. It should mean something about populations and how they mixed, and how they didn't. Do you need anything, Dr. Okoy? I don't know where to sleep, Elvie said, and her words seemed thin, fragile. I've got a bunk ready, the girl said. Please, come with me. The rooms were empty, the others gone out into the alien darkness to face a terribly human threat. The girl leading her to the bunk had a sidearm strapped to her belt. Elvie glanced out the front window as they passed. The street was the same one she'd walked down the day before, and it was also wholly changed. A sense of threat hung over everything like the promise of a storm coming like the haze on the horizon. She saw Felsia's brother walking down the street, not looking at her or anything else. Her fear was cold and deep. Chapter 9 Basia Basia had volunteered for the night shift at the mine. Fewer people to hide from. Less open sky to make him jittery. The work as backbreaking as it was, was a relief. The fabricator they'd brought down from the Barba Piccola was building tracks and carts as fast as they could load raw material into it. His team was trying to keep up with its output by assembling the rail system that would move ore from the pit to the sifters to the silos. There, it would wait for the Barba Piccola's shuttle to take it up into orbit. Everything they'd mined so far had been moved with wheelbarrows by hand. A motorized cart system would increase production by an order of magnitude. So, Basia and his team worked the metal rails, pulling them out of the fabricator gleaming and new in the harsh white lights. They loaded them on hand carts and dragged them into the mining pit, then unloaded them by hand and welded them into the growing railway system. It was the kind of physical labor people had mostly stopped doing in their mechanized age, and the process of welding inside an atmosphere was totally unlike welding in vacuum. So he had a new skill set to develop. The combination of mental challenge and physical toil left him exhausted. His world narrowed to the next task the ache in his hands, and the distant promise of sleep. There was no time to dwell on other things. 
like being a murderer. Like the corporate security forces sniffing around for him and Coop and the others. Like the guilt he felt every time Lucia lied to them and said she didn't know anything that would help. Later, when he sat in the crew hunt with his muscles twitching and cramping with fatigue, trying to sleep with the daylight streaming in through the windows, then he could revisit the death of the shuttle over and over again. Think about what he could have done to disable the explosives faster than he did. How he could have tackled Coop, taken the radio away from him. If his mood was especially bad, he would think about how if he'd just listened to his wife, none of it would have happened in the first place. On those days, he felt such shame that he hated her a little for it, then hated himself for blaming her. The pillow he pressed to his eyes kept the sunlight out, but not the images of the shuttle exploding over and over again, screaming like a dying beast as it went down. But during the night, while he worked, he had some measure of peace. So when Coop appeared at the work site, sauntering into the pit like he didn't have a care in the world, Basia almost hit him in the face. Hey, mate, Coop said. Basia dropped his hammer, shoulders slumping. Hey, he said. So we got a thing, Coop continued, throwing one companionable arm around Basia's shoulders. Need me primero on it. That couldn't be good. What thing? Coop guided him away from the work site, smiling and nodding at the few other night shift crew they passed, just two chums out for a walk and a conversation. When they were out of earshot of everyone, he said, Seen that RCE girl? Going up to the ruins. Sent Yasek to check on it. Sent Yasek? Basia echoed. Coop nodded. Good kid. Reliable. Basia stopped, pulling his arm away. Don't! Involve my son in this. Before he could get the words out, Coop waved it off and kept talking. Esther important. Coop stepped close, voice lowering. She went up to the ruins, then went straight to the RCE goons. Yasik says they're planning to wait for us up there. Catch the resistance red-handed. Then we don't go back, Basia said. It seemed so simple. No reason to panic. You crazy, primo? Toda Alice been up there. Trice evidence up the arse. They wait long enough, they get bored and bring a real crime scene team down. We all done. All of us. Either unless you stop shedding skin when you were there. Then what? We go up first. A flare on that blessing powder, boom. No more evidence. When? Coop laughed. What do you think? Next week sometime? Now, Koyo. Gotta go now. Mediator's landing in hours, not days. Don't want this to be what he sees when he steps off the ship, do you? You a team lead. You can take one of the carts. We gotta get that shit and get gone. Coop snapped his fingers impatiently. Jetst. Coop spoke about insanity, like blowing up their stash of mining explosives, with such an air of self-assurance and certainty, Basia found it hard to argue. Sure, blowing up the alien ruins was crazy, but Coop was right. If they found the explosives and traced them back to Basia, they'd know. He didn't want to, but he had to, so he would. Okay, he said, and walked toward the cart charging station. Only one was left. And because the universe was a cruel and mocking place, it was the same one he'd been driving the night of the bombing. It still had the dents and scorch marks it had picked up that night, the scorch marks everyone in the colony was careful not to ask about. Coop waited impatiently for him to unlock it and back it out of the stall, 
then hopped in and started tapping out a fast drumbeat on the plastic dashboard. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Basia went. Halfway to the alien ruins, they came across four more of Coop's inner circle. Pete and Scotty and Kate and Ibrahim. No Zadie. Her little boy had come down with a nasty eye infection, and she wasn't around much lately. Kate had a duffel bag she threw into the back of the cart with a metallic thump. Then the four of them climbed in after it. That the stuff? Coop asked and Kate nodded and slapped the side of the cart to let Bossia know he could drive. Bossia didn't ask what the stuff was. Too late to start questioning. The ruins looked as dark and deserted as they ever did, but Coop made Bossia drive the long way round to come at the site from the side opposite the town. Just to be safe, he said. When Kate pulled open the duffel, Bossia wasn't surprised to see it filled with guns. The Barba Piccola hadn't been a warship. They hadn't left Ganymede with a great store of weapons. But what there was had come down to the surface when first landing was begun. This looked like most of them. Kate pulled out a shotgun and started loading fat plastic shells into it. She was a tall, Raw-boned woman with a wide jaw and a permanent frown line between her eyes. She looked natural holding a gun. Like a soldier. When Bossia picked one up, a short-barreled automatic pistol of some kind, he felt like a child playing dress-up. You'll need this, killer, Ibrahim said and tossed him a narrow, metallic object. It took Bossia several seconds to realize it was the magazine for his pistol. It only took two tries to slide it in the correct way. Blow the explosives, clear the site, destroy the evidence. That had never really been the plan, and somewhere in his gut, he'd known. While the rest of the group finished readying their weapons, Bossia stood a few meters from the cart, staring up at the night sky. One of the points of light was the drive tail of the Rosinante, the ship Jim Holden was flying in on, the Mediator, the one who was supposed to keep the colonists and RCE people from killing each other. He wondered how far out Holden was. He wondered if the man knew he was already too late. Too late for the second time. Holden had been too late on Ganymede, too. Basia's son, Katoa, hadn't been the only one who was sick, whose immune system had faltered and failed under the thousand different stressors of life outside a gravity well. There had been a group of them who'd come to Dr. Strickland, the man who was supposed to know the answers. Katoa, Tobias, Anna Marie, May. May, who had lived, who James Holden had rescued from the labs on Io. Holden had been there when they found Katoa, too. Basia had never met the man, had only ever seen him on news broadcasts. But May's father had been a friend. He'd sent a message telling Basia what had happened, and that he'd been with Holden when they found the boy's body. Why one and not the other? Praxidike's May, but not his Katoa. Why did some people die and others live? Where was the justice in it? The stars he looked up at didn't have any answers for him. Holden had been too late to stop what was happening on Illus right now before anyone had ever set foot on it. Before the rings opened, before Venus bloomed. If Katoa were still alive, Bossia wouldn't have come here, and if he had, he wouldn't have stayed. It was a strange thought, surreal. Basia tried to picture the man he'd be in that other timeline, and couldn't. He looked down at the ugly black gun in his hand. I wouldn't be doing this. Game's on, someone said. Basia turned around. It was Coop. Get back in it, Coyo. Dewey. 
Basia said, and took a deep breath. The night air was cold and crisp, and tasted vaguely of dirt from that afternoon's dust storm. Dewey. Follow on, Coop said, then headed off to the ruins at a slow trot. Kate and Ibrahim and Pete and Scotty followed, clutching their guns in what they probably thought was a military style. Basia carried his pistol by the barrel, worried about getting his fingers anywhere near the trigger. They entered the massive alien structure through one of the many openings in its side. Windows, doors? No aliens left to say. Inside, the light coming off their flashlights and work lamps reflected off the smooth, strangely angled walls. The material looked like stone, was smooth as glass, and turned from black to a rosy pink where the light hit it. Basia trailed his fingers along it. Coop waved for them to stop, and then ducked down and crab-walked over to a window-like opening in one wall. He peeked over and dropped back down, motioning for the group to join him. Basia hunkered down with the rest. See? Coop whispered, pointing at the next room beyond the window. Knew they'd set up there. Kate popped up for a second to look, then crouched down again with a nod. I see five. Reeve, the boss, and four of his goons. Sidearms and stun guns. They're all looking the wrong way. Too easy, boss. Scotty whispered with a grin and clicked off the safety on his rifle. Kate slid open the breech on her shotgun just far enough to make sure there was a shell loaded. Coop held up his big automatic pistol in one hand and yanked back the slide. Then, on his other hand, he raised three fingers and started silently counting down. Basia looked at each of them in turn. They looked flushed and excited. All except Pete, who stared back at Basia, his skin looking a sickly green in the pale light, and his head shaking back and forth in a silent negation. Basia could practically hear the man thinking, I don't want to do this. Something shifted in Basia's mind, and the world seemed to snap into focus with an almost physical sensation. He'd been following Coop in a daze since the moment the man showed up at the worksite, and now they were about to shoot a bunch of RCE security people. Wait, he said. Coop answered by standing up, pointing his pistol into the next room, and firing. Basia's mind stuttered. Time skipped. Coop, yelling obscenities and firing his pistol over and over into the next room. Basia is lying on his back on the floor, looking up as shell casings tumble out of Coop's gun and bounce across the ground next to him. They appear to be moving so slow that Basia can read the manufacturer's stamp. True fire, 7.5 millimeter, they say. Skip. He is standing next to Kate. He has no memory of getting up. She is firing her shotgun, and the sound of it going off in the tight space is deafening. He wonders if he will suffer permanent hearing loss. In the next room, three men and two women in RCE security uniforms are scrambling to take cover, or draw weapons, or return fire. They have looks of panic on their faces. They shout to each other as they move. He doesn't recognize any of the words. One of them fires a pistol, and a bullet slams into the wall near Kate. A piece of the bullet, or a piece of the wall, punches a small hole in her cheek. She continues to fire, as if the injury is beneath notice. Skip. An RCE security woman clutches at her chest as blood fountains out of it. Her face is pale and terrified. He is just a meter away from her, standing next to Scotty. Scotty shoots her again, this time in the neck. She falls backward in slow motion, hands reaching up to the wound, but going limp and lifeless halfway there. And she just looks like she's shrugging. Skip. He stands by himself in a corridor, 
He doesn't know where it is or how he got there. He hears gunfire behind him and screams. An RCE security man is a few meters ahead of him, holding a stun gun. The man has dark skin and bright green eyes, wide with fear. Basia suddenly remembers that the man's name is Zeb, though he can't remember why he knows that. Seb throws the stun gun at him and reaches for the pistol he still has in a holster on his hip. The stun gun bounces off Basia's head, opening up a three-centimeter gash that begins bleeding heavily, but he doesn't feel it. He sees Zeb pulling his pistol, and without thinking about it, he points his own gun at him. He's surprised to see that he's holding it correctly, by the handle, with his finger on the trigger. He doesn't remember doing that. He pulls the trigger, nothing happens. He's about to pull it a second time when there is a loud bang from behind him, and Zeb begins to fall, blood gushing from his forehead. He waits for the blackout. There was no skipping, no respite, no escape. Good job, Coop said behind him. That one almost got away. Basia turned slowly, still in a dream, a fugue, a dissociative state. The impulse to lift his hand one more time, to let the violence carry him just one step farther and shoot Coop, almost lifted his arm. Almost, but not quite. Zeb bled out on the floor. The sounds of gunfire stopped. Behind him, the rest of his group whooped and hollered in happy and excited voices. Basia looked at his gun, remembering how they work in action videos. You put the magazine with the bullets in it in the gun, and then you have to put a bullet in the chamber. He remembered Kate pulling back the breech on her shotgun, Coop pulling back the slide on his automatic. Bossia's gun wouldn't have fired no matter how many times he pulled the trigger. Zeb stopped bleeding. That was almost me, Bossia thought. But the thought had no emotional content yet. No wait. It was like a puff of acrid smoke passing through his mind and then gone again. Help us drag these bodies out back, primo, Coop said, patting him on the back. Zaidi's washing the place down with corrosives and digestive enzymes. Kill the evidence. But they ain't gonna eat the big chunks, eh? Basia helped. It took them several hours to bury the corpses of the five women and men in the hard-packed dirt behind the alien ruins. Coop assured them that the next dust storm would remove all signs that anyone had dug there. The RCE people would just disappear without a trace. Scotty and Pete dragged the rest of their explosives out of the ruins and loaded them on the cart. Then they walked back to town with Kate and Ibrahim. Kate carried her duffel of guns over one shoulder. Basia's pistol was in it again, never having been fired. We had to do this, Coop said once they'd left. Basia didn't know if he was telling Basia that or himself. Basia nodded anyway. You set this up. You knew you were going to kill them, and you made me part of it. Coop gave him a belter shrug and a cruel smile. You knew that coming out, Koyo. You maybe pretended not to, but you knew. Never again, Basia said. And if anyone in my family is hurt because of this, I will kill you myself. He drove back to the mine, then walked to his house. The sun was just coming up when he finally stumbled into his tiny bathroom. The man in the mirror didn't look like a killer but his hands were covered with blood. He started trying to wash them off. Chapter 10 Havelock About five hours before, when Havelock had been halfway through his ten-hour shift, 
A man dressed in an orange and purple suit, so ugly it approached violence, sat down on a couch in a video studio on Mars. Havelock floated against his restraints, considering him. Strapping in was second nature now, even though it felt a little silly. The orbital space around New Terra was essentially empty, and the chance of a sudden acceleration was almost nil. It was just a habit. On the little monitor set into the cabin wall, the young man shook the feed host's hand and smiled at the camera. It's been a while since you came by, Mr. Curvello, the host said. Thank you so much for coming back. Good to be here, Monica, the man said, nodding like he'd been caught at something. Good to be back. So I got a chance to play the new game, and I have to say it seems like a real departure from your previous work. Yeah, the man said shortly. His jaw was tight. There's been a certain amount of controversy, the host said. Her smile was a little sharper. You want to talk about that? It was physically impossible for Havelock to sink back into his couch, but psychologically it was a snap. Monica, look, the man in the ugly suit said. What we're exploring here are the consequences of violence. Everybody's looking at that first section, and they don't think about how everything comes after. Havelock's hand terminal chimed. He muted the news feed and took the connection. Havelock, Murtry said. I have a call I need you to take. His voice was so calm and controlled, Havelock felt his breath go shallow. It was the sound of trouble, and his mind clutched at the first fear that came. The Rosinante and Jim Holden, the UN mediator, was about ten hours from the end of its deceleration burn, almost here, if something had gone wrong with it. Something happened downstairs, Murtry said. I've got Cassie on the horn and I need you to keep her from melting down while I talk to the captain. Is it bad? Yeah. Take the call. Be the calm one. You can do that? Sure, boss, Havelock said. Cool as November. Smooth as China silk. Good man. The picture froze for a fraction of a second, and then Cassie was looking out at him. For a year and a half, they'd been on the ship together, part of the same team, familiar if not intimate. He'd been aware vaguely when she'd struck up a romance with Aragayo, and then when they'd broken it off. He thought of her as a friend because he didn't think about her much at all. In the image, her skin had an ashy color, and her eyes were lined with red. Cassie, Havelock said, his voice falling into the comforting register he'd trained for in the hostage negotiation workshop he'd taken after the series riots. Here things are a little rough down there. Cassie's laugh shifted the camera, shaking her on the screen like an earthquake. She looked away and then back. They're gone, she said. In the pause afterward, her gaze shifted like she was looking for something. More words to say, maybe. They're gone. Okay, he said. A thousand different questions pressed forward, wanting to be asked. What happened? Who's missing? What happened? But Murtry hadn't asked him to find out, and Cassie didn't need an interrogator. Murtry's talking to the captain. I know, Cassie said. We had a lead. We found a hideout. Reeve took them out. I stayed back with the witness. Is the witness there? She's sleeping now, Cassie said. I'm a security systems consultant, Havelock. I'm supposed to be figuring out optimal shift schedules and building the surveillance network. I don't shoot people. That's not my fucking pay grade. Havelock smiled, and Cassie smiled with him, a tear leaking out the side of her eye. For a moment, 
They were both laughing, the horror and the fear transforming into something like exasperation, something a little bit safer. I'm scared as hell, Cassie said. If they come for me, too, I won't be able to stop them. I've got the office locked down, but they could cut through the walls. They could blow the place up. I don't know why we thought it was a good idea to be down here at all. After they blew the heavy shuttle, we should have hauled our butts back up the well and stayed there. We should have dropped rocks on them from fucking orbit. The thing now is keeping you and the witness safe. And how are you going to do that? Cassie asked. Her voice was a challenge, but one that wanted to be answered. You can't, and tell me that you can, all at the same time. We're working on that. Havelock said. I don't even have food in here, Cassie said. It's all at the commissary. I'd kill for a sandwich. I really would. I'd kill for it. Havelock tried to remember what they'd said in the workshop about talking with people who'd been traumatized. There was a list. Four things. The mnemonic was B-E-S-T. He couldn't remember what any of the letters stood for. So, he said, I bet you're pretty freaked out right now. I'm not holding it together. Yeah, it feels like that, but actually, you're doing good just by not making it worse. That's how people usually get it wrong when things go to hell. Overreact, escalate, all goes pear-shaped. You're holed up and talking to us. Means you got good instincts for this. You're making that shit up. Cassie said. I'm just this side of going catatonic. Stay on this side, and that makes it a win. Seriously, though, you're doing the right thing. Stay cool, and we'll get on top of this. I know it feels like it's all going to hell, but you're going to be all right. If I'm not, you will be. But if I'm not, if, right? Okay. Havelock said. If. Do me a favor. There's a guy back on Europa. Hihiri Tapin. He's a food engineer. Okay. Tell him I said I was sorry. She thinks she's going to die. Havelock thought. And she may be right. The bright, coppery taste of fear flooded his mouth. The locals were killing RCE security, and she was the last one standing. He didn't know anything about the state of play down there. For all he knew, there might be three tons of industrial explosive about to turn Cassie into a memory. Any moment she could die, and he could watch her die and not be able to do anything about it. You're going to tell him yourself, he said gently. And after this, it won't even be scary. I don't know. You've never met Hihiri. Promise me? Sure, Havelock said. I've got your back on this one. Cassie nodded. Another tear streaked down her cheek. He didn't feel like he was doing a great job of keeping her from meltdown. A tiny inset window appeared on the feed. Murtry security override. Hey there, Cass, Murtry said. I've talked to Captain Marwick and we're dropping a team to you. It's going to take us a couple hours, though. Your job is to keep that civilian safe. Cassie's voice trembled when she spoke, but it didn't break. There are forty of our people on the planet and two hundred of them. I'm one person. I can't protect everyone. You don't have to, Murtry said. I've sent the lockdown notice. I'm coordinating the science teams. That's on me. Your job is Dr. Okoy. You just keep her breathing until we're down there, okay? Yes, sir. All right, Murtry said. Two hours. You can do this, Cass. Yes, sir. Havelock. We're doing a briefing in the security office right now. If you could pop by. On my way, Havelock said. He undid his straps 
pulled himself out of his couch, and launched for the hallway. The Edward Israel had corridors that were built as elongated octagons, like something his grandfather would have traveled in. The straps and toeholds along the walls had no directionality. He moved quickly down the hall, his brain flipping from telling him that he was climbing up a massive steel and ceramic well to falling headlong down it to, oddly, crawling upside down, as if he were on the ceiling of a drainage pipe. Belters, he'd been told, had a natural sense of themselves, divorced from set ideas of up and down, but he'd only heard that from Belters, and always in the context of how they were better than him. Maybe it was true, maybe it was exaggeration. Either way, by the time he pulled himself into the security office, he felt a little woozy and missed the false gravity of thrust. Ten people clung to the walls, all oriented the same way. Men and women with radically different facial structures and skin tones, and all with the same expression. It was almost eerie. Murtry had broken out the riot gear, and the blue-gray body armor with the high, neck-protecting collars made them all seem like huge, human-shaped insects. Even Murtry was wearing it, so apparently he was going on the drop, too. I have left, Murtry was saying from his place at the front of the room. And you're all I have left. The cavalry's not going to come and save our butts. We are the cavalry. And that means I've already lost everyone I'm going to lose. We are the security team for this whole planet, right here in this room. And we can do it, but not if we're making sacrifices. While we're down there, if you feel threatened, you do whatever it takes to protect yourself and your team. Sir? Oak me? Does that mean we have authorization for lethal response? That means you have authorization for preemptive lethal response, Murtry said, then waited a moment for the words to sink in. Havelock sighed. It was ugly, but there wasn't a choice. If the heavy shuttle had been just a crime, they could have dealt with it like police. But the locals hadn't stopped there, and now more RCE people were missing or dead. So now it was more like a war. Well, at least they'd tried the peaceful way first. Not that the Belters would give them any credit for it. We're dropping in twenty minutes, Murtry said. It's a long, fast drop, and some of it'll be choppy. I'm bringing us down just east of the Belter camp. Smith and Way are squad leads. Our first priority is reaching and reinforcing the office down there. What about the Barba Picola? Someone asked. Screw the Barba Picola. What about the Rosinante? Murtry lifted his hand, palm out. Don't any of you spend your time worrying about what's happening up in orbit or back at home. That's on me, and I'll take care of it. Me and Havelock. Murtry flashed a quick smile at him, and Havelock nodded, almost a little bow. You have your orders, and you have my trust. Let's get downstairs and get this clusterfuck under control. The security force broke, bodies moving through the air in a fast, efficient stream toward the hangar and the light shuttles. Havelock felt a thin stab of regret, watching the others head down without him. He remembered something from his childhood, a flash of memory, here and gone, about a lame child and the Pied Piper. Murtry floated through the air toward him, moving against the flow. Havelock, good to see you. I'm going to need a minute. Yes, sir. Murtry nodded toward his private office. It was a tiny room, smaller even than a sleeping cabin, with a crash couch on old-style gimbals that arced up and over it. Murtry closed the door behind them. So I'm putting you in charge of the ship. Thank you, sir. I wouldn't go that far. I'm leaving you in a crap position, Murtry said. We've got a full crew on the Israel that are mostly eggheads with their petticoats in a bunch, 
because we're not letting them do science, and the captain's been fighting hard to keep them up here. Now there's trouble. They won't be pushing so hard to go down, but the pressure's got to go someplace. I'm leaving you a skeleton crew to deal with it. We'll get it done, sir. Good man. The biggest threat we've got on the board is the Rosinante. Used to be Martian military before it went OPA. Israel is huge, but we're a science ship. If the Rosinante knocks us down, we're going down. Why would they shoot us down? Murtry shrugged. I think less about why and more about if. So, there's something I need, and it's going to play hell with your shuttle schedules, but I want you to do it anyway. Of course. We're taking one of the light shuttles for the drop, Murtry said slowly, as if he were thinking it through while he spoke, even though that clearly wasn't the case. The one that's left? I want you to weaponize it. Take off anything that'd keep its reactor from overloading, and set it with a hardened remote ignition. Lock out all the standard nav controls, and put in something that just you and me have access to. Captain Marwick, too? Murtry's smile was an enigma. Sure, if you want. Give me half a day. I'll get it done. Havelock said. Good. Sir, who are you thinking we'd be using this against? The Belter camp? We're just buying options, Havelock. I hope not to use it at all, Murtry said. But if I decide I'm going to, I'll want it fast. You'll have it. I feel better knowing that, Murtry said, and put his hand on the desk to push off. Sir? Murtry lifted his eyebrows. Havelock felt a sudden flush of embarrassment and almost didn't go on. And then he did. I know it's a small thing, sir, but when I was on the call, Cassie said she was hungry. I told her we'd bring her a sandwich. Murtry's expression was empty as stone. I was wondering if you could take her a sandwich, sir. Might could manage. Murtry said, and Havelock couldn't tell if the man was amused or annoyed. Maybe both. Havelock floated at his desk. The cells of the brig were all empty. His skeleton crew, the four most junior security staff and a technician they'd borrowed from the ship's maintenance crew, were quietly modifying the one remaining light shuttle, making the bomb. On his monitors, the shuttle drop and the Rosinante's final deceleration burn and the internal monitors of the station with Cassie and Dr. Okoy each had their own window. Havelock watched them all, waiting for the next thing to go wrong. Every minute seemed to stretch. The air recycler hummed and clicked. He chewed his thumbnail. When the incoming message chime sounded, he started and had to put his hands to the console to keep from drifting off. He shifted to his message queue. The new one came from the RCE corporate offices on Luna, and the subject was listed as Possible Strategies for De-Escalating Conflict on New Terra. Call for Input. The timestamp was five hours ago. Somewhere out near the ring gates, the radio signals had passed each other, waves of electromagnetism passing through the void with human meanings coded into them. The distance it had taken a year and a half to travel in person, the message had managed in five hours. Five hours. And still too goddamn slow. Chapter 11 Holden the Rosinante did the last of its deceleration burn on a tail of white fire and dropped into a high orbit around Illus. Below, the planet looked enough like Earth that the fact that it didn't look like Earth was unsettling. Holden had looked down on alien worlds before. The rust red and white of Mars, the swirls and eddies of Saturn and Jupiter, 
They were totally unlike Earth's blue and brown and white. But Illus had open sea and sky with puffs of cloud, all the markers that Holden's brain connected with his homeworld. Except that there was only one large continent, and thousands of islands strung across its one giant ocean like brown beads on a necklace. The mix of alien and familiar made his head hurt. Rosinante, the Edward Israel broadcast at them. Why are you target-locking us? Uh, Holden slapped at the comm panel until he opened a channel to them. No, that's just standard range-finding, Israel. Nothing to worry about. Roger that, a not-quite-convinced voice replied from the other ship. Alex, Holden said, switching to the internal channel. Please stop poking the bear. Roger that, Cap, Alex said, exaggerating his drawl and stifling a laugh. Just letting the locals know there's a new sheriff in town. Stop it. Give us an hour for the final check and get us dirt side. Okie dokie, Alex said. Long time since I landed one of these. Is it going to be a problem? Nope. Holden climbed out of the ops chair and floated to the crew ladder. A few minutes later, he was on the airlock deck with Amos. The mechanic had laid out two suits of their Martian-made light combat armor, a number of rifles and shotguns, and stacks of ammunition and explosives. What? Holden said. Is all this? You said to gear up for the drop. I meant like underwear and toothbrushes. Captain, Amos said, almost hiding his impatience. They're killing each other down there. Half a dozen RCE security vanished into thin air, and a heavy lift shuttle got blown up. Yes, and our job is not to escalate that. Put all this shit away, sidearms only. Bring clothes and sundries for us, any spare medical supplies for the colony. But that's it. Later, Amos said, when you're wishing we had this stuff, I'm going to be merciless in my mockery. And then we'll die. Holden started a snarky reply, then stopped himself. Had anything ever gone the way he planned? Okay, one rifle each but disassembled and in a duffel, nothing visible, and light torso armor only, something we can hide under our clothes. Captain, Amos said with mock surprise, have you actually learned from your past? Is this a new thing you do now? Why do I put up with your shit? Because, Amos said, starting to strip an assault rifle down to its component parts. I'm the only one on the ship that can keep the coffee maker running. I'm off to get underwear and a toothbrush. The Rosinante would have lit the night sky of Illus during the final part of her deceleration burn. When she landed in a field outside of the colony's ramshackle town, she'd kicked up a dust cloud a kilometer across, and the noise of her descent should have rattled windows twice that far away. So Holden was a little surprised and disappointed when no one was there to greet them. He was the joint OPA and Earth mediator, personally selected by Chris Jen Avasarala of the UN and Fred Johnson, leader of the OPA, as much as the OPA could be led, to oversee the settlement talks. In other places, that would merit a formal greeting by the planetary governor and possibly a marching band. Holden would have settled for a ride into town. He hefted his two heavy bags and started to trudge toward the settlement. Amos carried three. The third was the one he called his everything-has-gone-to-shit bag. Holden sincerely hoped they never had to open it. When they were far enough away... Holden sent the signal to Alex, and the Rosinante blasted off again, kicking up a massive dust storm for a few seconds. You know, 
Amos said conversationally. We landed so far from town to avoid blowing dust on the locals, and they couldn't even be bothered to send out a cart to pick us up. Seems ungrateful. Yeah, a little annoyed at that myself. Next time I have Alex land right in the damn town square. Amos gestured with his head at a massive alien structure rising in the distance. It looked like two thin towers of glass twisted together, like a pair of trees growing beside each other. So there's that, he said. Holden had no reply. It was one thing to read about alien ruins on the location report. It was another thing entirely to see a massive construct built by another species towering over the landscape. How old was it? A couple billion years, if Miller could be believed on how long the proto-molecule masters had been gone. Had humans ever built anything that would last that long? According to the security wonks on the Israel, that's where they think their people were massacred, Holden said after they'd walked together for several minutes. Oh, good, Amos replied. Somebody got killed there. That's how we claim stuff, you know. This planet is officially ours now. Other than the admittedly hard-to-ignore alien tower, the rest of the landscape could have been the North American Southwest. Hard-pan dirt with small shrub-like plants. Small creatures scurried away at their approach. For a few moments, they were surrounded by a cloud of biting insects, but after a number of them bit, drank their blood, and dropped dead, the rest seemed to pick up that humans weren't food and lost interest. The colony itself looked like a shantytown, a ramshackle mix of prefab buildings and lean-tos made out of scrap metal and brick. A few were made of mud, so someone had decided to try using adobe. Something about the idea of humans traveling 50,000 light years and then building houses using 10,000-year-old technology put a smile on Holden's face. Humans were very strange creatures, but sometimes they were also charming. A mob had gathered at the center of town, or, more accurately, at the intersection of the only two dirt roads. Fifty or so colonists were facing off with a dozen people in RCE uniforms. They were shouting at each other, though Holden couldn't make out the words. Someone on the edge of the crowd noticed them walking into town and pointed. The arguing died down, and then the entire crowd surged toward Holden and Amos. Holden dropped his bags and waved, smiling. Amos smiled, too, though he casually rested his hand on the butt of his pistol. A tall, stocky woman a few years older than Holden rushed over to him and grabbed his hands. Holden was almost certain she was Carol Chiwiwi, but if that were true, she'd changed a lot since the picture in his briefing files had been taken. Finally! Now you need to tell these goons! Before she could finish, or Holden could respond, the rest of the crowd started shouting at him all at once. Holden could hear snatches of their demands. That he drive off R.C.E. That he give them food or medicine or money. That he let them sell their lithium. That he prove that the colony had nothing to do with the disappearance of the security officers. As Holden tried to quiet the mob, an older man in an RCE security uniform strolled slowly toward him. The rest of the corporate security people followed in a wide V, like a flock of geese. Please, stop. I'll hear out each and every one of your requests once we get settled in. But we can't do anything if you all yell at... Chief Murtry, the RCE man said moving through the crowd like it wasn't there, sticking his hand out and smiling. Royal Charter Energy, head of expedition security. Holden shook his hand. Jim Holden, joint UNPA mediator. The crowd hushed and moved away, 
creating a small circle of calm with Holden and Murtry at its center. Those were your people that disappeared, Holden continued. They got murdered. Murtry corrected him, not losing his smile. The man made Holden think of a shark, all bared teeth and cold black eyes. My understanding is that that was not proven. It's true they cleaned up the scene, but I have no doubt. Until I have no doubt, no punitive action is to be taken, Holden said. He felt Amos move up closer behind him, a silent threat. Murtry's smile didn't reach his eyes. You're the boss. Mediator, Holden said, his tone letting Murtry know that as far as he was concerned, it meant the same thing. Murtry nodded and spat to one side. Sure. The dam broke, and the crowd rushed back in toward them, a tall woman pushing her way to the front. She jabbed her hand at Holden in an angry demand for a handshake. If Murtry had gotten one, she was going to get one, too. Carol Chewiwi, colony coordinator, she said, giving his hand two firm pumps. So that first woman had to have been someone else. Hello, Madam Coordinator, Holden started. This man, she continued, stabbing her fingers at Murtry, is threatening us with martial law. He claims that the Charter gives RCE the right to enforce the laws of the UN Charter and keep the peace, Murtry said, somehow managing to talk over the top of her without raising his voice. Keep the peace, Carol said. You gave your people a shoot-first directive. The crowd rumbled in disapproval at this, and the shouting started up again. Holden waved his arms to calm them back down. He hoped it looked more dignified and commanding than it felt. When Murtry spoke, his voice was calm but hard. I have a hard time seeing how we'd be shooting first. Everybody that's died so far, your people killed. I won't tolerate any further threats against RCE employees or property. A tall man with the large cranium of someone raised in the belt pushed his way to the front. Sounds like a threat right there, mate. Coop, please don't make this worse, Carol said with a resigned sigh. Ah, Coop is a troublemaker, Holden thought, making a note to remember the face. Just seems to me, Coop said, turning to look back at the mob with a grin raising his voice to play to the crowd. Just seems to me that the only one making threats right now is you. The crowd rumbled encouragement, and Coop grinned from ear to ear, enjoying the power that came from giving the mob a voice. Murtry nodded at him, still smiling. There isn't anything I won't do to protect the lives of my team. That's true and we've lost too many already to take further chances. Hey, don't blame us, mate, if you can't keep track of your people. Someone in the crowd laughed. Don't worry, Murtry said. His smile still didn't change, but he stepped in close to Coop. I'll find out what happened to them. Maybe you should be careful, Coop said, looking down at the shorter man, his grin turning feral. Or, you know, it might happen to you, too. That, Murtry said, drawing his gun, was definitely a threat. He shot Coop in the right eye. The belter man went limp and dropped like a machine that had been unplugged. Holden's own gun was in his hand and pointed at Murtry, even before he fully processed what had just happened. Amos stepped up next to him his pistol trained on the RCE security chief. The entire RCE team pulled weapons and aimed them back at Holden. The crowd was deathly silent. What the hell? Holden said. I just said no punitive action. I mean, I just said that. 
You did. That wasn't punitive action. It was a response to a direct verbal threat. Murtry put his pistol away and turned back to Holden. We've established martial law here, under Article 71 of the UN Charter for Exploration of This World. Any threat to RCE personnel will be dealt with swiftly and with prejudice. He stared at Holden for several long seconds, then said, Mine should put your gun away, Captain. Amos took a half-step forward, but Holden put a hand on his arm. Put it away, Amos. He holstered his own gun, and a second later, the RCE team did the same. I'm glad we could establish this working rapport so quickly. I'd recommend you get settled in, Murtry said. I'll come by for a visit later. The coordinator had set aside rooms for Holden and Amos in the large, boxy prefab warehouse structure that had been converted into a combination of general store, commissary, and pub. The rooms in back were furnished with a cot, a table, and a water basin for washing. They gave us the presidential suite, I see, Amos said, dumping his bags on the floor of his tiny room. I need a drink. Give me a second, Holden said, then went into his own room and called up to the Rosinante. He delivered a full report of the landing and the shooting of Coop. Naomi promised to beam it back to Fred and Avasarala for him, and told him to be careful. The bar, such as it was, consisted of four shaky card tables and twenty or so chairs scattered near the commissary corner of the building. Amos was waiting with two bottles of beer when Holden finished up his report. That went well. Get the feeling we may be in over our heads here? Amos asked after a few companionable sips of beer. Feels about normal to me, Holden replied. Yep. They were on their second beer each when Murtry arrived. He talked to the bartender for a minute, then sat down across from Holden and put a bottle of whiskey and three glasses on the table. Have a drink with me, Captain, he said, pouring out three shots. You're going to go to prison for what you did today, Holden said, then tossed back his shot. The whiskey had the sour, moldy taste of belter distillations. I plan to make sure of that. Murtry shrugged. Maybe. My plan is to make sure all my people survive long enough for prison to be an issue. I've lost almost twenty now, between the attack on the shuttle and the murder of my ground team. I won't lose any more. You're a corporate security detail. You don't get to declare martial law and shoot people who don't cooperate. I wouldn't put up with that from legitimate governments, much less a rent-a-cop like you. Holden poured himself another drink and sipped at it. What's the name of this planet? What? The planet. What's its name? Holden leaned forward, the word Illus on his lips. He paused. Murtry's smile was thin. You spent a lot of time working for the OPA, Captain Holden, and you're on record as harboring a deep-seated dislike of the kind of business that employs me. I have some reservations about your ability to address the situation here in an unbiased manner. Threatening me and calling me names doesn't do much to reassure me. You undermined my authority by killing a belter within five minutes of my arrival, Holden said. I did, and I understand that could make you feel that I'm not taking your role here seriously. But your friends in the U.N. are a year and a half away, Murtry said. Think about that. It takes between eight and eleven hours to have the first two exchanges of a conversation and almost nineteen months to get here from there at civilian speeds. Our local governor has been murdered by terrorists. 
My people have been killed for trying to enforce our legal rights. Do you honestly think I'm going to wait for you to fix what's wrong here? No, I'll shoot everyone who threatens the RCE expedition or its employees, and I'll sleep well afterward. That's the reality of where you are now. Better get used to it. I know who you are, Amos said. The big man had been so quiet that both Murtry and Holden started with surprise. Who am I? Murtry asked, playing along. A killer, Amos said. His face was expressionless, his tone light. You've got a nifty excuse and a shiny badge to make you seem right, but that's not what this is about. You got off on smoking that guy in front of everyone. You can't wait to do it again. Is that right? Murtry asked. Yeah. So, one killer to another? You don't want to try that shit with us. Amos, easy, Holden warned, but the other two men ignored him. That sounded like a threat, Murtry said. Oh, it really was. Amos replied with a grin. Holden realized both men had their hands below the table. Hey, now. I think maybe one of us is going to end bloody. Murtry said. About now. Amos replied with a shrug. I'm free now. We can just skip all the middle part. Murtry and Amos smiled at each other across the table for an endless moment, while Holden ran through contingencies in his mind. What if Amos gets shot? What if Murtry gets shot? What if I get shot? You fellas have a nice day, Murtry said, standing slowly. His hand was not on his gun. Keep the bottle. Thanks, Amos replied, pouring another drink. Murtry nodded at them, then walked out of the bar. Holden let out an exhalation that he'd been holding for what seemed like an hour. Yeah, I think we are in way over our heads here, he admitted. I'm gonna need to shoot that guy at some point, Amos said, then tossed back another shot. I wish you wouldn't. This is already looking like a train wreck and in addition to chewing up a few hundred colonists and scientists, which is bad enough, it will also be my fault when it all falls apart. Shooting him might help. I hope not, Holden said, but he was worried that Amos was right. Interlude The Investigator It reaches out, it reaches out. It reaches out, it reaches out. One hundred and thirteen times a second, nothing answers, and it reaches out. It feels no frustration, though parts of it do. It is not designed to incorporate consciousness or will, but to use whatever it finds. The minds within it are insisted, walled off. They are used when they are of use, as is everything, and it reaches out. It is not a plan, it is not even a desire, or it is only a desire without knowledge of that longing's object. It is a selective pressure pressed against chaos. It does not think of itself this way because it does not think, but the environment changes, a new branch of possibilities opens, and it forms the investigator and leans into the new crack. The new space. The minds within it interpret this differently, as a hand reaching up through graveyard soil, as finding a door in a room where no door had been before, as a breath of air to a drowning woman. It is not aware of these images, but awareness of them is part of it. The investigator puts pressure on the aboriginal, and the aboriginal takes action. The environment changes again. Patterns begin to match patterns, 
but there can be no recognition because it is not conscious to recognize. It would be aware of the aboriginal accelerating, of its slowing, the vectors shifting zero to one to a different zero in a different location, if it were aware, but it is not aware. It reaches out. Patterns match, and it reorients and reaches out. Cascades of implicit information bloom, and the conscious parts of it see a lotus opening forever, hear a shout that is made of other shouts, that are made of other shouts in a fractal constructed of sound, pray to God for a death that does not come. It reaches out, but the ways in which it reaches change. It improvises as it always has, the insect twitch, the spark closing the gap it reaches out. It touches something, and for a moment a part of it that can feel feels hope. It is unaware of hope. The reply does not come. It is not over. It will never be over. It reaches out and finds new things, old things. It flows into places that are comfortable for it to flow. There are responses, and the responses feed the impulses that caused them, and there are more responses. All automatic and empty and dead as it is. Nothing reaches back. It feels no disappointment. It does not shut down. It reaches out. It does not experience the wariness, but the wariness is part of it. It reaches out, rushing into the new possibility space, and something deep in it, wider than it should be, watches it reach. Doors and corners, it reaches out, it reaches out, it reaches out. Doors and corners. This could get ugly, kid. Chapter 12 Basia James Holden came too late. Along with everyone else in the colony, Basia watched the drive plume of the Rosinante light the sky of Illus. For him, maybe, it was already too late. He'd made the bombs that destroyed the RCE shuttle and killed the UN governor. He'd been there when Coop and the others murdered the RCE security team, and maybe there was no coming back from that. Maybe he was already a dead man, or a man destined for life in prison, the same thing, really. But looking up at the line of white fire in the sky, he couldn't help but feel a spark of hope. Jim Holden had saved the Ganymede children, too late for Katoa, but he'd saved the others. He'd brought down the evil corporation that had killed Basia's little boy. Neither Mao Kwiatkowski nor Protogen existed any more because of Holden. And while Basia had never met the man in person, he'd watched him on videocasts and read about him in newsfeeds. It created a strange sense of intimacy to watch the man who'd avenged Katoa on screen, talking and smiling. And that man was coming to Illus. Perhaps he could save Basia too. So when the bright line in the sky vanished, and Basia knew Holden and his crew were in orbit, he let himself feel a swell of hope, the first he'd felt in a long time. And when he heard the thunderclap of a descending shuttle, he ran outside just like all the other colonists, watching to see where it would land. The UN mediator is coming! They shouted to each other. The man who saved Earth, they meant. The man who saved Ganymede. The man who will save us. A small shuttle dropped out of the sky and settled on the hard-packed Earth to the south of First Landing, and half the town's population ran to meet it. Basia ran, too. The shuttle sat on five squat legs, ticking with heat. The town waited in silence, too excited to talk. Then a ramp lowered to the ground, and a squat earther with gray hair and a deeply lined face walked down it. It wasn't Holden. One of his crew, maybe? 
but the man was wearing armor with the RCE logo on it, and Holden was supposed to be an impartial mediator. The man stopped halfway down the ramp and smiled a humorless smile at them. Basia realized he was holding his breath, then realized everyone else was, too. Hello, the man said. My name is Adolphus Mertry. I'm chief of security for Royal Charter Energy. Was it another RCE ship they'd seen breaking into orbit? The man walked down the ramp, still smiling that predator's smile, and as one, the crowd backed away. Basia backed up with them. Because of the attack on the shuttle that claimed the lives of many RCE employees and UN officials, I am taking direct control of security on this world. If that sounds like martial law, that's because it is. Murtry whistled, and ten more people in security armor descended the ramp. They carried automatic weapons and slug-throwing sidearms. Not a non-lethal deterrent in sight. Please be aware, Murtry continued, that because of the attack on the first security team, no one proved they were attacked, someone shouted from the crowd. Coop, it was Coop, standing at the back with his arms crossed and a smug smile on his face. Because of that attack, Murtry continued, I've given my people shoot-first authorization. They may, if they feel threatened, utilize lethal force to defuse the threat. Carol pushed through the crowd to confront Murtry at the bottom of the ramp, and Coop followed her. You're not the government here, Carol said, anger making the tendons in her neck stand out. Her hands were in fists, but she kept them at her sides. You can't just land here with a bunch of guns and tell us you have the right to shoot us. This is our world. That's right, Coop yelled and turned to face the crowd, inviting them to join in. No, Murtry said, his smile not changing. It is not. The air was split with thunder as another ship dropped into the atmosphere and landed on the western side of town. Murtry barely glanced up at it. More troops dropping in, Basia thought. Murtry began walking toward town, his people trailing out behind him, and the crowd moving in a loose cloud around them. Carol kept talking, but her words had no effect. Murtry just smiled and nodded and didn't break stride. The ship that had landed on the other side of town blasted off on a column of white vapor and vanished from sight. The roar of its engines filled the world. When they reached the center of town, Basia saw Yasek hanging around at the edge of the crowd. He grabbed his son by the arm, pulling him harder than he intended, and the boy gave a frightened squeak. Papa? he said as Basia dragged him away. Am I in trouble? Yes! Basia shouted, then when he saw tears welling up in the boy's eyes, stopped and dropped to his knees next to him. No, no, son, you're not. But I need you to go home. But... Yasek started. No buts, boy. Basia gave him a gentle shove toward their house. Go home. Is that man going to kill us? Yasek asked. What man? Basia asked, but it was a delaying tactic. He knew what man. Even his little boy could smell the death coming off of Murtry and his people. No one's going to kill us. Go home. Basia watched Yasek walk home, waiting until he saw the boy go inside and close the door. Basia was just starting to walk back toward the crowd when the shot rang out. His first thought was, Yasek was right. They are killing us. Not us, though. Once he got back to the crowd, just Coop lying in the dust with a red hole where his eye should be, 
blood pooling under his head. And Holden, jaw clenched and eyes wide. Too late, Basia thought. Too late again. People with machine guns walked the streets of First Landing. Basia and Lucia sat on their tiny front porch and watched them pass by in the fading sunlight of early evening. A man and a woman, both in body armor with the red and blue RCE company logo on it. Both carrying automatic weapons. Both with hard expressions on their faces. I did this, Basia said. Lucia squeezed his hand. Drink your tea, Bas. Basia looked down at the cup of tea cooling on his lap. All the tea the little colony might ever have had come down on the shuttles with them. To waste such a luxury was unthinkable. He sipped at the lukewarm cup and didn't taste it. They'll kill me next. Maybe. Or put me in jail forever. Take me away from my family. You, Lucia said, took yourself away when you joined with those stupid, violent people who blew up the shuttle. You drove them out to the ruins when they killed the RCE people. You made every choice that took you to this place. I love you, Basia Merton. I love you till my chest aches. But you are a stupid, stupid man. And when they take you away from me, I will not. Forgive you for it. You're a harsh woman. I'm a doctor, Lucia said. I'm used to giving people bad news. Basia drank off the rest of his tea before it could finish getting cold. I could get some rope or chain from the dig site. Maybe hang a bench here. Then we could rock while we sit. That might be nice. Lucia said. The pair of RCE guards reached the end of the street and turned around to come back. With the sun about to dip below the horizon, their shadows were almost as long as the town itself. We've been focusing on lithium mining to get money, Basia continued. But we need to start thinking about our own energy needs. This is true. We can't have the barb bringing us power cells forever, and someday the ship will fly back to Polis to sell the ore, so we won't have her for a couple years. Also true, Lucia said. She swirled the last of her tea and stared up at the stars. I miss having Jupiter in the sky. It was beautiful, Basia agreed. I... Have to go meet with Kate and the others tonight, after it gets dark. Baz, Lucia started, then just stopped with a sad sigh. They'll want revenge for Coop. It will only make it worse. What? Lucia said. Does worse look like, I wonder? Basia sat quietly, thinking of the rocker he could build on their porch, of adding a bigger water heater for hot baths, of building a larger kitchen and dining area on the back of the house, of all the things he wouldn't get to do now. The guards were at the end of the town's long street, almost invisible in their dark armor and the fading light. Basia got up to leave. Can you stop them from killing anyone else? Lucia asked, as though she were asking if he wanted more tea. Yes, Basia replied. It felt like a lie. Then go. They met at Kate's house, Pete and Scotty and Ibrahim. Even Zadie came, her wife Amanda staying home to look after their boy and his infected eye. That wasn't a good sign. Of all of them, Zadie was the angriest, the one with the hottest head. Basia had worked with her on Ganymede, and more than once she'd shown up in the morning with a black eye or a busted lip 
from some bar fight she'd picked the night before. They were all upset, all standing on the ledge about to jump, but Zadie would be the hardest to talk off of it. They shot Coop, Kate said when Scotty, the last of them to arrive, finally came in. It wasn't a statement of fact. They'd all been there. They'd all seen it. No, it was the beginning of a justification. In cold blood, Zadie said, and punctuated it with a fist to her palm. We all saw it. Just shot him in the face in front of God and everyone. So I have a plan, Kate continued. The RCE people are holed up in... Who put you in charge? Zadie asked. Murtry did. Zadie narrowed her eyes, but let it drop. Basia fidgeted on one end of Kate's couch. It was a handmade frame covered with padding stripped from the ship and badly stitched remnants of the cloth they had the fabricator crank out once a month for clothing and other needs. Kate had made a small table out of the local wood analog to sit next to it. It wasn't quite level, and Bossia's glass of water was at a noticeable tilt. Pictures of Kate's family, two sisters who still lived back in the belt and their kids, hung on the walls. There was a pottery vase on the floor with sticks and branches in it that Bossia thought was meant as decoration, not kindling. It was too domestic a location for the kind of meeting they were having. It all felt unreal, that he and five people he knew were discussing the murder of a dozen corporate security guards in Kate's living room next to her vase full of sticks. Scotty was talking, telling them to wait. Not the voice of reason, the voice of fear. Pete was on his side, arguing against escalating. Kate and Zadie shouted them down. Ibrahim said nothing, just pulled on his bottom lip and frowned at the floor. I think we wait for Holden, Basia said when there was a pause in the conversation. Holden's been here a day. What are we waiting for? Kate asked, dripping angry sarcasm. He needs time to meet with us. Get the lay of the land, Basia said, the words sounding feeble even in his own ears. But he's the mediator, and he can talk directly to the OPA governing board and to the UN. His recommendations will have real weight. We need him on our side. The OPA? Zadie spat. The UN? What exactly are they going to do for us? Send a tersely worded letter? Murtry and his thugs are right there. Zadie stabbed her fingers at the wall, at the street beyond, at the guards with machine guns. How many of our people do they get to kill before we defend ourselves? We killed them first, Basia said, then regretted it immediately. Everyone started shouting, mostly at him. Basia stood up. He knew he was an imposing figure, stocky and thick-necked, bigger than anyone else in the room. He stepped forward, a physical challenge. He hoped his size would be enough. He was fairly certain Kate could beat him to death if she decided to. Shut up! They did. We have a chance here, he continued, quieting his voice with an effort. But it's so fragile. We killed the RCE people. I wasn't... Zadie started, but Basia hushed her with a gesture. They killed Coop. Right now they feel like they've made a point, so they won't kill anyone else unless we provoke them. So right now we are at a balance. If no one does anything to tip it one way or another, Holden can do what they sent him here to do. He can help us resolve this without more violence. Kate snorted and looked away, but Basia ignored her. I'm in this with you. I have just as much to lose as any of you. 
But we want this man on our side. He saw Murtry murder one of us. He's never seen us do anything. We have the advantage of seeming like the victims right now. Let's not change his mind on that. There was a long moment while Bossia stood in the middle of the room, panting with emotion, and no one spoke. Okay, Ibrahim said. He'd been a soldier once. The others respected him. When he finally spoke, it was with a tone of authority. Kate frowned, but said nothing. Okay? Okay, big man, Ibrahim said. We play it your way for now. Go talk to this Holden. Get him on our side. He's the one found your boy, Sasa. Use that. Basia felt a rush of anger and shame at the mention of Katoa, of using him as an in with Holden, but he pushed it down. Ibrahim was right. It would give Basia something to talk to Holden about and it would make him seem sympathetic. I'll talk to him tomorrow, Basia said, swallowing the sudden nausea he felt. It's on you now, big man, Ibrahim said. It sounded like a threat. Basia walked home in the pitch black of the illus night. He wished he'd thought to bring a light. He wished... He'd never blown up a shuttle full of people and helped Coop murder the RCE guards. He wished his wife wasn't angry with him and that she wasn't right. He wished that Katoa were still alive and that they all still lived in their home on Ganymede and that no one had ever come to Illus in the first place. He tripped on a rock and fell to his knee, skinning it. No way to fix the other things but at least he could have thought to bring a light. Lucia had left a light on in the house. Without it, Basia might have walked right past it without realizing. At least she wanted him to come home. She left lights on to make it happen. For the first time in a long time, Basia felt himself smile. A shadowy figure darted through the dim light around the house to the back door. Before he had time to think, Basia was at a dead run. The figure at the door cowered, smaller than him, and terrified. Felsia. Papa, you scared me. Oh, baby, I'm so sorry. I didn't see it was you. Just saw someone sneaking around the house and came running. Felsia smiled up at him, eyes damp and lip trembling, but being brave. Okay. Going in now. Felsia, Basia said, putting his hand against the door to hold it closed. Why are you sneaking up to the house in the middle of the night? I was out, walking. She looked away, not able to meet his eyes. Please, baby, tell me it was a boy. It was a boy, she said, still not looking at him. Felsia. I'm going up on the next shuttle, Papa, she said, looking him in the eye, finally. I'm going up. When James Holden gets them to let the Barbie Piccola go, I'm going with it. From Palace I can catch transport to Ceres. Mama is calling her old mentor at CUMA to get me an interview for the pre-med program at the Hadrian on Luna. Basia felt like someone had punched him in the solar plexus. The pain in his stomach kept him from breathing. I'm going, Papa. No, he said. You're not. Chapter 13 Elvi Elvi's grandfather had remarried late in life. His new husband had been a German man with a merry laugh a snow-white beard, and a cheerful cynicism about humanity. What she remembered best about Grandpa Raynard was how quick he was with an epigram or a quip. He had one for every occasion. She'd thought they made him sound worldly and wise, 
in part because she was so often unsure what exactly he meant by them. One thing he'd said was, once is never, twice is always. When the shuttle went down, she'd known, they'd all known, that someone had put the explosives there. But her experience of the Belter colonists beginning that same night had been so different that the knowledge and the emotional impact of it had become detached. Someone among the Belters had done a terrible thing, but that person was faceless, anonymous, unreal. Dr. Merton doing everything she could to save the wounded and soothe the injured was real. Her daughter, Falcia, who was at the farthest point humanity had ever been from Earth, and whose ambitions were drawing her back toward Luna, was real. Anson Cotler and his sister Connie, who'd helped Elvi set up her hut. Samish O, with his goofy half-smile, was real. Carol Chuiwi, Aaron Sanchez. They had all been so kind that Elvi had shelved the death of the governor as an outlier, something so rare it would never happen again. But the disappearance of Reeve and the security crew was twice, and the way Elvi saw the colony and the RCE scientists and her own little hut out on the edge of the plain was different now, because the threat of violence wasn't never anymore. It was always. Did you see anything else? Murtry asked. No, Elvi said. I don't think so. Dr. O'Coy, I know this has been unpleasant for you, the chief of security said. But I need you to try to remember if there was anything else you saw while you were out there. The person you saw coming back. Can you say if it was a man, a woman? That wasn't how memory worked, of course. Just willing herself to remember something, pushing herself, was much more likely to generate a false recollection and add bad data to the set than it was to haul up some telling detail she'd failed to mention. It seemed rude to explain that to Murtry, so Elvie only shook her head. I'm sorry, she said. It's all right, he said in a tone of voice that hinted strongly at his disappointment. If anything else occurs to you, please do bring it to me. I will. Are you feeling okay? I guess so. Why? The UN mediators asked to talk with you, too, Murtry said. You don't have to if you don't want, though. Just say the word and I'll tell him to go piss up a rope. No, I don't mind, she said. But she was thinking, James Holden wants to talk to me. Should I? I mean, is there anything I should particularly tell him? About the work, I mean. The truth was, she just wanted to get out of the security offices. The extended thirty-hour day of New Terra made it hard to feel exactly how long she'd been there. But she'd come to Reeve in darkness. She'd slept in one of the cells that night. She'd stayed there while Murtry and the security team came down and made the town safe. And now it was morning again. So two days, new Terra. Maybe three back on Earth. What exactly day meant wasn't intuitive anymore. Captain Holden needs to understand exactly how bad our situation here is, Murtry said. He came out here thinking there's two sides to this, so he's wanting to split some kind of difference. Anything you can do to help him understand why that's not the solution here, I would very much appreciate. Oh, she said. Yes, of course. Thank you, Murtry said. One thing, Murtry raised his eyebrows and tilted his head toward her. He didn't quite say, yes, ma'am, but it was physically implied. 
My research is still in my hut, she said. I have some studies that were in progress when I came to talk to... When I came in, is my hut off limits, or will I be able to get back to them? You'll go back, Murtry said. The one thing that is not going to happen here, Doctor, we're not giving back a goddamn centimeter of our ground. Whoever did this doesn't get to win. Thank you, Elvie said. Murtry's expression hardened for a moment. His eyes became flat in a way that Elvie associated with lab animals being sacrificed. He looked dead. You're welcome, he said. Walking down the street of the town, Elvie felt a pang of unease, but less so than she'd expected. The little siege she'd suffered in the security office, waiting for the relief team to come, had been a bleak and frightening time. But now familiar faces had joined the townsmen. Two women in RCE security riot armor walked down the street across from her, their assault rifles resting easily in their hands. Just seeing them there left Elvie feeling safer. And then Holden had also arrived. Certainly, things weren't where they needed to be, but they were getting closer. They were getting better. That would have to be enough for now. Another guard stood at the entrance to the general store, a rifle resting in his hands. Dr. O'Coy? he said, nodding her inside. Mr. Smith? she said. She'd been in the commissary building many times in the weeks since she'd landed on New Terra, apart from little intimate get-togethers in the research huts and the formal town meetings in the community hall, it was the only place to go unless she found religion. She could see, feel, at once how the presence of James Holden had changed the nature of the space. It had been a community place before, public in the same way a municipal park might be, without any commanding human presence. Now, a man sat at a table toward the back of the room just as if he were a townsman getting a bowl of rice and a beer, sitting there, leaning on his elbows and talking to Fayez, he commanded the space. He owned it. What had belonged to everyone was now the unquestioned domain of James Holden. Elvie's belly went a little tighter, and anxiety sped her breath. She had seen Holden on the news feeds and reports. At the beginning of the war between Mars and the Belt, he had been the most important man in the solar system, and the celebrity, while it had waxed and waned over the years, had never gone away. James Holden was an icon. For some, he was the symbol of the triumph of the single ship over governments and corporations. For others, he was an agent of chaos who started wars and threatened stability in the name of ideological purity. But whatever people thought he meant, there was no question that he was important. He was the man who'd saved Earth from the proto-molecule. He was the man who'd brought down Mao Kwakowski, who'd made the first contact with the alien artifact and opened the gates that led to a thousand different worlds. In person, he looked different than his image on the screen. His face was still broad, but not as much so. His skin had a warmth that even years in the sunless box of a ship couldn't erase. The dark brown hair had a dusting of gray at the temples, but his eyes were the same sapphire blue. As she watched, Holden rubbed a hand across his chin, nodding at something that Fayez was saying. It was an unconsciously masculine movement that left Elvie thinking of large animals. Lions, gorillas, bears. There was no sense of threat in it, only of power, and she was profoundly aware that the man she had seen only as an image on a data feed was exhaling the same molecules that she was breathing in. You okay? Elvie started. 
The man who'd asked was huge, pale, and muscular. His shaved head and thick belly made him look like a gigantic baby. He put a hand on her shoulder as if to steady her. Fine, she said, her inflection making it a question. You just looked a little weird there for a second. You sure you're feeling all right? I was supposed to meet with Captain Holden, she said, trying to pull herself back together. My name's Elvia Coy, and I'm with the RCE. I'm an exobiologist with RCE. Elvi! Fayez called, waving her over. She nodded to the pale man and walked over to the table where Fayez and Holden were sitting. James Holden's eyes were on her. This is Elvi, Fayez said. We've known each other since Upper University. How do you do? Elvi said, her voice sounding false and tinny in her ears. She cleared her throat. Pleased to meet you, Holden said, rising to his feet and extending a hand. Elvie shook it just as if she were meeting anyone else. She was proud of herself for that. Sit, Fayez said, pushing out a chair for her. I was just talking to the captain here about the resources problem. It's not an issue yet, Elvie said. But it will be. Holden sighed, clasping his fingers together. I'm still hopeful that we can negotiate something that's equitable for everyone involved. Elvie frowned and tilted her head. How would you do that? Holden lifted his eyebrows. Fayez leaned in toward her. We were talking about resources like lithium and money, he said, then turned toward Holden again. She was talking about water and nutrients, different contexts. Is there not enough water? Holden asked. There is, Elvie said, hoping that her blush didn't show. Of course, they were talking about lithium mines. She should have known that. I mean, there's enough water and nutrients, but that's sort of the problem. We're here in the middle of a totally foreign biosphere. Everything about the place is different from what we're used to dealing with. I mean, it looks like life here is genuinely bichiral. Really? Holden said. No one knows what that means, Selvi, Fayez said. Holden politely pretended not to have heard him. But the animals and insects here all look... Well, they don't look familiar, but they've got eyes and things. They're under the same selection pressures, Elvie said. Some things are just a good idea. Back on Earth, eyes evolved four or five different times. Powered flight at least three times. Most animals put the mouth near the sense organs. The degree of large-scale morphological similarities, given the underlying biochemical differences, is part of what makes this such an amazing research opportunity. The data I've been able to send back since we got here would be enough to fuel research for a generation, and I've barely scratched the surface. And the resources problem? Holden said. What are the resources you need? It's not the ones we need, Elvie said, waving her hands. It's the ones we are. From the perspective of the local environment, we're bubbles of water, ions, and high-energy molecules. We're not exactly the flavor that's around here, but it's only a matter of time before something figures out a way to exploit those. Like a virus? Holden asked. Viruses are a lot more like us than what we're seeing here, Elby said. Viruses have nucleic acids, RNA. They evolved with us. When something here figures out how to access us as resources, it's probably going to be more like mining. Holden's expression was dismayed. Mining, he echoed. We have an advantage for the time being, because we're an older biosphere. From what we can tell, 
things weren't really evolving here until sometime between one and a half and two billion years ago. We've got pretty strong evidence that we have a good billion-year head start on these guys, at least. And some of our strategies may work against them. If we can build antibodies against the proteins that the locals use, we might be able to fight them off like any other infection. Or we might not, Fayez said. Part of the reason I came out here, part of the reason I agreed to this, was that we were going to do it right, Elvis said, hearing the stress coming into her voice. We were going to get a sealed environment, a dome. We were going to survey the planet and learn from it and be responsible about how we treated it. The RCE sent scientists. They sent researchers. Do you know how many of us have sustainability and conservation certifications? Five-sixths. Five-sixths! Her voice was louder now than she'd meant it to be. Her gestures were wider, and there was a tremble of outrage in her words. Holden's unreal blue eyes were on her, and she could feel him listening like his attention could radiate. Intellectually, she knew what was happening. She was scared, and she was hurt, and she was guilty for having been the one to lead Reeve and the others into danger. She'd been able to ignore it all, but it was bubbling up. She was talking about the biology and the science, but what she meant was, Help me. It's all going wrong, and no one can help me. No one but you. Only when you got here, there was already a colony, Holden said. His voice was like warm flannel. And a colony made up of a bunch of people who have a lot of very good reasons to distrust corporations and governments. It looks calm here, L.D. said. It looks beautiful, and it is. And it's going to teach us things we never dreamed before. But we're doing it wrong. Fayez sighed. She's right, he said. I mean, I like talking about lithium and moral rights and legalities as much as the next guy. But Elvie's not wrong about how weird this place is when we start looking close enough. And it's got a lot of very dangerous edges that we're not paying any attention to, because we're, you know, killing each other. I hear what you're saying, Holden said. I'm going to need to look at it. The part where people are killing each other has to be my first focus. But I promise you both that I will put creating a closed, safe planetary dome on the list as soon as we've got the crisis under control, no matter who winds up being in control. Thank you, L.V. said. Most of the people here are good, Fayez said. The Belters? We've been here for months, and I swear most of these people aren't monsters. They're just poor bastards who thought starting over was a good idea. And Royal Charter is a very, very responsible corporation. Look at their history, and you won't find any more graft and corruption than an average PTA. They're really trying to do all this right. I know, Holden said. And I wish to hell that made it easier. Uh, Captain? The huge baby man said. Amos? There's another mess of legal crap just came through from the UN for you. Holden sighed. Am I supposed to read it? Don't see how they can make you, Amos said. Just thought you'd want to ignore it intentionally. Thank you. Sort of, Holden said, then turned back to them. I'm afraid I have to deal with bureaucracy for a while, but thank you both very much for coming. Please always feel free to come talk to me. Fayez stood, and Elvi followed half a second later. He shook each of their hands in turn, then retreated to a room in the back. Fayez walked out to the street with her. Hassan Smith and his rifle acknowledged them again as they passed by.
The sun glowed in the oxygen-blued sky. She knew it was a little too small, the spectrum of light from it a little slanted toward the orange, but it was familiar to her now. As right as thirty-hour days and her close, familiar hut, Fayez fell into step behind her. Heading back to your place? he asked. I should, she said. I haven't been out since I came to see Reeve. I'm sure all my data sets are finished. I probably have a bunch of angry messages from home. Yeah, probably, he said. So are you all right? You're the third person to ask me that today, L.V. said. Am I acting like there's something wrong with me? A little, Fayez said. You've got a right to being a little freaked out. I'm fine, Elvi said. Her hand still tingled a little where Holden had held it. She massaged her skin. At the end of the street, a belter girl was walking fast with her head down and her hands shoved deep in her pockets. Murtry and Chandra Way stood behind her, watching her suspiciously, their rifles in their hands. The wind coming off the plain lifted swirls of dust in the corners of the alleys. She wanted to go back to her hut, and she didn't. She wanted to go back up the well, onto the Edward Israel, and home again, and she wouldn't have left New Terra for all the money in the world. She remembered being very, very young and terribly upset about something, crying into her mother's shoulder that she wanted to go home, except that she wasn't home when she said it. That was what she wanted now. Don't do it, Fayez said. Don't do what? Fall in love with Holden. I don't know what you're talking about, she snapped. In that case, really don't do it, Fayez said with a cynical laugh and turned away. Chapter 14 Holden This is the first colonial arbitration meeting, Holden said, looking into the camera at the end of the table. My name is James Holden, representing the colony of New Terra. Elus, Carol said. Is Carol Chewiwi, colony administrator. Representing Royal Charter Energy is Chief of Security Adolphus Murtry. How exactly did that happen? Carol said. She stared at Murtry when she said it, her expression unreadable. Holden had a feeling Carol might be a very good poker player. Murtry smiled back at her. His face was equally unreadable. What's that? You know exactly what I mean. Carol snapped back. What are you doing here? You're hired security. You have no authority to— You put me in this room, Murtry said, when you killed the colonial governor. You remember that? Big explosion, crashing ship. It would have been hard to miss. Holden sighed and leaned back in his uncomfortable chair. He would let the two of them bicker a bit, release some of the venom they'd been storing up, then put his foot down and drag the discussions back on topic. RCE had offered to host the talks on their shuttle, or the Edward Israel, which would have been a lot more comfortable. But the colony had demanded that the meeting be held in first landing, which meant that, instead of contour-fitted, gel-filled chairs, they were sitting on whatever metal and plastic monstrosities the colony had lying around. The table was a sheet of epoxied carbon weave sitting on four metal legs, and the room they were using was barely large enough for the table and three chairs. A small shelf on one wall held a coffee pot that was hissing to itself and throwing a bitter, scorched smell into the air. Amos leaned against the room's one door, arms crossed, and with an expression so far beyond bored that he might actually have been asleep. 
endless accusations without evidence to bolster your own criminal claims of property rights, Carol was saying. Enough, Holden cut in. No more outbursts from either of you. I'm here at the request of the UN and OPA to broker some sort of agreement that can let RCE do the scientific work they're authorized to do and to keep the people already living on new terra. Illis. Illis from being harmed in the process. What about RCE employees? Murtry asked softly. Are they allowed to be harmed? No, Holden said. No, they are not. And so the mandate of these meetings has changed somewhat in light of recent events. I've only seen one person murdered since Alden arrived, and that one is on you, Carol said to Murtry. Madam Coordinator, Holden continued. There can be no further attacks on the RCE personnel. That's non-negotiable. We can't work out any sort of deal here unless everyone knows they're safe. But he... And you, Holden continued, pointing at Murtry, are a murderer, and one I intend to see prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. You have no... Once we return to a region of space, that actually has laws, Holden said. Which brings us to our first real discussion point. There are two competing claims regarding who has the right to administrate this expedition. We have to establish who makes the laws here. Murtry said nothing, but pulled a flexible display out of his coat and unrolled it on the table. It began slowly scrolling through the text of the UN Charter, giving RCE the scientific mission on New Terra. Carol snorted and pushed it back across the table at him. Yes, Holden said. RCE has a legal mandate from the UN placing them in control of this planet for the duration of their scientific mission. But we can't ignore the fact that people had been living on New Terra or Illus, for months before that charter was drafted. No, we can't, Carol said. So, we work out a compromise, Holden said, that allows RCE to do the work they came here to do, work which will, we hope, benefit everyone, including the colonists. This is a new world. There may be any number of dangers here we are unaware of, but this compromise must also allow for the possibility that the final decision of the home governments will be to grant Illus self-governing status. Amos snorted and his head jerked up, eyes wide open for a moment and then slowly narrowing back toward closed. Yeah, so, Holden said. That's the long, boring explanation. The short version is, I want RCE to move forward with doing the science, and I want the colonists to continue living their lives. And I don't want anyone getting killed. How do we make that happen? Murtry tilted his chair back on two legs and stretched out with his hands behind his head. Well, he said, you make a big point of telling me you plan to arrest me once we get back in civilized space. Yes, but by my count, the colonists, he sneered the word, have racked up about two dozen kills. And when we figure out who the perpetrators are, Holden said, they too will go back to Soul System to face trials. You're a detective now, Murtry snorted. Holden felt a weird chill run down his spine and looked around as if Miller might somehow have appeared. I think that the RCE security force, working in conjunction with Mr. Burton and myself, should continue its investigation of those crimes. Wit, Carol said, 
leaning forward suddenly in her chair. I won't let him. Investigation only. No trials can be held here, so no penalties can be meted out beyond protective detention, and that only with my express consent. Your express consent, Murtry said, speaking slowly like he was tasting the words. He smiled. If they'll let my team keep looking into the killings while we continue the negotiations here, permit us the right to protect ourselves and guarantee that anyone with strong evidence against them will be held against future trial, I'm fine with that. Of course he is, Carol said. Delay is all he needs to kill us. Holden frowned at that. Explain. We're not self-supporting yet, Carol said. We've got the barb up in orbit. She can bring us fuel cells charged from her drive, and she dropped us with all the food and seeds she had. But we can't really plant here yet. Soil has the wrong microorganisms in it. We desperately need food stores, soil enrichments, medical supplies. All of which RCE is happy to... Murtry started. But what we do have is the richest lithium vein any of us have ever seen, and with that ore, we can buy everything else we need. The Israel is keeping the Barber Pecola from sending down her shuttle to pick up the rest, and she's threatened to stop the Barb if she tries to leave orbit. The mineral rights on New Terra are not yours, Murtry said. Not until the U.N. says they are. Carol slapped the table with her palm. It was as loud as a gunshot in the small room. See? It's a waiting game. If he can just block us from taking our ore up to the ship long enough, then it won't matter who gets those rights. Even if they're awarded to us, we'll be so behind in moving the ore to the ship that we'll all starve to death before we ever get to market. So, Holden said, You're asking for the right to keep loading the ore onto the Barba Piccola while the rights are negotiated. Carol opened her mouth, closed it, and folded her arms. Yes, she said. Okay, Holden said with a nod. Sounds fair to me. No matter who winds up selling that ore, they'll need a transport to move it, and the barb is as good as anything else. Murtry shrugged. Fine. We'll allow the shuttle to land and begin transporting ore again. But mining operations come with some problems for me. Explain, Holden said again. They're using explosives. The same type of explosive that was used to bring down the shuttle and kill the governor. As long as these people have unrestricted access to it, my people are at risk. What's your solution? Holden asked. I want to control access. So you'll let us move the ore you won't let us mine, Carol said. Typical corporate doublespeak. I'm not saying that, Murtry said, patting the air in a calm-down gesture that struck Holden as intentionally patronizing. I'm saying we hold the explosives when not in use, and your mining crews sign them out when needed. That way nothing goes missing and shows up later as a pipe bomb. Carol, does that seem fair to you? Holden asked. It'll slow the process down, but it's not a deal-breaker, she replied. Okay, Holden said, standing up. We'll stop there for now. We'll meet again tomorrow to go over the UN proposal on colony administration and start hammering out details. We also need to talk about environmental controls. The OPA, Carol started. Yes, I have the recommendations from Fred Johnson as well, and those will be discussed. I'd like to transmit a revised plan to the UN and OPA by the end of the week, 
and get their feedback. Acceptable? There were nods from both Murtry and Carol. Great. I want you two with me when I present today's agreement at the town hall meeting tonight. Our first show of goodwill and solidarity. Murtry rose and walked past Carol without looking at her or shaking hands. Goodwill and solidarity, indeed. So, Amos said when Holden exited the town hall meeting that night. How'd it go? I must have done it right, Holden replied. Everyone's pissed. They walked along the dusty street together in companionable silence for a while. Amos finally said, Weird planet. Walking in open air at night with no moon is breaking my head. I hear you. My brain keeps trying to find Orion and the Big Dipper. What's weirder is that I keep finding them. That ain't them, Amos said. Oh, I know. But it's like my eyes are forcing those patterns on stars that aren't really lined up the right way to make them. There was another moment of silence, then Amos said, That's like one of them metaphors, right? It is now. Buy you a beer? Amos said when they reached the doors of the commissary. Later, maybe. I think I'm going to take a walk. The night air is nice here. Reminds me of Montana. Okay. See you when I see you. Try not to get shot or abducted or anything. I'll do my best. Holden walked slowly, the dirt of the planet puffing up around his ankles at every stride. The buildings glowed in the darkness, the only human habitation on the planet. The only civilization in the wilds. He put his back to it and kept on going. He was far enough outside of town that he could no longer see its dim lights when a faint blue glow appeared beside him. The glow was both there and not there. It lit the air around it while also illuminating nothing. Miller? Holden said without looking. Hey, kid. We need to talk. Holden finished for him. That's less funny the more you do it. The detective said, his hands in his pockets. Did you come out here to find me? I admit I'm a little flattered, considering your other problems. Other problems? Yeah, that shantytown full of future corpses you're trying to treat like grown-ups. No way that doesn't end bloody. Holden turned to look at Miller, frowning. Is that the former cop talking, or the creepy proto-molecule skin doll? I don't know. Both. Miller said, You want a shadow? You got to have light and something to get in its way. Can I borrow the cop for a minute? The gray, jowly man hoisted his eyebrows just the way he had in life. Are you asking me to use your brain to make these monkeys stop killing each other over rare dirt? No. Holden sighed. Just advice. Okay, sure. Murtry's a psycho who's finally in a spot where he can do the creepy shit he's been dreaming about doing all his life. I'd just have Amos shoot him. Carol and her gang of dirt farmers are only alive because they're too desperate to realize how stupid they are. They'll probably die of starvation and bacterial infections in a year. Eighteen months stops. Your pals of Asarala and Johnson have handed you the bloody knife, and you think it's because they trust you. You know what I hate about you? My hat? That too, Holden said. But mostly it's that I hate everything you say. But you're not always wrong. Miller nodded and stared up at the night sky. The frontier always outpaces the law, Holden said. 
true, Miller agreed. But this place was already a crime scene when you got here. Bombing the heavy shuttle was not that, Miller said. I mean all of it. All the places. I seem to spend a lot of time asking people to explain themselves lately. Miller laughed. You think somebody built those towers and structures and then just left? This whole planet is a murder scene. An empty apartment with warm food on the table and all the clothes still in the closets. This is some Croatoan shit. The North American colonists who... Except, Miller said, ignoring him. The people who vanished here... Not dumbass Europeans in way over their heads. The things that lived here modified planets like we remodel a kitchen. They had a defense network in orbit that could have vaporized Ceres if it wandered too close. Wait, what defense network? Miller ignored him. An empty apartment, a missing family, that's creepy. But this is like finding a military base with no one on it. Fighters and tanks idling on the runway with no drivers. This is bad, Juju. Something wrong happened here. What you should do is tell everyone to leave. Yeah, Holden said. Sure, I'll get right on that. This argument about who gets to live here... Really needed a third party both sides could hate. No one lives here. Miller said, But we're sure as shit going to play with the corpses. What the hell is that supposed to mean? Miller tipped his hat back, looking up at the stars. I never stopped looking for her. Julie? Even when she was dead. Even when I'd seen her body, I never stopped. True. Still creepy, but true. This is like that, too. I don't like it, but unless something happens, we're going to keep reaching and reaching and reaching until we find what did all this. And then what? And then we'll have found it, he said. A man Holden didn't recognize was waiting for him at the edge of town. Belter tall, stocky, and thick-necked. Big, meaty hands he was rubbing together nervously. Holden consciously forced himself not to drop his hand to the butt of his gun. Thought you got lost out there, the man said. Nope, all good. Holden held out his right hand. Jim Holden. Have we met? Basia. Basia Merton. From Ganymede. Yeah, all of you are from Ganymede, right? Pretty much. Holden waited for the man to speak. Basia stared back, wringing his hands again. So, Holden finally said, Mr. Merton, how can I help you? You found my son. Back, back there. You found Katoa, Basia said. It took Holden a moment to make the connection. The little boy on Ganymede, your Prax's friend. Basia nodded, his head moving too fast, like a nervous bird. We'd left. Me and my wife and my two other kids. We got a chance to get out on the Barbapicola, and I thought Katoa was dead. He was sick, you know. Same thing Prax's daughter had. No immune system. Yeah. Only he wasn't dead when we left. He was still alive in that lab where you found him. I left my son behind. Maybe, Holden said. There's no way to know that. I know that. I know it. But I brought my family here so I could keep them safe. Holden nodded. He didn't say, This is an alien world filled with dangers you couldn't possibly anticipate. 
on top of which you didn't actually own it, and you came here to be safe? It didn't seem helpful. No one can make us leave. The man finished. Well, no one can make us leave, Basia repeated. You should remember that. Holden nodded again, and after a moment, Basia turned and walked away. If that's not a member of the Resistance, he at least knows who they are, he thought. Someone to keep an eye on. His hand terminal chimed an incoming connection request at him. Jim? Naomi said. There was a nervous edge to her voice. Here. Something's happening down there. Massive energy spike in your location, and, uh... Um... Movement. Chapter 15 Havelock Slowly, New Terra was taking on a sense of familiarity. The planet's one big continent and long strings of islands turned under the Edward Israel every ninety-eight minutes, orbital period and the rotation of the planet conspiring to make a slightly different image every time Havelock looked. The features of the planet had started developing names for him, even though they would never be the ones that the official records showed. The largest southern island was Big Manhattan, because the outline reminded him of the North American island. The Dog's Head Islands were scattered in the middle of the planet's one enormous ocean, and looked like a collie's face if he squinted. What he thought of as the worm fields were actually a massive network of rivers on the big continent, any one of them longer than the Amazon or the Nile. In the north was Crescent City, a massive network of alien ruins that sort of looked like a cartoon moon. And there, in the flat beige sweep of what he thought of as the plate, was the black dot of first landing like the first lesion of a rash. It was tiny, but when the ship passed over it at night, it was the only spot of light. There were more places and ecosystems down there, more discoveries to make and resources to use, than there ever had been on Earth. It seemed bizarre that they were fighting and dying over that one tiny piece of high desert, and it also seemed inevitable. Murtry looked out from the display, listening to Havelock's report. Gravity changed the shape of his face, pulling down at his cheeks and eyes. It actually looked pretty good on him. Some people just belonged down a well. We had one incident with Pierce and Gillett. Those are the two in marine biology? Gillett is... Pierce is actually a soil guy. It didn't amount to anything more than a little domestic spat, but, well, tempers are fraying. All these folks came out here to work, and instead, they're stuck here. We're doing sensor sweeps and dropping the occasional high atmo probe. But it's like giving starving people a cracker when they can smell the buffet. It's starting to come out at the seams a little. That makes sense, Murtry said plus which they hate Null G. The autodoc's been pumping out anti-nausea drugs like there's no tomorrow. I'm surprised we aren't just putting that shit in the water at this point. Murtry's smile was perfunctory. Havelock wanted to float the idea of a second colony, maybe something in the temperate zone near a river and a beach, the kind of place someone might, for example, string up a hammock. It would let the expedition's crew get working, and the problems with the squatters could work themselves out without putting anyone else in harm's way. The words hovered at the back of Havelock's throat, but he didn't say them out loud. He already knew the arguments against it. You treated a tumor when it was small, before it spread. He could even hear it in his boss's voice. Havelock cracked his knuckles. The shuttle? Murtry asked. Havelock looked over his shoulder 
even though he knew the office was empty apart from him. When he spoke, his voice was quieter. I got some pushback because it meant having the supply schedule, but people got over it. I thought of having the hold stacked with high-density ceramics for shrapnel, and putting in a few pallets of the geology survey's shaped charges, but I don't have anything that's going to make a bigger explosion than the shuttle's reactor would. I've taken out all the safety overrides the way you asked, though, physical and software. Honestly, it's a little scary going on it anymore, just knowing that it could go off. And the controls? The standard protocols are all stripped out. You can fly it, or I can. Anyone else is talking to a brick. Good man. Captain Marwick's not happy about it. He'll cope, Murtry said. Better to have it and not need it, than need it and not have it. And we have the ship's drive, Havelock said. If we pointed the Israel's ass at the Barber Piccola and fired it up, we could slag it. Right range, we could take out the Rosinante, too, Murtry said. Except that they could say the same, and they've got missiles. Now we're just getting ready for contingencies. Which brings me to the point. I've got the solution to one of your problems. Sir? All those bored scientists? We've lost a lot of the security team, and we're in a more hostile environment than we'd expected. I need you to do some cross-training. You mean, hire them into security? Nothing official, Murtry said. But if we had a dozen people who were familiar with the riot gear and had some practice in low G, it wouldn't hurt my feelings. Havelock nodded. A militia, then. I establish that we're in de facto control of first landing. Holden thinks he's some kind of fucking Solomon. I'm fine letting him go with it for now, but when the time comes, we may need to put boots on the ground here. Or on the Barber Piccola. I'm happy if we don't, but I want the option. Can you do that? Let me look into it, Havelock said. I'm pretty sure it would mean bending corporate policy. The Home Office is pretty touchy about liability. They sent us to the ass end of nowhere and let a bunch of squatters take their best shot at us, Murtry said. I don't particularly care what they think. It doesn't need to be official. Make it a club. Just a few folks enjoying a shared hobby for low-G tactics. Fabricate them a few paint guns. Just make sure they're ready. In case we need them. Right. Murtry said with his dragging, full-gravity smile. In case. Technically, Havelock could have spent the time in the main security office, strapped into Murtry's couch and using his desk. Instead, he tended to stick to his own familiar place beside the brig. He told himself it was because the system was already customized with his preferences and access codes but he also knew it was more than that. Murtry had a way of claiming space, even if he wasn't occupying it, and Havelock wouldn't have been comfortable. So when the second shift ended, the chief of the engineering work group came to him at the brig. Chief Engineer Matu Konin was a thick man with short, bottle-brush white hair and a birthmark on his neck that he'd never bothered to have removed. He floated in the air by Havelock's couch, arms folded across his chest, and legs crossed at the ankles, like a dour, angry ballet dancer. Thank you for coming by, Havelock said. There trouble? Conan snapped. No, Havelock said, his voice automatically taking on the gruff tone he used when he was on duty. I wanted to ask you about putting together a team, a dozen people for small group tactics exercises. The chief engineer's brows furrowed and the lines around his mouth deepened. Havelock stared him down. 
He'd spent too many years as a cop on too many belter stations to be intimidated by a scowl. Small group tactics? Nalgi exercises, Havelock said. With the riot gear, just to keep mind and body in condition. Conan lifted his chin, his gaze still fixed on Havelock. It was the kind of thing a belter never did. Havelock didn't know why the gesture so clearly belonged to someone who'd lived planetside, but it did. He found it reassuring. You're talking about military action? Are we expecting something? Havelock shrugged against the couch restraints. The couch shifted a few millimeters on its gimbals. I want the option, he said, not realizing he was quoting Murtry until he'd already done it. Sure, then. I can find another eleven people. When do you want us? How long will it take? Conan tapped his hand terminal with two fingertips. I can call them right now. Havelock smiled. We'll meet in the shuttle bay at 0700. I'll go over the equipment. Then an hour drilling every day before shift for the foreseeable future. I'll put it on the schedule. They nodded to each other, and the chief engineer put out his foot, pressing it against the face of one of the cells to launch himself to the ladder. Havelock felt something uneasy shift in his mind. He was forgetting something, something important. When it came to him, he grunted. Chief! The man looked over from the ladder. The plane of his body was orthogonal to the desk, and Havelock's sense of balance shifted as his brain made one of its occasional panicked flailing attempts to determine up from down. He closed his eyes as a wave of nausea passed over him. Yes? When you pick out your team, Havelock said between clenched teeth. No belters. For the first time, Conan smiled. It seemed genuine. No shit, he said. As the acting head of security, he was expected to eat in the officer's mess. It was one of those small gestures that gave the ship a sense of continuity, of rules and customs being followed. And there were some benefits for him. The lines were shorter, alcohol was available, and the wall screen was usually set to something interesting. Right now, a UN official in an uncomfortable-looking gray suit was folding his hands on a wide, glassy desk. The camera operator was framing it to be seen on hand terminals, and so the man's face was so large on the wall that Havelock could see his pores and the streaks where the technicians on Earth had dabbed on makeup. We are at the beginning of a new golden age he said. The scale of this is immense. Everything we have done, from the first stone tools to the domes on Ganymede, we have done in essence with the resources of one planet, Earth. Yes, the need for minerals and rare Earths took us to Mars and Luna and the Belt, and the need for infrastructure made the Jovian system much more than we had imagined. But we are looking at an expansion that is not one or two, but three orders of magnitude more than we have had in the history of our species. Havelock peeled back the foil from the top of his meal. The beef and peppers had been designed for null G, hard nuggets of protein and vegetable that resisted breaking apart in the air, but turned soft and pleasant in his mouth. It wasn't as sanitary as tubes of goo, but it was better eating. He popped the first cube into his mouth. It sponged up his saliva, clinging to his tongue. The camera on Earth flickered to a young, serious-faced woman. But the designers of the protomolecule, she said. The species who sent it here on Phoebe in the first place? It has been billions of years since that happened, the man in the suit said. 
none of our probes have found any signs of advanced life still functioning. We have seen what appear to be ruins. We have seen what appear to be living biospheres. Honestly, there are mornings it takes my breath away. Havelock sipped at the bulb of water, and the food bloomed into a rich mouthful, almost like it had been cooked in a normal kitchen instead of an industrial processor. So what's the catch? The woman said. The catch is that the first thing we did once we got here was let a bunch of Belter terrorists claim squatting rights and start shooting at us, Havelock thought as he plucked another cube from the pack. On the screen, the UN man unfolded his hands. We are processing a bit over 4,000 applications already for the rights to explore and develop these systems. We have to do this carefully, if we are to get things done right. And it does not help that the OPA has used this to make what is essentially a power grab. Bloody belters, a voice said. Havelock turned to see Captain Marwick floating in the air behind him. The man's close-cropped red hair and beard had more gray in them than when they'd left Earth. Havelock nodded. Do you mind if I join you, Mr. Havelock? Not at all, Havelock said, blinking back surprise. The captain pulled himself to the table and strapped into a crash couch. Behind him, the wall screen shifted from the UN man to the woman interviewing him, but Havelock only registered the change as shifts of lighting and background. His attention was on Marwick. How have things been going on the surface? The captain asked, cracking open the box containing his own dinner. He made the words seem like nothing more weighty than polite conversation. Between other people, it probably would have been. You've seen the reports, Havelock said. Ah, reports, though. Written for posterity and the judge as often as not. Still, I was a bit surprised to see that our mutual friend, Mr. Murtry, had taken quite such a firm hand just when the mediator arrived. Situation called for it, Havelock said. We've lost a lot of good people down there by being restrained and patient. Marwick made a humming sound that could have meant anything and ate a bite of his meal. His gaze fixed somewhere over Havelock's left shoulder. And of course we're in a position of relative power here, aren't we? Marwick said. I hope our friend on the ground is keeping in mind that won't always be the case. I'm not sure I know what you mean. Well, I'm not, strictly speaking, a part of the expeditionary force, am I? The Israel is my domain. I use my rank as captain to make the demands and requests the Home Office prefers me to, though in truth I'm just the lorry driver. But I'll be driving my lorry back through the gate at some point, and Fred Johnson and his well-armed base will be waiting on the other side of it. I'd rather he not think of me first and foremost as a target. Havelock chewed slowly frowning. A dull anger tightened his jaw. We're the ones who followed the rules here. We came with science teams and a hard dome. We hired them to build our landing platform, and they killed us. We're the good guys here. And the moral high ground is a lovely place, Marwick said, as if he were agreeing. It won't stop a missile, though. It won't alter the trajectory of a Gauss round. What our mutual friend does planetside has consequences that go a long way out from here. And there are those among us, myself included, who'd like to go home one day. Marwick took another bite of his dinner, smiled ruefully, and nodded as if Havelock had said something. He undid the crash couch straps. Keeps body and soul together, these little boxes, but they don't really satisfy, do they? 
Give my left nut for a real steak. Well, it was a pleasure, Mr. Havelock, as always. Havelock nodded, but the anger in his chest rode the ragged edge between annoyance and rage. He knew that it was at least in part because that was the reaction Murtry would have had in his place. But knowing that didn't change the emotion. His hand terminal chimed. Chief Engineer Conan had sent a message. He tapped it open. We've got a full team. One of the boys is fabbing up a little logo for the club. Just something to keep morale up. Havelock considered the image. It was a stylized male form, squat and featureless, holding up a fist larger than its head. It was a cartoon of the earther body type, and of violence. Havelock looked at it for a long time before he answered back. Looks great. Make sure you get one for me. Chapter 16 Elvi What do you mean, movement? Elvi asked. After we saw the power spike, Holden said, The Rosinante did a sweep of the location. Several of them, actually. He held out his hand terminal, and Elvi took it. She tried to look serious, not to seem impressed. She was a scientist, for God's sake, facing a serious question, not a girl who'd get on her family's shared feed and burble about how James Holden had been in her hut. She flipped the images back and forth. Human brains were wired to see movement, and so the shifting shadows were easy to spot when she went quickly. Something's moving, she agreed. Can we see what it is? Not a lot of imaging satellites up there yet, Holden said. The Rossi's built for ship-to-ship -ship combat more than ground visualization. Anywhere in the solar system, it wouldn't have been like this. There were so many cameras of such exquisite sensitivity, almost nothing could happen in the vast emptiness inside the orbit of Neptune that couldn't be seen if someone wanted to look for it. It was another reminder of how far from home they were, and how many axioms of daily life didn't apply here. What does the Israel see? she asked. Nothing that's a lot better, Holden said. That's why we're going out. It's right at the range of the vehicles. It's going to take the better part of the day to get out there. Why? she asked. I mean... I see it's decently large, but there are likely to be any number of large organisms in the ocean, and colder environments. Organisms don't make power spikes, Holden said. All sorts of things are moving on this planet, all the time. This just started. Elvi touched the image, expanding it until the shadows blurred. You're right. We should check it out, she said. Let me get my instruments. An hour later, she was in the back of an open loader, Fayez at her side. Holden sat in front of them in the passenger's seat while Chandra Way drove. A vicious-looking rifle jounced at Way's side, in easy reach if violence came on them unexpectedly. The loader's engines whined, and the wheels ground against the stones of the wind-paved desert. Why didn't Sudyam come? Elvi asked, shouting to be heard over the loader and the wind. Fayez leaned close to her shoulder. Way thought it would be good to have someone on the Exobio workgroup still alive, if this went poorly. Elvi felt her eyes go wide as she glanced at the woman in the driver's seat. Really? She phrased it more gently. Fayez said. There was no demarcation of the border, no fence or road to show that they had left first landing. The stone and dirt hills rose and fell, organisms like grass or fungus clinging to the land and being crushed under the loader's wheels. Slowly, 
the ruins that had become Elvie's landmark on New Terra thinned and shrank and fell out of view. She leaned her head against the loader's roll bar, letting the vibrations of the land translate themselves through her skull. Way looked over her shoulder, and Elvie smiled at her. The memories of a hundred field excursions in graduate school left her body expecting beer and marijuana, and the anxiety of the actual errand tugged at her. Every day for weeks, she had found some new organism or fact that humanity had never seen before, and now she was going to something possibly even more alien. No one had said the word protomolecule, but the implication was thick as cement. Animals didn't make a power surge. The aliens did. In the wide, bright sky above them, high-altitude winds pulled a huge green and pink cloud into thin streamers. The speculation on Luna was that the strange cloud coloration meant an organism was present in them, something that packed its own minerals up into the sky and used the vapor the way salmon used spawning pools. It was only a hypothesis. The truth could be a thousand times stranger. Or it could be utterly mundane. Elvie watched the bright fleece of cloud stretch and the sun track a little too slowly past it. Faez was typing furiously on his hand terminal. Way drove with the focus and intensity that seemed to be her signature ever since she'd come to the surface, which meant ever since Reeve and the others had gone missing. Elvie wondered what it meant that she could go out into the absolute unknown, tracking across a planet with no idea what the local dangers might be, and it was thoughts of the people back in First Landing that frightened her. New Terra was supposed to be dangerous and wild and unknown. It was only living up to expectations. The dangers that the people posed were worse because she hadn't seen it coming, and so she was afraid she wouldn't next time either. She wasn't aware of drifting into a doze until Fayez put his hand on her shoulder and shook her gently back to herself. He pointed up. A bright spot lit the blue of the sky like Venus seen from Earth. It grew slowly brighter as it tracked west. A thin, white contrail formed behind it, and the only perfectly straight line in the organically twisting sky. A shuttle, Elvie frowned. Were we expecting the shuttle? she asked. That's not ours, Fayez said. That's the Barba Picolas, the mining operations underway again. Elvie shook her head. It was all one stupid, short-sighted mistake after another, strung together so that each one seemed inevitable. The colony would sell the ore, get lawyers, make deals. The containment dome would never be set up. What should have been clean, solid biology would turn into a salvage job of correcting for this and discarding the impurities that. Baez seemed to know what she was thinking. No research protocol survives contact with the subject population, he said. That's not just this. It's everything. The sun had dipped to half a hand above the horizon when the loader topped another rise like a thousand before it. Way braked and shut off the engines. Faez stood up in his seat, his elbows resting on the roll bar. Holden said something obscene under his breath. Well, Faez said, his voice hushed. At least it wasn't hard to find. The thing hunkered down in the depression between two hills. Its vast carapace was the nacreous white that she'd seen in the walls of the ruins, but there was nothing architectural about this. It had an insectile form, long, articulated limbs like legs pressing weakly out into the hard pack. Two larger appendages emerged from its back, one gray and splintered, 
the exoskeleton empty of anything but dust, the other swinging awkwardly. Five black circles on its abdomen recalled eyes, but didn't shift to focus on them. At least, not as far as Elvie could tell. What is it? Wei asked. Elvie noticed that the rifle had made its way to the woman's hands. She hadn't seen that happen. I don't know, Elvie said. I haven't seen anything like it before. I have, Holden said. It's one of their machines. Whatever designed the proto-molecule had things like this on the station between the rings. They were smaller, though. I saw one of them kill someone. You're telling me, Wei said, her voice even and calm, that thing's a couple billion years old? That would be my guess, Holden said. Fayez whistled low. That is not dead which can eternal lie, or, you know, whatever. The monster from the desert shifted drunkenly, its legs awkward. Its one functioning arm twisted toward them, then collapsed to the ground. Its body shifted and trembled as it tried to lift it again. Look, Elvie said. Back there. All along the contour line at the bottom of the valley, between hills, the stones had been scraped clean. None of the quasi-fungal grasses remained. No lizards or birds. It was like a vast hand had come down with a sponge and wiped the landscape clean. Now that she knew to look, she saw the thing's legs were pulling the native life up and feeding into tiny, chitinous orifices along its underbelly. It's eating, she said. On the station, Holden said. Soldiers tried to kill one with a grenade. The machines killed the man who threw it and used his body. Reprocessed it right there. Turned him into paste and used him to repair the damage. That makes sense, Elvie said. The protomolecule repurposed biological systems during the Eros event as well. Glad you approve, Dr. Okoy, Wei said dryly. In your scientific opinion, could this pose a threat to the expedition? Sure, maybe, Elvie said, and Holden made a gurgling sound in the back of his throat. The thing lurched forward, lost its footing, and scrambled back. It was like watching a broken toy or a car-struck dog that hadn't quite died yet. It was fascinating and frightening, and she couldn't look away. I think we need to leave now, Holden said, fear making the words come fast. Like now now, not later now. Isn't what we came here for, Wei said, raising the rifle to her shoulder. What are you doing? Holden shouted. Did you not hear me about the putty making? In reply, Way opened fire. Tracer rounds drew bright red lines through the air, and small explosions lit every place they struck. The thing staggered back, swinging its arm, but Way pulled a fresh clip from her pocket when the first one went dry and resumed firing. The thing tried to push in toward Way and then to move away from her. A green-gray liquid poured from the wounds in its side, the report of the rifle was deafening. The thing lurched one last time and let out a high, teeth-clenching keen. It collapsed, legs splayed, in the pool of liquid. Wei let the gun's barrel drift down until it pointed at the ground. When she looked at Holden, her eyes were hard. Holden's hands were on the loader's dash, the knuckles white. His face was gray. I hope that's not a problem, sir, Wei said. You are out of your fucking mind, Holden said, his voice high and tight. That thing could have killed you. Yes, sir, Wei said. That's why I killed it. Did you? Holden said, his voice continuing to climb. Are you sure? What if it's not all the way dead? Can we burn it or something? 
Wei smiled. Yes, she said. Yes, we can. An hour later, the great ruddy disk of the sun touched the horizon. The flames danced around the thing's corpse, rising up higher than a bonfire. Greasy black smoke spiraled up toward the clouds, and the whole world seemed to reek of accelerants. Wei had taken a small tent from the loader's storage, and Fayez had set it up. Elvi stood, the heat of the sun and the fire pressing against her face. The night was going to be long. They all were here. You all right? Fayez asked. I'm fine. I wish I'd gotten some samples, though. In the heart of the fire, the thing glowed. Its shell was white-hot, and thin cracks had started to show, radiating out from its joints. It was beautiful in its way, and she was sorry to see it destroyed and relieved in almost equal measures. It wasn't an emotional mixture she was used to. Wei insisted on setting up watches through the night, and Holden volunteered to take the first of them. He seemed uneasy in a way that Elvie wouldn't have thought James Holden, captain of the Rosinante, was capable of. Vulnerable. Elvie lay in the tent, her head poking out. Fayez snored softly beside her. Wei, curled in the back of the loader with a thin blanket, was silent as a stone. Elvie watched Holden and listened while he hummed to himself, a lonely human sound in the vast inhuman planet. Sleep didn't come. After two hours, she gave up, rose from her uncomfortable bed, and went to sit at the man's side. In a world without moonlight, there was only the orange glow of the alien's dying pyre and a thin silver highlight of stars. It reduced him to a few lines and a sense of mass and warmth. I couldn't sleep, she said. I don't think I will either, he said. I hate the way those things scare me. I'm surprised to hear you say that. You were expecting me to enjoy it? She could hear the smile. Far above them, a falling star streaked across the sky, bright and then gone. I'm not used to hearing men admit to having emotions, she said. You were on Eros when the outbreak came, weren't you? I'd think after that, nothing would frighten you. Doesn't work that way. After Eros, everything frightened me. I'm still trying to calm down. He chuckled. When he spoke again, his voice had sobered. Do you think that thing was a machine, or was that an animal? I don't think that's a distinction they would have made. You mean the designers? Who the hell knows how they would have seen anything? Oh, we can say some things, Elvie said. What they cared about was in what they designed, and still is in a way. We know that they respected the power of self-replicators and knew how to harness it. She felt him turn toward her more than saw it. She was profoundly aware of being a woman in a dark wilderness with a man beside her. It made the vast night seem intimate. How do we know that? he asked. Where they sent the proto-molecule, she said. The universe has some things that are fairly consistent. The elements are the same. Carbon is always carbon. Nitrogen's always nitrogen. They make the same bonds and can build the same structures. All the systems we've surveyed have at least one planet that has the possibility of generating organic replicators. Meaning things with DNA? or things that act like DNA. They sent out bridge builders to use those basic biological replicators, whatever their form. They can take a biosphere and turn it into a massively networked factory. It's probably how they spread. Target the places that can be hijacked into making the things that let you get there. Also, they really built structures to last. They seem to have taken the long view on 
galactic colonizing. She leaned back, letting her hand rest on the front of the loader, not reaching out to him, but putting her fingers where, in the darkness, he might accidentally brush against them. To the north, some small animal called, its voice high and chirping. It was there for billions of years, Holden said, and we killed it with a rifle and some mineral spirits. In our defense, it wasn't looking healthy, but yes, it wasn't expecting anything as advanced or aggressive as we are. They built structures that lasted billions of years. The ruins, that thing, the rings, all of it. They sound like gods sometimes. Angry, spiteful gods, but still. No, Elvie said. Just organisms that we don't understand. And with their own constraints. They were specialized for their ecosystem just like we are. Thirteen hundred worlds seems a lot when you've only ever had the one. But it's a raindrop in the ocean compared with what's out there, just in our galaxy. They had more. Elvie made a small inquiring sound. They had more, Holden said. But something attacked them, and they tried to stop it. They burned up entire solar systems, a lot of them. Then, when that didn't work, they shut down the whole network, quarantined themselves, and died anyway. I didn't know that. I saw it, sort of. A guy I used to know is kind of looking into it. I'd like to talk to him, she said. Yeah, he's less helpful than you'd expect. Way shifted in her sleep. Elvie yawned, though she wasn't particularly tired. Why did it wake up? He said, nodding toward the alien corpse. Was it because of us? Did it know we were here? Maybe, she said. Or maybe they cycle up and down every so often. We've only seen one. There may be a lot of these, and seeing them will be common. There may be a few, and it will be rare. There could only have been one. Not enough data yet. I guess not. Still, I wish I knew what was going to happen. I don't. So much of my life has been better than what I imagined. I've come to enjoy being surprised. When I was doing my undergraduate at Kano, I was imagining I'd be doing environmental assays on Europa for my whole career. Instead, this. Kano? I spent a lot of time in the West African Shared Interest Zone when I was growing up, northern Nigeria. I went back there for university. Really? Holden said, his voice bright. One of my fathers had family in Nigeria. One of them? I have several, he said. Extended parental group. Oh, I've heard of those. Makes for a big nuclear family, and a huge extended one. We might be cousins. I hope not, Elvie said, laughing, and then wished she could suck the words back. The silence was terrible. She couldn't see his face clearly, but she could imagine it. The surprise, the embarrassment. She pulled her hand back and put it in her lap. I, he said. If you'd like, I'll take the rest of the watch, Elvie said. The lightness in her voice sounded forced, even to herself. I don't think I'll be sleeping much tonight anyway. That would be great, Holden said. Thank you. Just be careful of Fayez. He steals the blankets. James Holden slid off the loader. She heard his footsteps tracking back to the tent, heard the rustle of the plastic as he bedded down. She hunched over, arms around her belly. The thing from the desert was nothing more than embers, glowing dull orange in the night, but illuminating nothing. The humiliation sat with her, bright and painful as a paper cut.
Stupid, she said softly. Stupid, stupid, stupid. The alien darkness didn't disagree. Chapter 17 Bossia Coop and Kate had been old-school OPA, back when the Outer Planets Alliance was just a shared opinion with guns. They'd come up the ranks together when even wearing the OPA's split circle on your sleeve was an arrestable offense. They'd learned their craft sneaking past armed Earth-Mars coalition checkpoints, planting bombs, smuggling guns, and generally acting like the terrorists the inner planets had accused them of being. The only reason they hadn't both gone to prison camps forever was because, by some standards, the OPA had won. After Eros, the inner planets had begun treating the OPA like an actual government, and many of the OPA warriors had received the de facto amnesty that non-enforcement brought. Kate was just a minor now, like the rest of them, but she could use words like tactical advantage and actually sound like she knew what she was talking about. The terrain and numerical superiority are our tactical advantages, Kate said to the small group assembled in her house. But we're outgunned, no way around that. We have maybe a dozen firearms total. We can still get explosives, but the deal Holden struck with RCE makes it much riskier. Fucking Holden, Zadie said. We'll deal with him soon enough, Kate replied. Her audience was made up of the usual gang. Zadie's son had taken a turn for the worse with his eye infection, and her wife was staying home with him full-time now. Basia had the impression that Zadie was looking for someone to punish for her family's pain. Pete, Scotty, and Ibrahim were there as well, the veterans of their one skirmish with the RCE security people. It gave them a degree of status in the group that they'd latched onto. But there were a few new people as well. Other members of the colony who might have been on the fence before about the best way to deal with RCE, but had been pushed into the revolutionary camp by Murtry's brutal tactics. By the martyring of Coop. How? Scotty asked. How do we deal with Holden? I think we remove all of our problems in one multi-front operation, Kate said. Murtry and his team, Holden and his thug, everyone at once. The key to this kind of war is money. Make us too expensive to occupy. Ibrahim nodded. He'd been OPA, too. Exactly. That's how we got the inners off our asses in the belt. If it's not economically viable to occupy us, they won't. Every one of them that goes home in a body bag is one more nail in the corporate coffin. Kate punched one large fist into her other hand to punctuate. I don't follow. How does killing them help us with that? Basia asked. He'd agreed to come in the hope he might be able to help cooler heads prevail. That was looking less and less likely the longer the meeting went on. It's an eighteen-month trip to send new troops to the front, Kate answered. That's a long-flight freighter tied up for over three years. That's expensive. And for the year and a half they're flying out here, we're fortifying our position, making camps in the hills, branching out. In order to win, they'll need to do a full military program. Medina Station won't support that even if they get pissed at us for pushing the issue. Coercive alliance, Ibrahim added, nodding. By the book, Kate said. The room was quiet for a moment as everyone there mulled over her words. The metal roof rattled and scraped as the wind outside blew sand across it. The windows creaked, cooling with the night. A dozen people breathed the alien air.
They're here already, Basia said, clearing his throat to break the silence. Isn't that exactly what they'll do? What who will do? Scotty asked. The Rosinante, Basia replied. They're in orbit right now. A warship with guns and missiles and who knows what else. If we kill Holden, can't they just bomb us? Let's hope they do, Kate thundered at him. My God, let's hope so. A few videos of dead colonists murdered by UN ships in orbit, and the public opinion war is over. Basia nodded as though he were agreeing, while what he was really thinking was, I'm on the wrong team. So, we move on both groups at once, Kate said. Her voice had taken on the same cadences Coop used to have. It was as if the man were still in the room, haunting the place. They keep two people on roving patrol at all times, so we'll need a team shadowing them until the signal goes out. We'll put a second team on the security building where Murtry and the rest of his people will be. The third team will go to the commissary where Holden and his crewmen are holed up at night. I'm thinking Scotty and Ibrahim for Team One. I'll lead. Kate rattled on, laying out the insanity of multiple murder like a puzzle to be solved or a game to be won. Coordinating the attacks so all three happened at once so no one could raise the alarm. Using phrases like fields of fire and maximum aggression as if they meant anything other than gunning down a dozen women and men, while most of them slept. The little group nodded and followed along. Basia was astonished by how easily the unthinkable became the routine. My children live here, Basia said, interrupting. What? Kate said, looking genuinely puzzled. She'd been mid-sentence when he spoke up. I don't... The bodies that we take pictures of to send to the newscasts, Basia continued. Those are our children. My children. Kate blinked at him, too puzzled to be angry yet. Como? I wanted to come here and maybe talk you out of doing something stupid, Basia said, standing up and addressing the room. I thought maybe with Coop gone, we could put an end to this. But this isn't just stupid anymore. Not when you can talk about dead friends and family as media tools. That's evil, and I can't be a part of it. The room was silent again, except for the sand and the cooling windows and the breathing. If you try to get in our way, Ibrahim started but Basia wheeled to face the man. What? he said, getting close enough that his breath stirred the whiskers in Ibrahim's thin beard. If I get in your way, what? Don't make half a threat, macho. Ibrahim was smaller than him. He lowered his eyes and said nothing. Basia felt for a brief moment of shameful relief that it was Ibrahim who had chosen to press the issue, not Kate. Basia was afraid of Kate. He'd never have been able to stand up to her. Do we? He said, backing away and nodding to them all. Gone now. They began talking in hushed tones after the door closed behind him, but he couldn't hear what they were saying. It made the back of his neck itch. He wondered if he'd gone too far, and if they'd be content with just killing him and not Lucia, too. Halfway home, he ran into two of the RCE security people walking patrol, two women in heavy body armor that made them look bulky and dangerous. One of them, a fair-skinned woman with raven-black hair, nodded at him as he walked past. Everything about her was a threat. The armor, the large assault rifle she cradled in her arms, the stun grenades and wrist restraints hanging on her belt. Her friendly smile looked wildly out of place. 
Fasia couldn't stop himself from picturing her bleeding out in the street, shot in the back by one of his friends. Lucia was waiting on their porch, sitting cross-legged on a large pillow and drinking something that steamed in the night air. Not tea. They had almost none of it left. Probably just hot water with a bit of lemon flavoring. But even the artificial flavorings would soon be gone, unless they were given permission to begin trading their ore. Basia sat down on the hard carbon fiber floor next to her with a thump. So? Lucia asked. They won't listen. Basia sighed. They're talking about killing the RCE people. All of them. And Jim Holden and his people, too. Lucia shook her head, a gentle negation. And you? At this point, they may be talking about killing me, too. I don't think they will, as long as I don't get in their way. But I can't take part. I told them so. I'm so sorry I let it get this far, Lucy. I'm a very stupid man. Lucia gave him a sad smile and put her hand on his arm. Not doing anything now keeps you on their side. Basia frowned. The night air still held the earthy smell of the recent dust storm, a graveyard scent. I can't stop them by myself. Holden is here to do that. He's back from whatever he was doing out in the desert with the science teams. You could talk to him. I know, Basia said, admitting what he'd already been thinking. The fact that it was necessary didn't make it feel like any less of a betrayal of his friends. I know. I will. Lucia laughed her relief. At Basia's puzzled look, she grabbed him in her arms and pulled him close. I'm so happy to know that the Basia I love is still in there. Basia relaxed into her embrace, letting himself feel safe and loved for a moment. Bas, Lucia whispered in his ear. Don't say anything that will ruin this moment, he thought. Felsia is leaving on the shuttle for the Barba Piccola. Now, tonight, I gave her permission. Basia pulled himself away, holding Lucia at arm's length. She's doing what? Lucia frowned at him and gripped his upper arms tightly. Let her go. There was a warning in her voice. Basia pulled himself free and leaped to his feet. Lucia called after him, but he was already running down the road toward the landing site as fast as his legs would carry him. His relief when he saw the shuttle still sitting there was so powerful he almost collapsed. One of the colony's electric carts whizzed by, nearly running him over in the dark. The bed of the cart was filled with ore. They were still loading the shuttle. He had time. Falcia stood a few meters from the airlock, a suitcase in each hand, chatting with the pilot. They were in a bright pool of illumination cast by the work lights surrounding the ship and her dark olive skin seemed to glow. Her black hair hung about her face and down her back in loose waves. Her eyes and mouth were wide as she spoke on some topic that excited her. In that moment, his daughter was so beautiful it made Basia's chest ache. When she spotted him, her face lit up with a smile. Before she could speak, Basia wrapped her in his arms and squeezed her tight. Papa, she said, worry in her voice. No, baby, it's okay. He shook his head against her cheek. I didn't come to stop you. I only... I couldn't let you leave without saying goodbye. His cheek felt wet. Felsia was crying. He held her by the shoulders and pushed her away to look at her face. His little girl, all grown up but crying in his arms. He couldn't help but see the four-year-old she'd once been, weeping when she fell and hurt her knee. Papa, she said, her voice thick. I was worried you would hate me for going, 
But Mama said, No, baby, no. Basia hugged her again. You go, and when they let the ship leave, you go to Ceres and become a doctor and have a fantastic life. Why? Because the people here see your death as a tool for winning a public opinion battle. Because I've lost all the children I ever planned to lose. Because I can't have you see me when they finally arrest me. Because I love you, baby. He said instead. And I want you to go be amazing. She hugged him, and for that one moment, all was right in the universe again. Basia watched as she boarded, stopping just inside the airlock to wave and blow him a kiss. He watched as they loaded the last of the ore into the cargo compartment. He watched as the shuttle lifted off with a roar and wash of heat. Then he turned back toward town to find Holden. Holden and Amos were sitting in the commissary's tiny bar. Amos drank and watched everyone who came in through the door. He held his glass with his left hand, his right never far from the gun at his belt. Holden was typing rapidly on a hand terminal lying on the table. Both men looked tense. Basia walked toward them, smiling and nodding his head and keeping his hands visible and away from his body. Amos smiled back. The big man's scalp looked pale and shiny under the commissary's white LEDs. When he leaned forward in his chair, it looked perfectly natural and non-threatening, and Basia noted that it also put the gun closer to hand, seemingly by accident. They were not the sort of details he would have noticed before. Coop and Kate and the violence of the last few months had left him on edge seeing the potential for violence everywhere. When he looked at Amos, he suspected his instincts were not wrong. Raising his hands, he said, Captain Holden, can I join you for a moment? Holden's head darted up, startled and frightened. Basia was pretty sure he was not the source of the man's fear, and wondered what was. Murtry and his corporate killers? Had Holden heard from someone else about the planned attack? Please, Holden said, the fear disappearing from his face as quickly as it had come. He gestured at one of their table's empty chairs. What can I do for you? Amos said nothing, just kept smiling his vague smile. Basia sat, making sure to keep his hands on the table and in plain view. Captain. I've come to warn you. About? Amos said at once. Holden said nothing. There is a group here, the same group that attacked and killed the RCE security team prior to your arrival. They plan to kill the remaining security people sometime in the next few days, maybe as early as tomorrow night. Holden and Amos shared a quick look. We've been expecting something like that, Holden said. But that's not the important... Basia didn't let him finish. They also plan to kill you. Holden sat up a little straighter. He didn't seem angry so much as offended. Me? Why would they want to kill me? They think it will send a message, Basia said, his tone apologetic. Also, they're mad about the explosives inspectors. Told you, Holden said to Amos. A good compromise pisses everyone off. Without realizing he was going to do it, Basia grabbed the bottle off the table and took a long drink. It must have been something they had brought with them because it was much better whiskey than anything the colony had access to. It warmed his throat and belly pleasantly but didn't calm him as much as he'd hoped. He pushed the bottle back toward Amos, but the big man stopped him. You keep that, brother. You look like you need it. What are you going to do? Basia asked Holden. About the assassination, 
Nothing. It won't matter, because we're all leaving. We're all... We're evacuating the planet. All of us. Everyone. No. Basia said. No one's leaving. We can't go now. I helped kill people to stay here. Oh, we really are. Holden said. Something very bad is happening on this planet, and it has nothing to do with obstinate belters or sociopathic corporate security. Basia took another long drink from the bottle. The alcohol was starting to leave him a little fuzzy, but not any less anxious. I don't understand. Somebody used to live here, Holden said, waving one arm around. It took Basia's drink-addled mind a moment to realize Holden didn't mean the commissary. Maybe they're gone, and maybe they aren't, but they left a lot of stuff behind, and some of it's waking up. So before we wind up being Eros with a great big sky, everyone is getting the hell out of Dodge. Basia nodded without understanding. Amos grinned at him and said, The towers and robots, man. He means the alien shit. Looks like some of it's waking up. I'm sending a message up to the Rossi right now to bounce it on to the UN and the OPA Council. Holden continued. My recommendation is that everyone get into orbit as soon as possible. I'm asking for emergency command of the Israel and the Barba Piccola to facilitate that. That isn't going to happen, Basia said, his voice soft. It's not an easy sell, Holden said. But I can be persuasive, and once I have command, they won't go, Basia said. People already bled for this land, died for it. We're willing to kill each other to stay here. We'll sure as hell stay and fight whatever else wants us gone. Providing there's anyone left, Amos said. Well, sure, Basia agreed. Providing that. Chapter 18 Holden Murtry and his security team had converted the small prefab security outpost into a fortress. The inner walls had been sprayed with energy-absorbing foam that looked like whipped cream, but formed a ballistic barrier that could stop small arms fire and light explosives. A large gun cage sat against one wall, secured with a biometric lock. It only had a few guns in it. Since Holden didn't know exactly how many the security team had brought with them, that was either a good thing or a bad thing. Murtry sat behind a small desk with a hand terminal lying on it. He leaned back in his chair, hands behind his head, a vague smile on his face. He looked like a man with all the time in the world. Did you hear me when I said that people are planning to murder your team? Holden asked. I wish you'd stop using that word, Carol Chiwiwi said. She insisted on being present at any meeting between Holden and the RCE people, and it had seemed like a reasonable request. Now, with her own people plotting an attack, it felt like a security risk. Murder, Murtry said. Terrorism has a nice ring to it. Homicide always sounded a bit legalistic to me. Pretentious. Wait, Holden cut in before Carol could respond to Murtry's baiting. Cut that out right now. My capacity for giving a shit about your little tiff down here has hit its limit. This is no longer a negotiation of rights or a discussion of who attacked who first. No, Murtry said. And what is it, then? It's about me telling you what's going to happen. Telling, Murtry said. You're not in charge here, Carol added. Holden squashed the irritation he felt at their only taking sides to make his life harder. Two things have changed recently, and one hasn't, he said, working to keep his tone pleasant. 
The violence is about to escalate, with us teetering on the edge of an all-out shooting war between the colony and RCE. And probably, more importantly, the alien stuff left on this planet is waking up. What's the one that didn't? Murtry asked. What? The one thing that didn't change. Right, Holden said, leaning across the desk toward him. I'm still the only guy in the system with a warship in orbit. So with those three things in mind, we're leaving this planet before you idiots can kill any more of each other, or before the aliens kill all of us. Threats now? Carol said behind him. Without looking away from Murtry, Holden said, You bet, if that's what it takes. Start getting your people ready for evac. Get the Israel's shuttles down here. Do it now. The Israel is leaving with me in thirty hours, and you'll want to be on it when we go. You can't, Carol said, and Holden spun around to face her. I can. We'll get the Barb shuttle back down here, and I suggest you have your people pack up everything they care about and start getting on it, because the Barb is leaving. Carol's mouth went tight, and her hands curled into fists. You done? Murtry asked, his voice light. May I present my rebuttal? There isn't one, Holden said pulling a chair up to the desk and sitting down, showing he didn't care about the trappings of control the security office gave Murtry. So, here's the price of fame, Murtry continued. You are one of the most recognized people in the solar system. It's why they sent you. Fame gives you the illusion of power. But it's all just a facade. No. The fact that I own the Rosinante. Murtry patted the air again in the same condescending gesture he'd used on Carol. You're famous for being the man who tries to save everyone. For being the solar system's white knight. Tilting at giants like Protogen and Mao Quick. Your ship's got the right name. Murtry laughed at Holden's frown. Yeah. I've read a book, Murtry went on. So that's why they send you here. No one will expect the great James Holden to take sides, of secretly backing either the colonists or one of the nasty Earth corporations. You're the man without an agenda or subtext. Great, Holden said. Thanks for the insight. Now call your people and... But we're eighteen months from the closest legal remedy, and the only real power you have out here is violence. You're the violent man here, Carol said, making it an accusation. I am, Murtry agreed. I understand its uses better than most, and the thing I know about you, Captain Holden, is that you are not. Now, if that brute you brought with you were in here making these threats, well, I'd have to take that seriously. But not from you. You've got a warship in orbit right now that could blow the Israel and the Barbapicola into glowing slag, then rain down destruction on this planet that would wipe out every shred of human life in this solar system. But you're not the man to pull that trigger. And we both know it. So save your threats. They're embarrassing. You're out of control, Holden replied. You're insane, and as soon as RCE finds out... Finds out what? That the UN mediator got spooked because there was an alien artifact on an alien planet, and I didn't? Murtry interrupted. Send in a full report. I'm sure that with your reputation and the backing of the U.N. and O.P.A., your words will be given serious consideration. And maybe, maybe, three years from now, a replacement will arrive to relieve me of duty. Holden stood up, dropping his hand to the butt of his gun. Or maybe I relieve you right now. 
The room went silent for a moment. Carol seemed to be holding her breath. Murtry frowned up at Holden, seemingly taken off guard for the first time. Holden waited, not breaking eye contact, angry enough to draw on Murtry and furious with himself for letting it get to that point. Murtry smiled. It did nothing to break the tension. If you'd brought the other one with you, that threat might have some weight. We both know who the killer on your crew is. If you think I wouldn't blow you out of that chair right this second to save everyone else on this planet, then you don't know me at all. There were scratching sounds on the floor as Carol shuffled back toward the door and out of the potential firing line. Holden kept his eyes on Murtry. The man frowned up at him for several seconds, then shifted back to the vague smile. Here we go, Holden thought, and tried not to let the rush of adrenaline make his hand shake. When the hand terminal on the desk squawked a connection request, Holden was so startled that he half drew his gun before he could stop himself. Murtry didn't move. The terminal screeched again. May I answer that? Murtry asked. Holden just nodded at him, dropping his gun back into its holster. Murtry picked up the terminal and opened the connection. Way here, a voice said. Go ahead. Team in position. Birds are all in the nest and tooling up. Are we a go? Hold, Murtry said then put the terminal down and looked back up at Holden. You're still twitching over what happened on Eros. I get that. You're not rational about all this alien shit, and honestly, who would be? I forgive you for the threats, and I appreciate that your initial purpose in coming here was to warn me about the danger to my team. It says something to me that, in spite of our differences, you're still trying to save my people. No one needs to die here, Holden said, hoping against hope that Murtry was backing down. Well, that's not strictly speaking true, Murtry replied. I'm good at this job. Did you think I didn't know about this little uprising? I knew before you did. The security teams constantly patrolling the town would never have gotten close enough to listen in. You've been bugging the town. Every building in it. Murtry agreed. So while I appreciate you coming here, I think I've got the situation handled. You bugged my town? Carol asked, anger seeming to win out over her fear. What are you doing? Holden said. Don't do something stupid. Murtry just smiled again, picked up his hand terminal, and said, Strike team is a go. The gunshots outside were softened by the foam covering the walls and sounded like a rapid string of faint pops, like distant fireworks or a bad hydraulic seal finally letting go. Oh no, Carol said and rushed to the door. Holden followed her, fumbling with his hand terminal to call Amos. Outside, the sound was much louder, the staccato reports of gunfire splitting the peaceful night air, the flashes a distant strobe lighting up the far edge of the town. Holden ran toward the shots, shouting into his terminal for Amos to come. He stumbled in the dark, dropping it, but didn't stop to pick it up. At the northern edge of town, he found the rest of Murtry's security team firing on one of the houses. Shots were coming back at them from inside. The security people were shouting at the people in the house to surrender, the people inside cursing and firing in answer. Smoke poured out of one of the house's broken windows, something inside burning. Stop it! Holden yelled as he ran toward the RCE people. They ignored him and continued to pour fire into the house. Answering bullets hit one of the RCE people in the chest, 
the body armor making a dull thud as it stopped the round. The security woman fell on her back, yelling in pain and surprise. The rest of the team opened up on the window the shot had come from, blasting the frame and inside wall behind it into splinters. The blaze inside the house spread suddenly with a wave of heat and a whooshing sound. Someone inside screamed in panic or pain. The front door, already just a mass of carbon fiber splinters from gunfire, swung open. A woman rushed out, a rifle in her hands. The security team shot her into a splatter of blood, and she collapsed at the bottom of the steps, twitching. They're burning! Holden yelled, grabbing the nearest RCE person by the arms and shaking him. We have to get them out! The man responded by shoving him away. Stay back until the area is cleared, sir. Holden shoved back hard enough to put the RCE man on his ass in the dirt and ran toward the fallen woman at the front of the house. Someone inside must have thought he was attacking because a shotgun blast rang out and the ground a meter behind him flew up in a miniature explosion of dust. The RCE people opened up and Holden found himself between two different firing lines. Again, some distant and still calm part of his brain thought, marveling at how often this sort of thing seemed to happen. He dove to the ground and rolled his body on top of the fallen woman, screaming for everyone to stop. No one listened. The fire in the house billowed out with another loud wump, and the heat scorched the exposed skin on Holden's face and hands. The gunshots from inside the house cut off all at once, and the RCE return fire soon after. Holden grabbed the fallen woman by the arms and dragged her away from the flames. He stumbled when he reached the RCE people, falling down at their feet. Help her! He croaked at the woman who reached down to help him up. He pushed himself up to his hands and knees, but stopped there, too dizzy to stand. Another member of the security team was already bending over her. This one's dead. Holden collapsed back to the ground, suddenly robbed of strength. Too late. The big meat grinder he was trying to save these people from just kept chewing away relentlessly, and they kept lining up to throw themselves inside. The RCE people were helping up their fallen comrade, and she was insisting that she was fine, that the armor had stopped the round, that she'd just have a big bruise. Someone joked about idiots bringing slingshots to a gunfight, followed by laughter. All the while, the house burned, filling the air with acrid black smoke and the smell of hot epoxy and cooking pork. The RCE people seemed to remember he was there, and several came over to look down at him. Secure him, one said. Way, the one who'd come out to look at the alien robot with them, the one who'd shot it. She stared down, nothing like compassion in her eyes. Fuck you, Holden said, trying to push himself back up to his feet. You aren't securing shit. Wei smashed him in the chest with her rifle butt, knocking him back to the ground. One of the other security people pointed his rifle at Holden. He found himself thinking it was very likely he was about to be shot. Hold on now, a calm voice said. Murtry strode into view out of the darkness. No one's shooting Captain Holden. He tried to help the terrorists, Wei said. Did he? Murtry feigned shock. You didn't, did you? That would be a violation of the neutrality of your position here, wouldn't it? I tried to help a woman who'd been shot, Holden replied, slowly climbing to his feet. His sternum felt bruised. That was all right. It would only hurt when he breathed. That sounds reasonable, Murtry said. Is that the extent of his aid to the terrorists? 
Wei nodded, then looked away, annoyed. Then there's no reason to detain you, Mertry continued, his voice full of good cheer. He's insane, Holden thought. He's gone completely over the edge. I could kill him right now and end this. In his mind, he could picture Miller nodding in approval at the thought. Sir, Wei said, bringing her rifle up to her shoulder and aiming into the darkness beyond the firelight. Incoming. Hold your panties, Amos said from the dark and stepped into the light. He had Bossia Merton and Carol Chiwiwi and a number of other colonists with him. My God, Carol said, looking at the fire. Did anyone get out? One of the security people pointed his rifle at the body lying on the ground. She did. Zadie, Bossia said. They killed her. Mertry stepped forward and cleared his throat. When everyone was looking at him, he said, My team surrounded the house, where a cell of known terrorists were actively preparing to murder myself, the entire RCE security detachment, and Captain Holden. They had firearms and possibly explosives. When the RCE security team demanded that they exit the building unarmed and with their hands up, they opened fire. All of the terrorists were killed by the return fire. It's possible that explosives the terrorists were planning to use acted as an accelerant when the house started burning. Everything done here was by the book and appropriate for protecting RCE personnel and the UN OPA mediator from harm. Carol looked at the blazing house with a stunned expression. Appropriate. Mr. Merton, Mertry continued. So glad you could join us. Sergeant Way, take Bossia Merton into custody. What? Bossia said, raising his hands and backing up. Why me? No, Holden said, stepping in front of Way and planting his hand on the breastplate of her armor. Not happening. Mr. Merton was a party to this conspiracy, Mertry said, speaking loud enough for the gathering crowd of colonists to hear. He attended the secret meeting at which the attack was planned, and there is significant evidence that he was a participant in the attack which killed five of my people. Might have something to say about what happened to Governor Trying, too. Lowering his voice, he said, Out of the way, Holden, or we'll just go through you. Wei smiled at him without humor. One of the other RCE people walked around them toward Bossia, a plastic wrist restraint in his hands. Amos stepped in front of Bossia and punched the RCE man in the face. It sounded like a hammer hitting a side of beef. The security man fell to the ground, a puppet whose strings had been cut. Nope, Amos said, then shook his right hand with a grimace and added, Ouch. The rest of the security team brought their rifles to bear on him. Holden saw Amos drop his right hand toward his gun, then stepped in front of him and yelled, Stop! We're taking him in, Mertry said pointing at Bossia. One way or the other, we'll let the assault on one of my people slide for now, emotions running hot and all. We're all leaving anyway, Holden said, keeping his voice low, appealing to Mertry rather than the crowd. You have no authority to order anyone to leave, Mertry replied. I hoped we were done with that. In the meantime, Holden continued as though Mertry hadn't spoken. The UN is taking custody of this man, Basia, as part of our investigation. He'll be secure on my ship, he won't be a threat to your people down here, and when we all get back you can present your evidence and have him arrested. Get back, Mertry said with a lazy smile. 
Just going to keep him in a holding cell for the next few years? Because I accused him of something? If I have to, Holden said. Because I don't believe for a second that you wouldn't kill him. Murtry shrugged. Okay, he's your baggage then. Just keep him off my planet. Fasia looked stunned, his eyes focused on nothing in particular. The colonists had been organizing a firefighting detail to put the blaze out. Murtry and his team stood and watched, not offering to help, a visible reminder of the threat they presented next to the violence of their handiwork. Holden headed back into town, Bossia and Amos in tow. He patted his pockets, looking for his hand terminal, before he remembered he'd dropped it on the run out to the fight. He'd never find it in the dark, so he borrowed Amos's and called the ship. Naomi, he said once she'd picked up. Bring the Rosie down to the landing area. We're going to need you to offload our heavier armor and some bigger firepower. This doesn't sound good, she said. It's not. Have you heard back from the UN or Fred yet? Nothing yet. I take it this means RCE and the Ganymede folks aren't in a big hurry to leave? No, Holden said with a heavy sigh. No, they'd rather stay here and kill each other right up until the alien shit starts turning them into spare parts. And you? She said. She meant, was he coming up the well, too? It was the sane thing to do. Not yet, he said. If it escalates any more, maybe. It the aliens, or it the people? Right. Alex has seen a few more power spikes, and there's more movement, but it's pretty far south of you. If it starts looking more interesting, I'll let you know. Thank you. Oh, and you'll be picking up a passenger. Kay? It's complicated, but we're putting him on the Rossi because he isn't safe down here anymore. I owe this guy, Naomi. He tried to save my life. Take good care of him. Okay. And honey? Holden said, unable to keep the worry out of his voice. When you get back up, keep a close eye on the Israel. I think things might be about to go all the way bad down here. And when they do, they may go bad up there, too. Ha! <laughs> Naomi said, and he could hear the smile in her voice. Let him try. Chapter 19 Havelock The corridor stretched forty meters between the recycling tanks and the secondary machine shop, with hatches inset every ten meters. Open lifts at either end led to environmental control fore and hydroponics aft. The age of the Israel showed not only in the design of the walls and the grating of the floor, but also in the green-gray finish of the ceramic. Harsh edges at the doorways marked where safety design had improved in the decades since the ship first flew out past the orbit of Mars. A white scar splashed across one wall where something drastic had happened in some previous era of the ship's history and been patched like painting over graffiti. Havelock fought the urge to press himself into the corner nearest the doorway. It was hard. His species had evolved in the gravity well of Earth, had grown and developed in it. His hindbrain told him that pressure meant safety. The angry whispers of the men in the hall set his heart tripping over faster, and the wall, centimeters from his back, seemed to pull at him like a magnet. It was an error waiting to happen. Lean in, push against the wall, and it would push back, sending him out into the open air of the corridor and the firing lines. The second law of thermodynamics as applied to gunfights. Clear! One of the engineers said, and Havelock was torn between pleasure and annoyance. Not clear, he thought. They hadn't seen him, so they thought he wasn't there. 
He held the gun at his leg, stayed still, waited, didn't hug the wall. The first man who floated by didn't notice him until he'd already been shot. Havelock's paint round bloomed orange against the man's chest. The one behind him had already launched, his body sailing between one handhold and the next, unable to change his trajectory. Havelock hit him twice, once in the leg, then in the belly. In a real fight, there would be blood in the air now, fine red droplets spinning into orbs and already coalescing and beginning to clot. The third man was still far enough down the corridor that Havelock didn't have a clear line of sight. Half a dozen blue paint rounds hissed past him, splattering the ceramic bulkhead. Suppressing fire. Not a bad plan, but there was no one left to exploit it. Havelock pulled gently at the handhold behind him to keep from drifting out, reloaded his pistol, and counted incoming rounds. The dead engineer floated in the corridor, a sour expression on his face. Havelock counted fifteen rounds, then there was a pause and the slick metallic sound of the pistol ejecting the paint round magazine. Havelock pulled a few centimeters forward, looking down the hall. The last man, Williams, hadn't even taken cover while he fumbled to reload his gun. Havelock fired three times, hitting him only once. The accuracy on the pistol stank, but it was enough to make his point. The last engineer barked out an obscenity. All right, Havelock said into his hand terminal. That's a wrap, guys. Let's get the cleanup crew out and meet back in the conference room in thirty. It was hard to judge the training sessions. On the one hand, they had been going for eight days now, and they were not ready for real action. The engineers weren't soldiers. The three who'd had some training earlier in life were so out of practice that they were worse than the absolute beginners. At least the novices knew they didn't know anything. And on the other hand, they were getting better faster than Havelock had expected. With another week or ten days, they'd be at least as competent as a squad of rookies. Maybe more. Security trainees were driven by any number of things. The need for a job, an idealistic view of helping people, sometimes just a narcissistic love of violence. The engineers weren't like that. They were more focused, more driven, and there was a palpable sense of the team against the enemy. Murtry's defeat of the terrorist cell downstairs left them at once excited and edgy, and Havelock didn't see anything wrong with the bloodthirst, so long as it was channeled and controlled. For the next half hour, the engineers and the security team Havelock and two others from his skeleton crew went through the corridors, holds, and locks, cleaning up the mess from the exercise. The paint polymerized quickly, peeling off the walls and grates without flaking much or leaving fragments on the float that someone could breathe in. The engineers had also manufactured sets of personal vacuuming systems that filtered everything from tiny particles of the paint casing to volatile molecules out of the air. They laughed and joked and traded friendly insults as they worked, like junior belts cleaning a dojang. Havelock hadn't intended the cleanup as a team-building exercise, but it worked well enough that he was starting to tell himself that he had. The conference room, where they had the orientation before the exercise and the post-mortem afterward, had been designed for the false gravity of thrust. An oblong table was bolted to the floor with crash couches around it that the engineers didn't use. Havelock didn't know how the decision had been made to ignore the table and rotate the consensus for up and down ninety degrees, but every meeting was like that now. The engineers and security floated against the walls or in the open air, the floor to their right, and Havelock took his place by the main doors. All right, he said, 
and the murmur of conversations stopped. What did we learn? Not to trust motherfucking Gibbs when he tells us the corridor's clear. Laughter bubbled after, but it wasn't angry or mean. Even the man being mocked was smiling. Wrong answer, Havelock said with a grin. The right answer is don't hurry when you're clearing a space. We have a natural tendency to see an empty space and think it's safe. Doors and corners are always dangerous, because you're moving into something without being sure what's there. By the time you see the enemy, you're exposed to them. Sir? Havelock pointed to the woman with the raised hand. Yes. Sir, is there an algorithm for this? Because if we could get some kind of best practice flowchart that we could study when we're not here, I think it would help us a lot. We could classify them by the types of doors or corners, someone else said. And what plane we could use to approach them. Seemed to me like we'd be better off shifting the axis so that whatever we're coming to reads as down. Havelock let them talk for a while. It was funny hearing the tactics of small unit assault analyzed in terms of engineering, but those were his crew now. They were learning to solve violence like an equation, not to eliminate it, but to understand it fully. What I don't understand, Chief Engineer Conan said, is why we are looking at the Barber Pecola at all. The eyes of the assembled team turned toward Havelock, looking for an answer, or at least a response. A surprising nervousness crawled up his throat, and he chuckled. They're the bad guys, he said. The Baba Pecola is an unarmed freighter with a standing crew of maybe a hundred people that requires a shuttle to transfer from the surface, the chief engineer said. The Rosanante runs with less than a skeleton crew, half of which are already off the ship. It seems to me that we have a lower risk, higher value option here. A murmur of agreement passed through the room. Havelock shook his head. No, he said. First thing is just what you said. The Barber Pecola's unarmed. If things don't go well, the worst we can expect in retaliation is a strongly worded letter. The Rosinante was a state-of-the-art Martian warship before Holden took her to the OPA. God knows what modifications they've made since then. She's got a full rack of torpedoes, PDCs, and a keel-mounted railgun. If the crew on the Rosinante sees us as a threat, they can end us, and there's really nothing we can do about it. But if we were the ones with that firepower, Conan began. We'd be fine as long as we stayed here, Havelock said. But as soon as we go back through the ring gate, there's a whole mess of lawyers, treaties, and other ships with even bigger guns. If we have to commandeer the Barber Picola, at least we have a legal argument to make. The engineers groaned and shook their heads. Legal arguments were another phrase for bullshit to them, but Havelock pressed on. For one thing, the ore they're carrying is RCE property, as long as the UN Charter stands. For another, if they bring any of the colonists up from the surface, we can argue they're aiding and abetting murder. Argue? One of the men in the back of the group said. The laughter that followed was bleak. Being true makes it a strong argument, Havelock said. Go after the Rosinante, and we look like everything they say we are. If we stand tough, we can protect ourselves and still win the long game. Long game's great if you're around long enough to play it, the man at the back said, but his tone of voice told Havelock that they'd seen the sense in what he said, for the time being, anyway. Evers Torson was a geosensor analyst with advanced degrees from universities on Luna and Ganymede. He made more in a month than Havelock would in a year of working security. Also, he was a belter. 
growing up in microgravity hadn't affected him as much as Havelock had seen in other people. Torson's head was maybe a little big for his body, his spine and legs maybe a little long and thin. With enough exercise and steroids, the man could almost have passed for an earther. Not that it mattered. Everyone on the Israel knew what everyone else was. Back when they'd left home, the differences hadn't mattered. Not much. In addition to the energy spikes, there are twenty heat upwellings that we've seen so far, he said, pointing to the rendered sphere of New Terra on Havelock's desk display. They've all appeared in the last eighty hours, and so far we don't have any idea what they are. Havelock scratched his head. The cells in the brig were empty, so there was no one to overhear them. No need to be polite. Were you expecting me to have a hypothesis? Because I was under the impression that we were here in order to find a bunch of stuff we didn't know what it was. That you've seen something you don't understand seems pretty much par for the course. The belter's lips pressed thin and pale. This could be important. It could be nothing. My point is that I have to find out. I'm busy with important work. I can't spend all my time dealing with distractions. All right, Havelock said. This is the third day running that someone has sprayed urine in my locker. Three times, you understand? I'm trying to get my gear not to smell like piss instead of running the numbers. Havelock sighed and cancelled out his display. New Terra and its mysterious hotspots vanished. Look, I understand why you don't like it. I'd be cheesed off, too. But you have to cut them a little slack. People are bored, and they're under pressure. It's natural to get a little rowdy. It'll pass. Torson folded his arms across his chest, his scowl deepening. A little rowdy? That's what you see? I am the only belter on my team, and I am the only one getting— No. Look, just no, all right? Things are tense already. If you want me to, I'll put a monitor on the locker and let people know they need to cool it. But let's not make this into a belters against the inner planets thing. I'm not making it into anything. With all respect, I think you are, Havelock said. And the more you try to make this into a big deal, the more it's going to come back and bite you on the ass. Torson's rage was palpable. Havelock shifted slightly, pushing himself higher in the direction that they'd temporarily chosen as up. It was an old trick he'd learned back when he'd worked with Star Helix. Humanity might have gone up out of the gravity wells, but the sense of being taller, of establishing dominance, was buried too deeply in the human animal for a little thing like Null G to erase it. Torson took a deep, shuddering breath, and for a moment Pavlock wondered if he was going to take a swing at him. He didn't want to lock the analyst in a cell for the night, but if it came to it, he wouldn't mind. I'll put a monitor on your locker, and I'll send out a general announcement that people need to put a sock in it. No one will piss on your stuff again, and you can get back to work. That's what you want, right? When you write your announcement, is it going to say that they should stop pulling pranks, or that they should stop harassing belters? I think you know the answer to that. Torson's shoulders hunched, defeated. Havelock nodded. It struck him, not for the first time, that confrontations were like a dance. Certain moves required certain responses, and most of it happened in the lower parts of the brain that language might not even be aware of. Torson's hunch was an offer of submission, and his nod accepted it, and Torson probably didn't even know it had happened. Certainly didn't, in fact, because his rational mind kept on dieseling, even though everything that needed talking about was already decided. If you were the only Earther and it was Belters doing this, you'd feel different about it. 
Thank you for letting me know about the problem, Havelock said. I'll see it's addressed. Torson pushed off from the desk and sailed gracefully through the air, vanishing into the corridor. Havelock sighed, opened his desk display again, and paged through the ship reports. The truth was that incidents were on the rise. Most of it was little things. Complaints of petty infractions of corporate policies. Accusations of hoarding or sexual misconduct. One of the organic chemists had been making euphorics. The ship's psychiatric counselor was issuing increasingly strident warnings about something he called internal stratification, which just sounded like social politics as usual to Havelock. He signed off on all the reports. If you were the only Earther. The funny thing was that Havelock had been the only Earther in a Belter society, and more than once. When he'd been on a twenty-berth hauler from Luna to Ganymede for Stone and Sibbets, he'd been one of two Earthers, outnumbered and always subtly excluded. He'd worked for Star Helix on Ceres Station for the better part of a year, always getting the worst cases, the worst partner, the less-than-subtle reminders that he didn't belong. He'd been dealt more than his fair share of shit by belters for not having the right-shaped body or knowing the polyglot mess that passed for a kind of outer planet's cant. They hadn't pissed in his locker, mostly because it hadn't occurred to them. Havelock set a monitor specifically on Torson's locker, then pulled up a fresh security template. He looked at the empty field, asking him by its blankness what he wanted to say. We're eight billion clicks from home, and a bunch of half-feral terrorists want to keep on killing us, so let's stay calm. Or maybe, damn near every belter I've dealt with treated me like I was dipped in shit because of where I came from. But now that we're in the majority, let's all respect their tender little feelings. He cracked his knuckles and started typing. It has come to the attention of security that an increasing number of pranks have been played among the crew. While we all understand the need to keep things light in these stressful times, some of these have gone beyond the realm of good taste. As acting head of security, he paused. Once on series, Havelock had been assigned to close down an illegal club up near the center of the station where the Coriolis had been vicious and the spin gravity at its least. When he'd gotten to the place, the combination of bright lights, shrieking dub, and his unaccustomed inner ear had left him vomiting in the carved corridors. An image of him had made its way onto the board back in the offices. He'd played along because objecting would have made it worse. He hadn't thought about that case in years. If you were the only Earther... Fuck, Havelock said to the empty air. He cleared the screen. It has come to my attention that some RCE employees and team members have been singled out for harassment because they are from the outer planets. It is critical under these stressful conditions that we not confuse our teammates with our enemies because of accidents of physiology and environments of origin. As such, I am taking the following actions. I'm gonna regret this, Havelock said to the screen, but by the time he'd finished the announcement, checked it for grammar, and sent it out, he felt almost good. Chapter 20 Elvie Sitting outside her hut, her hand terminal resting on her knees, the now familiar sunlight warming her neck and back, Elvie waited for the reports from Luna to buffer. The comm laser on the Edward Israel was the only conduit back to the worlds she'd known, and it was swamped with technical data flowing out from the work groups on the planetary surface and the sensor data from the Israel. 
It was sobering to realize that for all the tragedies and fear and death that racked New Terra, most of the raw data going back home was still technical. And her slow connection was more than the townspeople the first landing had. The Barba Piccola didn't even support a feed for them. Their hand terminals were strictly ad hoc, local, line-of-sight networks, if they functioned at all. A breeze lifted a whirl of sand, then set it gently down again. High above, the green clouds scattered apart and rejoined, lacing the blue sky like algae floating on the surface of a pond. The air smelled of heat and dust and the distant presentiment of rain. The reports finished loading, and Elvie pulled them up and spent a long hour reading them, listening to the debates, putting together her perspective. It was harder than she liked. Her mind kept jumping around without her. Everything was changing on the planet so quickly. Everything was so different than she'd expected it to be that just maintaining focus was hard. The voyage into the desert, seeing a two-billion-year-old mechanism actually still functioning, if only barely, had been revelatory. Then, the exposure and destruction of the terrorists among the squatters, which should have been a relief, had left her oddly unsettled. And, though she hadn't mentioned it to anyone and never would, She'd been suffering recurring and intrusive dreams about James Holden. On the screen, the research coordinator's report ended, and Elvie realized she hadn't heard any of it. She sighed, restarted it, and stopped it again before the woman back at the RCE labs on Earth could say anything. Elvie looked up at the sky, wondering where the Rosinante and the Barbapicola and the Edward Israel were, hidden by the atmosphere scatter of blue. One of the plant analogs beside the path leading back to the town let out a volley of rising clicks. It was something she'd wanted to investigate, but she hadn't had the time. Not yet. Dr. Okoy? The research coordinator said from sixty AU away, or half a galaxy, depending on how you looked at it. I've just come from a meeting with the stats team, and I wanted to bring you up to speed on the plan for how we'd like to proceed with the data collection in the next weeks. The Luna Group especially was hoping to request additional sampling on several of your initial subjects so that we can narrow our error bars. Elvie listened, focused, pushed away all her other thoughts and feelings. This time, she ended the report with a list of action items a clear sense of how her work was changing the resources and plans of the labs back home, and a half-dozen questions about mineral sequestration that she wanted to ask Fayez. Protocol said she should record a reply and send it out right away. The hours it would take to reach home meant it would arrive before the morning meetings. But instead, she switched to her organizer and began listing her obligations water samples, and soil samples. Samples of three different plant analog species. A report on the alien artifact. She'd been thinking about possible triggers to the artifact's sudden activity, and since Holden had been there and was, after all, the mediator who was ultimately responsible for making the situation on New Terra better, sensible, sane, she thought maybe if she could give a solid reason that the artifact in the desert wasn't moving in reaction to their presence, it would take something off his plate, just as a kindness, and to help support him in making peace. Certainly it wasn't just that she was generating excuses to see him again. She went down the list of things to do, then paused. At the end, she wrote, Letter of Recommendation for Felcia Merton She sat for a long moment, looking at the words, trying to decide how she felt about them. She erased the line, waited, and then entered it in again. Walking into the town was like entering another world, and a harder one. 
The dirt streets weren't empty, but the people who walked them stayed closer to the walls than they had before. The smiles and nods, the eye contact and simple greetings were all gone. The townspeople walked quickly, with their heads down. Elvi had the urge to stand in their way, block them with her body, until they acknowledged that she was there. The building where it had happened stood near the edge of town. The fire had melted what it hadn't burned. The bones of the structure still stood, charred and tilted in the afternoon sun. She paused before them. They reminded her of something, but she couldn't quite remember what. Something dead. Something about fire. Oh, of course. The artifact, burning in the desert. Two of the RCE security force walked down the street in front of her, striding in the middle of the road. She couldn't make out their words, but the tone of the conversation was bright, loose, and celebratory. One of them laughed. Elvie turned, walking toward them. As they passed, one of them lifted a hand in greeting, and Elvie returned it automatically. Across the street, one of the Belter women, Erin, her name was, stepped out from a door, saw the security forces, and hesitated before she came out into the light. Elvie watched the woman walk, her head a little too high, her shoulders pulled a little too far back. Nothing proved fear like the effort of rejecting it. First landing had belonged to that woman once. Elby stepped into the commissary, hoping to find Holden at his traditional table. The room was dim, and it took her eyes a moment to adjust. The other one, Amos Burton, was there instead, eating a bowl of brown noodles that smelled of fake peanuts and curry. In the back, Lucia Merton sat in a booth with someone. Elvie looked away before the doctor met her gaze. Amos looked up at her as she came close. I was wondering if Captain Holden... I wanted to talk with him about the artifacts in the desert. Something happened with it? I had some theories about it that I uh, thought might be useful. Oh, good God, she thought. I'm stuttering like a schoolgirl. Thankfully, Amos didn't notice, or if he did, he pretended not to. Captain Zoff getting ready to transfer the prisoner, Amos said. Should be back around sundown. All right, Elvi said. That's fine. If you'd tell him I was looking for him, I'll likely be in my hut by the time he's back. He can find me there. I'll let him know. Thank you. She turned away, fists pushed into her pockets. She felt humiliated, without being entirely certain why she should. She was just going to offer some perspective on the artifacts and the local ecosystem. There was nothing about it that was at all inappropriate or... Elvie! She felt her belly drop. She turned toward the back, toward the booth where Lucia Merton sat. Faez had swiveled around in the chair and was waving at her. She looked at the door to the street, wishing there was some graceful way to get through it. Elvie, come sit, have a drink with us. Of course, she said, and walked toward the back of the commissary, regretting every step as she took it. Dr. Merton looked pale except for the bags under her eyes. Elvie wondered if the woman was ill, or if it was just distress and grief. Lucia, Elvie said. Elvie? Sit, 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 Fayez said. You're standing there. I feel short. I hate feeling short. Elvie smoothed the fabric of her pants and slid in next to Fayez. His smile was beery and amused. Lucia's glance at her was almost an apology. You could have sat next to me, she seemed to say. We were just talking about Felcia, Fayez said, then turned to Lucia. 
Elvie is the smartest person on the team. Seriously, do you know that she's the one who wrote the first real paper on cytoplasmic computation? That's her, right there. Falcius told me about you, Lucia said. Thank you for being a friend to my daughter. Your family tried to kill me, Elvie thought. You shared your bed every night with a man who wanted me dead. You're welcome, she said. She's a very talented girl. She is, Lucia said. And God knows I tried to talk her out of being a doctor. You were hoping she'd stay? Elvie asked, and her voice was more brittle than she'd intended. Not that, no, Lucia said, laughing. That she's leaving this planet is the only good thing that's happened since we came. It's only that I'm afraid she's doing it because it's what I'd do. Better that she find her own way. It's a long way to Luna, Fayez said. I mean, I had five major courses of study before I fell in love with geohydraulics. I was going to be a brewer. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Elvie and Lucia said yes at precisely the same time. Elvie smiled despite herself. Lucia stood. I should go get Yasek, she said. Is he all right? Elvie asked. It was a reflex, a habit of etiquette. She wished she could take the question back even as the words left her mouth. The doctor's smile was wistful. As well as can be expected, she said. His father is leaving today, taken prisoner on the Rosinante, Elvie thought, but said nothing. Your money's no good here, Baez said. It's on me. Thank you, Dr. Sarkis. Faez, call me Faez. Everyone else does. Lucia nodded and walked away. Fayez shook his head and stretched, his arm reaching behind Elvie's shoulders. She shifted to the opposite side of the table. What the hell are you doing? She asked. What am I doing? You think that's the question? You know that her husband... I don't know a damned thing, Elvie. Neither do you. I'm rich in interpretation and poor in data sets. Just the same as you. You think... you think it's not... I think that building was filled with terrorists, and that Murtry killed them and saved us. That's what I think, though. I also think that the more the locals know and love me, the less likely it is that I'll be scalped in the next uprising. And... And what is civilization if it isn't people talking to each other over a goddamned beer? Baez said, then lolled his head back over his shoulder. Am I right? Fucking A, Amos called back. That sure is, whatever you were talking about. That's right, Baez said. You're drunk. I've been doing this for a while. Fayez said. I've probably had drinks with a third of the people in this shithole. What I want to know is where the rest of you are while I'm making peace. For a moment, she could see his fear, too. It was in the angle of his jaw and the way his half-closed eyes cut to the left, avoiding hers. Fayez, who could laugh at anything, however tragic, was scared out of his wits. And why wouldn't he be? They were billions of clicks from home on a planet they didn't understand, and in the middle of a war that had now killed people on both sides. And how odd and obvious that it would be a victory for their side, the nameless, faceless killers identified and killed or imprisoned, that would call up the panic. Fayez was waiting waiting for the next escalation, the other shoe to drop. He was reaching out for whatever control he could find or hope for or pretend into being. Elvie understood, because she felt just the same. 
only she hadn't known it until she saw it in someone else. He scowled down at the table, then, slowly, his gaze floated up to meet hers. What are you doing here? Sitting with you, apparently, she said, waiting for the other shoe. Chapter 21 Basia Basia stood at the edge of the landing area, steel shackles damp with his sweat and chafing his wrists and forearms. Murtry had insisted on restraints until Basia was off-planet, though he had given the key to Amos and the big man had assured Basia he'd be uncuffed once the Rosinante lifted off. It was one last visible demonstration to the citizens of Illus that Murtry could and would exert his will upon them. Jim Holden was still trying to play the peacemaker, and he'd agreed to the restraints in exchange for Basia being released into his custody without any further threats or considerations. Basia understood why everyone was doing what they were doing. It didn't make it less humiliating. Lucia and Yasek stood with him, waiting for the Rosinante to land. Yasek stood in front of him, back pressed to his father's stomach and Basia's cuffed hands on his shoulders. His wife's hand, gripping his own, rested on his son's shoulder, all three of them touching. He tried to draw strength from it, tried to lock the sensation of having his wife and his son close to hand into his memory. He had the terrible sense that it was the last time he'd ever feel her touch. He felt both relief and sadness that Felsia was already gone. Bad enough that his son, too young to really understand what it all meant, had to see him in chains. He could not have stood his bright, beautiful girl seeing him that way. The other townspeople, men and women he had lived with, sharing air and water, and sorrow and rage, avoided the spectacle of his departure as if his guilt were an illness they might catch. He'd become a stranger to them. He might almost have preferred to have them condemn him. All I wanted was my freedom. All I wanted was my family with me, and not to lose another child to them. He was amazed and sick at heart that that had been too much to ask of the universe. Amos, his nominal guard, stood a respectful distance away, arms crossed and staring up at the sky, giving the family the space to say goodbye. Holden stood with Murtry and Carol, the triumvirate of power on Illus. They weren't looking at each other. They were there to take the sting off Murtry, exerting his control by pretending they were part of the decision. His life was a pawn in their political games. Nothing more. Just a couple more minutes, Chief, Amos said. A moment later came a high-altitude thunderclap. The Rosinante, dropping through the atmosphere faster than sound, descending on them all like the Angel of Judgment. It seemed unreal. I'm happy having you two here with me right now, he told Lucia. It wasn't even a lie. Find a way to come back to us, she said. I don't know what I can do. Find a way, she repeated, making each word its own sentence. You do that, Basia. Don't make me grow old on this world alone. Basia felt something thick blocking his throat, and he had trouble breathing around the pain in his stomach. If you need to find someone... I did, Lucia said. I found someone. Now he needs to find a way to come back to me. Basia didn't trust himself to speak, worried that if he opened his mouth it would turn into a sob. He didn't want Murtry to see that. So instead, he put his cuffed arms around Lucia and pulled her tight and squeezed until neither of them could breathe. Come back. She whispered one last time. Anything she might have said after that 
was drowned out by the roar of the Rosinante landing. A wall of dust blew past, stinging the bare skin on Bossia's neck. Lucia pressed her face into his chest, and Yasek clung to his back. Time to go, Amos shouted. Bossia let go of Lucia, hugged his boy to his chest one last time, the last time, maybe, and turned away from them both to board his prison. Welcome aboard, Mr. Merton, a tall, pretty woman said when the inner airlock door opened. She wore a simple jumpsuit of gray and black with the name Nagata stenciled over her breast pocket. Naomi Nagata, the executive officer of the Rosinante. She had long black hair pulled into a ponytail, the same way Falcia had worn hers when she was a young girl. On Naomi, it looked more like a functional choice than an aesthetic one. She didn't appear to be armed, and Basia felt himself relax a degree. He handed her the key to his restraints, and she unlocked them. Basia, please, he said as she worked. I'm just a welder. No one has ever called me Mr. Merton. Welder? Naomi asked. It didn't sound like she was making pleasantries. She took the restraints, rolled them into a ball, and secured them in a locker. Shipboard discipline, where any free object became a projectile during maneuvers. Because we always have a repair list. The compartment they stood in looked like a storage room laid on its side. The lockers ran parallel to the ground, rather than vertically, and there was a small hatch on either wall with what looked like a ladder running across the floor. Naomi tapped on a panel on one wall and said, Strapping in down here, Alex. Get us off this dust ball before my knees start leaking. A disembodied voice with a Martian Mariner Valley twang said, Roger that, boss. Up in thirty ticks. So get belted in. Naomi pulled on a strap on the floor and a seat folded out. It was designed so a person would have to lie on the floor on their back to put their butt on the seat. A variety of restraining belts folded out with it. She pointed at another strap in the floor and said, Better get with it. We lift in thirty seconds. Basia pulled out his own seat and awkwardly lay on the ground to get into the straps. Naomi helped him buckle in. The Martian voice counted down from five, and the floor lurched as the ship lifted off. There was a disorienting rotation, and the floor became a wall behind him, and he was actually sitting on the cushion he'd pulled out. He became very grateful for the straps holding him in place. Then a giant roared at the bottom of the ship, and an invisible hand crushed Bossia into his chair. Sorry, Naomi said, her voice given a false vibrato by the rumbling of the ship. Alex is an old combat pilot. He only flies at full speed. As always, when flying out of a gravity well, Bossia was surprised by how quickly it was over. A few minutes of crushing gravity and the roar of the engines. Then, with almost no transition at all, he was floating in his straps in silence. All done, Naomi said as she began unbuckling. Might be a few short maneuvering bumps as Alex gets us into the orbit he wants, but those yellow lights on the wall will flash fifteen seconds before any burn, so just grab a strap and hang on. Am I a prisoner? Bossia asked. What? I'm just wondering how this works. Am I restricted to my room, or is there a brig or something? Naomi floated for a moment, staring at him, forehead crinkling with what looked like genuine puzzlement. Are you a bad guy? Bad guy? Are you going to try to hurt anyone on this ship? Destroy our property? Steal things? Definitely not. Basia said. Because the way I heard it, you turned on your friends in order to save our captain's life. For a moment, Basia felt something like vertigo, and then pride, 
or the promise of it. And then he remembered the concussion of the heavy shuttle rattling him and Coop's voice. We all remember who mashed that button. He shook his head. Are you a bad guy? Naomi Nagata waited for him to speak, but he didn't have words for the guilt and shame and anger and sorrow. In time, she lifted a fist, the belter's physical idiom for a nod. He lifted his in reply. Make yourself at home. She pointed at the hatch to his right. That's aft. That way is the crew decks and the galley. The galley is open whenever. We've got a cabin set up for you. It's tiny, but private. If you keep going aft and hit the machine shop, you've gone too far. For safety reasons, don't go into the machine shop or engineering. Okay, I promise. Don't promise, just don't go in there. The other way, she pointed at the hatch on his left, takes you up to the ops deck. You can come up there if you want, but don't touch anything unless we tell you to. Okay. I'm headed up there right now. You're welcome to tag along. Okay. Naomi stared at him for a second, an unreadable expression on her face. You're not our first, you know. First? First prisoner transport, Naomi said. Jim has this thing about fair trials. It means that we've done our share of taking people to court, even when an airlock and mysteriously erased records made a lot more sense. Bossia couldn't stop himself from giving the airlock door a nervous look. Okay. And, she continued, you're the first one I can remember that he specifically told me to be nice to. He did? He owes you one. I do, too, Naomi said, then gestured at the ladder and the deck hatch in a you-first motion. Basia pulled himself up to the hatch and it whined open. Naomi pulled herself along behind him. So you can get comfortable. But the terrified mousy thing you're doing right now will bug the shit out of me. Okay. Still doing it. The deck above the storage and airlock area was a large compartment filled with gimbaled chairs and wall-mounted screens and control panels. A dark-skinned man with thinning black hair and a middle-aged beer belly was strapped into one of the chairs. He turned to face them as they floated into the room. All good? He asked Naomi. He was the source of the Mariner Valley voice. Seems to be, Naomi said, and pushed Basia into the closest chair, then strapped him in. He allowed it to happen, feeling like an infant being manhandled by his mother. Didn't get any face time with Jim. He wanted this fellow off the ground as fast as possible. Well, can't say I was looking to stay longer. I know, gravity wells, Naomi said with a shudder. I don't know how people live like that. I was thinking more about the bugs all coming back to life. I got five more power spikes since the last time we checked. I was trying not to think about those. Should have gotten hold in an Amos both. Alex said. And anyone else with sense. Just keep an eye. If anything gets close, I want them to know about it. Once she'd finished belting him in, Naomi floated over to a different chair and pulled herself into it. She began calling up screens and tapping on them faster than Bossia could follow, still talking to the Martian man as she worked. Alex, she said. Meet Bossia Merton, the welder. Welder? Alex raised his eyebrows and grinned. We got a pile of shit on the to-do list with Amos vacationing on the surface. Bossia opened his mouth to reply, but Naomi said, Bossia, meet Alex Kamal, our pilot, and the solar system's worst vacuum welder. Hello, Bossia said. Hello back. Alex said, then turned to Naomi. Hey, while I'm thinking about it, you were right about that shuttle. 
Yeah? Naomi pushed off her chair and floated over to look at the screen next to Alex. He scrolled through what looked like video on Fast Forward for a few seconds. See there? Alex said, pausing it. They detach it and park it a few hundred meters from the Israel, then send an engineering team out. They're inside for a couple of hours, then back to the Israel. It hasn't moved out of that orbit since. They're doing all the shuttle runs with the other one, Naomi said, pulling up video on a second screen and fast-forwarding through it. I knew it. Yeah, you're very clever. Want to keep the scopes recording that, or do I aim them at the bugs? The shuttle. Naomi replied after a few more seconds of moving back and forth through the video. Basia knew he'd been invited to sit with them. And it appeared they were talking about monitoring the RCE ship, which didn't strike him as a personal conversation. But he couldn't help but feel a bit out of place like an eavesdropper on a private moment. It was the comfortable shorthand the two members of the Rosinante's crew had. They sounded like family discussing household matters. It was unsettling to think they were the only three people on the ship. It was too large, too empty. He didn't want to be alone in the silence of an unfamiliar ship, but staying felt wrong, too. Basia cleared his throat. Should I go to my cabin? Do you want to? Naomi asked without looking at him. There is nothing to do in there. It's not even one of the ones with its own video display. All the good cabins are taken by crew. You can get access to the ship's library from there, Alex said, pointing at the screen closest to Basia. If you're bored. I'm scared as shit, Basia said, without knowing ahead of time he was going to. Alex and Naomi both turned to look at him. The Martian's face was kind. He said, Yeah, I bet. But nothing bad is gonna happen to you here. Until the captain says otherwise, treat this like home. If you want to be alone, we can... No. Basia shook his head. No, but you're talking to each other like I'm not here, so I thought... He shrugged. Sorry. We've been together enough years we almost don't need to talk anymore, Naomi said. I think the Israel has weaponized one of its shuttles. We've been monitoring the ship, and the activity around one shuttle was suspicious. I think they turned it into a bomb. W why would they do that? Because, Alex answered, that's an unarmed science ship, and they flew into what they seem to see as a war zone. That shuttle could be used to attack another ship like a guided missile, or maybe as a bomb to flatten the colony. They want to attack you? Basia asked. Why would they do that? Wasn't the Rosinante and her crew here to solve the conflict? I doubt it. Naomi said. More likely the Barba Piccola, if she tries to break orbit and run. <laughs> yeah, Alex said with a laugh. The Israel takes a swing at us. It'll be the shortest dogfight in history. First landing. They could flatten the colony? Basia said. They don't know that. You should warn them. My family is still down there. Trust me. Naomi said, That won't happen. Now that we know, we'll keep an eye on that shuttle, and if it moves, we can stop it. Should probably tell the boss, though, Alex said. Yeah. Naomi tracked through the video a few more times, then shut it off. Alex unbuckled his restraint and pushed off toward the ladder. Or, shit, Exo. I can take care of it right now. I had the Rossi go over the shuttle specs and calculate a railgun shot that'll cut her damn reactor in half. Naomi stopped him with a shake of her hand. No. Just once I'd like to find a solution that doesn't involve blowing something up. Alex shrugged. 
Your call. Naomi floated quietly for a moment, then seemed to come to a decision and hit the comm panel. After a few seconds, Jim Holden's voice said, Holden here. Jim, I've got a problem and a solution I need to run past you. I like that we already have a solution, Holden replied. Basia could hear the smile in his voice. Two solutions, Alex called out. I've got a solution, too. We've been watching the Israel like you asked, Naomi said. And Alex and I agree that the probability is high they've weaponized one of the two light shuttles. They're keeping it powered down and in a matching orbit about 500 meters from the big ship. I think it's a last-ditch weapon to use if the barb tries to run, but that doesn't mean they couldn't use it on the colony, as unlikely as that seems. You haven't met this Mertry character running RCE security, Holden said. Or it would seem pretty damn likely. What's our best course of action? We get everyone off the planet, go back home, and spend a few decades doing unmanned exploration before we even think of coming back, Naomi said. Agreed, Holden said. And what are we actually going to do? I figure you'd want us to take care of it. Alex thinks he can gut it with a railgun shot, but that seems like a pretty obvious escalation to me. Shooting Gauss rounds past the Israel, I mean. Things are escalating just fine on their own, Holden said. But we'll keep that option on the table for now. What else? Naomi pulled herself closer to the comm panel and lowered her voice, as though the console were Holden himself, and she was about to deliver bad news. I take an EVA pack, fly over to the shuttle, and plant a cutout on the drive. If they run system checks... Everything will come back functional, but if they try to move the shuttle, I can kill it remotely. No explosions, just a dead shuttle. That seems risky, Holden said. Riskier than flinging railgun shots through its reactor? Not really, no. Riskier than leaving it out there and armed? Oh, hell no. Okay, Naomi, this is your call. One way or the other, I want that threat off the board. We have enough shit to worry about down here. Naomi smiled at the comm panel. One dead shuttle coming up. She shut off the connection with a sigh. Basia looked from one to the other of them, scowling. Why? Why what? Naomi asked lightly. Why would you act directly against RCE? Aren't you supposed to be mediators? Neutral? Why take any action at all when you can stay out of it? Her smile had depth and complexity. Basia had the feeling she'd heard a more profound question than the one he'd meant to ask. Choosing to stand by while people kill each other is also an action, she said. We don't do that here. Chapter 22 Havelock Havelock's system filtered the news feeds from Seoul, and it was still damned weird thinking from Seoul for four topics. New Terra, James Holden, contract security, and European League football. Strapped in his office crash couch, he tapped through the feed summaries. Changes to compensation schedule regulations tip the balance toward Earth-based contract security. Star Helix to protest. He deleted it. Earthman's Burden. Fifty famous Earthers who switched sides for the OPA. Holden was number 41. Havelock deleted it. Los Blancos defeat Bayern 1-0. Havelock raised his eyebrows and put the highlights reel in his viewing queue. Increased violence on New Terra. UN and OPA react. Mars positioning with OPA. Havelock felt his belly go tight. The feed came from an intelligence analysis service 
with contacts in the governments of all three major powers. He opened it. This is Nasser Maxwell with Forecast Analytics, and this proprietary feed is intended solely for use by the subscribers and partners of Forecast Analytics. Any other distribution is in violation of MCR and UN intellectual property statutes and is subject to prosecution. Intelligence reports from the UN indicate that the violence on New Terra has escalated. The security forces of Royal Charter Energy discovered a new potential attack, and in thwarting it, killed between seven and sixteen local insurgents. Reaction from the OPA to the attack itself has been muted, but the RCE and United Nations forces will be announcing this afternoon that a relief mission will be launched for New Terra. Initial reports suggest this will be a joint task force with both corporate assets and United Nations military escort. Representatives of the OPA have not responded to this plan, but are on record as being willing to use military force to control traffic through Medina Station. Given the tactical constraints of the ring gates, forecast analytics projects the possibility of a modest OPA military force being able to effectively blockade the UN and RCE efforts. Sources close to the Martian Congress speaking with forecast analytics under condition of anonymity have suggested that the Martian government would support the OPA's action. Analysis suggests that this is not evidence of a long-term amity between the OPA and Mars, but a tactical alliance intended to forestall the UN and Earth Luna corporate structures from establishing a greater foothold in these new worlds. Given the time it will take a UN and RCE group to be assembled and make the journey to Medina Station, we predict that the situation on New Terra will be evolving without immediate physical involvement from in-system players for the foreseeable future and the greater question of how traffic through the gates will be regulated will be a source of high-level tension and probable military action in the coming months and years. Havelock scratched his ear. Prior experience told him that forecast analytics was usually about a day ahead of the mainline non-proprietary feeds, which would mean that in about thirty hours, they'd be getting flooded with news and opinion pieces about themselves from people who'd never been farther than the Jovian system. Even if it only changed the stories that the people downstairs were telling about themselves, it could make things even worse. If the squatters knew there were more RCE ships coming, even if they weren't going to be here for years, maybe they'd get even more desperate. Or maybe Mars getting in bed with the OPA would make them think they had support back home. Either way, nothing good could come of it. Havelock wished there was a way to shut down the communication to the ring, just as a way to keep the dramatics of national politics contained. Things were screwed up enough without getting the professional class screw-ups at the UN involved. More than they already were, anyway. At least they hadn't picked up on the UN-OPA mediator deciding the planet was full of boo jams and was telling everyone to run away and hide under their blankets. Or, on second thought, maybe it would have been better if they had. It would be a distraction, anyway. His hand terminal squawked, and he accepted the connection. I think we are about ready. Chief Engineer Conan said. I'll be right there, Havelock replied, releasing the couch straps. He pushed off toward the door and hauled himself hand over hand toward the airlock. He slid into the storage deck where his little militia was waiting, his brain arbitrarily deciding that the bank of lockers was down, the airlock door up. Human brains needed an answer even if they had to make up something they knew was bullshit. A dozen people floated in the space. Havelock started talking to them as he lifted his own vacuum suit out of the locker at his feet. 
Good to see you today, team. So we're going to do a practice breaching. It's going to be a lot like last time, except this time we're going to have a squad that's trying to stop you. One of the men at the back shook a paint gun and hooted. The others around him laughed. Havelock pulled on the vacuum suit and started working the seals. He left the helmet off for the moment so that he could speak through the free air. Do we have teams set up? I'm taking Alpha and Beta, Conan said. Figured you could lead the Gamma on attack. That works, Havelock said. He shifted his paintball gun from side to side, getting a feel for its mass. You have the emergency airlock? Here, one of the Beta teams said, twisting to show his backpack. The bright yellow box held a bubble of adhesive-backed polymer bound to a second sheet that was fitted with a seal and an inflating tank the size of Havelock's thumb. Laid out properly on the hull of a ship, it would look like a hemispherical blister and contain up to two atmospheres of pressure indefinitely, or eight for a full tenth of a second. Havelock wasn't actually going to let the engineers cut through the hull of the Israel, but he was going to make sure they could get everything ready up to the moment when they'd fire up the torch welders. All right, he said. Now before we get out there, remember we're on the outside of a ship, and the shuttle is on the planet. The chances of your drifting to where we can't get you back are non-zero. The little bit of joking and whispering stopped. Havelock looked through the room, making eye contact with several of them, as if his gaze were enough to make them safe. All these suits have mag boots, he said. They only work for a few centimeters, so they'll keep you against the ship, but they won't pull you back to it. For that, you have the grapnel lines. You've all trained with those. A murmur of general assent answered him. All right. If you're drifting, the grapnel line will adhere to any metal surface on the hull. They've got their own propellant, so there won't be any kick. Do not, under any circumstances, pass through or stop in any of the areas marked in red. Those are maneuvering thruster outlets, and while we aren't planning to make any adjustments, don't assume it. We're not doing this to lose anyone else. If you get out there and you start feeling too hot, or like there's something wrong with your air feed, you're probably having a panic attack. Just let me or the chief know, and we'll pause the exercise and get you inside. If you start feeling wonderful and powerful, and like you've seen the face of God, you're having a euphoric attack, and those are more dangerous than the panic. You aren't going to want to tell us about those, but you have to, all right? A ragged chorus of, Sir, yes, sir, echoed through the room. Havelock tried to think of what else he should say. He didn't want to insult their intelligence, but he didn't want anything to go wrong either. In the end, he shrugged, fastened the helmet, and gave the order through the exercise frequency. Alpha and beta teams, into the lock. You've got thirty minutes. There were three exercise-specific settings on the suit radio. One was open to all the people going out. One was just for Havelock's team, and the last was between him and Conan. The mom-and-pop channel, the chief engineer called it. Havelock opened all the channels, but all he could hear was the banter of his own group. The chief and his men weren't transmitting. After ten minutes, Havelock switched to the mom-and-pop channel. Okay, he said. We're coming out. There was a crackle as the chief switched. That wasn't thirty minutes. I know, Havelock said, and the chief chuckled. Okay, thank you for the heads up. I won't give it away. Astronomy had never been a particular interest of Havelock's, and living in a ship or station, he'd seen actual stars less often than he did in his childhood on Earth. The starscape around New Terra was beautiful, 
familiar and unfamiliar at the same time. The few constellations he knew, Orion, Ursa Major, weren't there, but he still looked for them. The bright smear of the galactic disk was still part of the sky, and the local sun could pass for Sol, more or less, anyway. New Terra's ring of tiny moons caught the light, their low albedo making them hardly more than the stars behind them. The Edward Israel was moving at something like 8,000 kilometers a minute. That this stillness masked a velocity that was orders of magnitude faster than a rifle shot was intellectual knowledge. What he felt was motionless. He stood on the skin of the ship, rooted by his mag boots, shifting gently like seaweed on the ocean floor. To his right, New Terra's Terminator seemed to inch across its vast ocean. To his right, the shuttle stood half a kilometer out, looking small and forlorn against the vast night. His strike force stood around him, craning their necks in awe of the massive emptiness all around. He was almost sorry to pull his attention back to the small, vaguely intimate necessities of violence. He checked to be sure he was speaking on the channel exclusive to his group. All right. Their target area for setting up the emergency lock is aft of the main storage area. We're going around clockwise. In ten minutes, we'll be moving into Eclipse. If we come up from between the primary maneuvering thrusters and hangar bay, we should have the sun behind us. So let's get moving. The small chorus of excited yes-sirs told him they liked the idea. Coming out of the sun, raining death on the enemy. It was a pretty enough plan. The only things that kept it from happening were their unfamiliarity with the mag boots and the fact that Conan had placed the emergency airlock a hundred meters farther away than Havelock had expected. The bright moment passed, and the sun shifted behind New Terra, where it would stay for almost twenty minutes. Okay, Havelock said. Plan B. Everyone turn off your helmet lights. What about the indicators on our external batteries, sir? We're going to have to hope they're dim enough that... One of the engineers to his left raised a paint gun and turned it on himself. The muzzle flash was like a spark. What the hell are you doing? Havelock demanded. I figured if I got some paint on the indicator light, I could... The man began... But it was too late. Conan's men had seen the muzzle flash. Havelock tried to get his forces to hunker down close to the skin of the ship and fire across the ship's shallow horizon, but they kept rising up to see if they'd struck anything. In less than a minute, the last of his men reported an enemy hit, and Havelock called the exercise to a halt. The massive, dark bulk of the planet was almost above them now the sunlight a soft ring where the atmosphere scattered it. The two groups gathered. The airlock was only half attached, and three of his team's paintballs had smeared it. Two of the chief engineer's boarding party had been hit. The rest were elated. Havelock set his team and the wounded of the opposition to clean up, and the disgraced soldiers started repacking the airlock. Nice work, Havelock said on the mom-and-pop channel. Conan grunted. His arms were crossed awkwardly over his chest, the bulk of the suit defying the pose. Havelock frowned, not that anyone could see him. Something the matter, Chief? You know, the chief engineer said. I don't mind that the Israel has her own engineering crew. I understand that we've got separate mandates, but we're working with the same equipment and supplies, and as a courtesy, I would like to be kept in the loop when the ship crew are sending out a team. Okay, Havelock said. I can talk to them when we get in. Is it something that's been happening often? It's happening right now, the chief said, pointing out into the darkness. 
It took Havelock a moment to see it. A flicker where no flicker should be. The weaponized shuttle brightened and dimmed. A welding torch, half a click away in the darkness. Panic felt strange in Null G, the blood flowing away from his hands and feet. Do you have enhanced magnification on your helmet? Havelock asked. Yeah, the chief said. Could you take a look at who's out there? The chief engineer bent back. The surface of his helmet glittered for a moment, the HUD taking over. Red EVA suit. Got a decent-sized pack on it, too. Long-distance travel and a welding kit. Havelock said something obscene, then switched to the all-group channel. Everyone stop. We have a problem. There's someone at the shuttle over there, and he isn't one of ours. For a moment, no one spoke. Then one of the militiamen, his voice calm and matter-of-fact, said, Let's go kick his ass. It was exactly not what Havelock wanted to do. If the enemy had a rifle, he could pick half the team off before they got close. Even then, they had paint guns. But the alternative was to let whoever they were do whatever they were doing to the only ace up the Israel sleeve. Okay, Havelock said. Here's the plan. Everyone sync up with the ship's computer. We're going to let the Israel calculate our burns. Turn off the mag boots. He plucked out his hand terminal, fed in the emergency security override, and coded in his request. Their vacuum suits had more than enough propellant to get them all to the shuttle and back again, provided nobody missed or tried to do something clever. Above them, the penumbra around New Terra grew lopsided, the sun preparing to re-emerge, another tiny dawn. The computer announced the burns were ready. Okay, Havelock said. These are the bad guys. We don't know how many there are. We don't know how they're armed. So we're going to try to scare them off. Everyone get your gun at the ready. Look threatening. And don't fire. If they figure out our guns aren't real, we may be in for a bad time. Sir? One of the men said. You remember we're covered with target paint, right? Before Havelock could answer, the thrusters started, pushing compressed gas out behind them like a fog and smoke. All their suits rose together into the night, or else fell. The acceleration pushed the blood into Havelock's legs, and the suit squeezed, pressing it back. It wasn't even a full G. It was hardly a third but it felt like something much, much faster, much more dangerous. Now that he knew to look for it, the welding flicker was obvious. It didn't stop. The main burn cut out, and the suits rotated, starting the breaking burn. The perfect synchronicity meant the Israel was still coordinating them. This time, the intruder saw them. The welding torch died. Havelock looked down between his feet, his paint gun centered between his toes, waiting for the bullets to start streaming out and praying that they wouldn't. They didn't. It's working! One of the men shouted. Motherfucker's running away! And there it was, a red EVA suit on the skin of the shuttle. It struggled with something, looked up toward Havelock and his militia descending upon him, and turned back. Whoever it was, there was only one of them. The braking thrust stuttered. They were almost at the shuttle now. Fifty meters, forty, thirty. Havelock opened a standard general response channel. Attention, unidentified welder! You will stand down! The red suit stood, the EVA suit firing off. The person lifted at a ninety-degree angle, not going directly away from them, but diving down toward the planetary surface and whatever lower orbit would mean a safe rendezvous. Havelock felt the relief flooding him. They weren't shooting. His HUD promised him that the shuttle's basic functions 
were unchanged. It hadn't been set to detonate. And the militia boys weren't in charge of their own burns, so they wouldn't be taking off after the intruder. He had underestimated them. The first dark thread rose out toward the intruder and missed. But once the whole team had seen the grapnel fire, the idea was out there. A half dozen grapnels fired, their propellant flaring blue and orange as they flew like tiny missiles toward the fleeing welder. Then one made contact. The enemy and the man who'd fired the grapnel both jerked, and the engineer's suit started an emergency burn, trying to compensate. With the enemy encumbered and slowed, two more grapnels connected. Soon, five of his people had lines attached to the saboteur, their collected thrusters holding the red suit's EVA pack in check. Havelock took control of his suit back from the Israel and dropped down toward the planet and the prisoner. The red suit was twisting now, trying to bring its welding torch to bear on the lines. Havelock raised his gun, and the enemy paused. He was close enough now that he could see the face behind the helmet. A belter woman, dark-skinned, with wavy dark hair clinging to her sweaty forehead. Her expression was pure chagrin. He opened the general channel again. Hi, he said. Don't panic. My name's Havelock. I'm acting security chief for the Edward Israel, and you have to come with me now. Interlude The Investigator It reaches out, it reaches out, it reaches out, it reaches out. One hundred and thirteen times a second it reaches out, and the things it finds are not the signal that would let it end, but they are tools and it explores then without knowing it is exploring them, like water finding its mindless way through a bed of pebbles it reaches out. What it can move, it moves. What it can open, it opens. What it can close, it closes. A vast network, ancient and dead, begins to appear, and it reaches into it. The parts of it that can think struggle to make sense of it. Parts of it dream of a mummified body, its dry heart pumping dust through petrified veins. Not everything responds, but it reaches out, presses, moves. And some things move back. Old artifacts awaken or don't. None of them are what it seeks. None ever will be. It experiments without awareness of experimenting, and a landscape begins to form. It is not a physical landscape, but a logical one. This connects to this connects to this. It builds a model, and it adds to the model it already has, and does not know it has done so. It reaches out. One hundred thirteen times a second it reaches out. Something that worked once stops working. It reaches out, and what answered before answers less now. Something burns, or fails, or tries to rise up and breaks. Part of the map goes dark, dies, and it reaches out to the silent dead. Part of it feels frustration, but it is not aware of that part, and it reaches out. Part of it wants to scream, wants to die, wants to vomit, though a mouth it imagines has been transformed into something else for years now. It does not experience these things, though parts of it do. It reaches out. And it pulls back. It is unaware of pulling back, but one time out of every seventeen million attempts, it touches something and will not touch it again. It is not aware of pulling back, because it is not aware of anything but the failures accrue. A blank place forms an emptiness. A void. A void. Jesus, an old woman thinks, now with the puns. The map is not physical, but it has a shape. It is a model of part of the universe. 
it becomes more detailed, more concrete. Some things come alive and then die. Some do not answer ever. Some become tools, and it uses the tools to reach out, except not there. The emptiness gains definition, too. With every failed connection, with every pulling back, its liminal borders become better defined. It struggles to make sense of the shape of the nothing that defies it. The structures of the minds that never died within it struggle with it. It is a cyst. It is a negative space, a taboo. It is a question that must not be asked. It is not aware that it thinks these things. It is not aware that the space exists, that when it reaches into that place, it dies. It does not need to be aware of the problem. It has a tool for this, a thing that finds what is missing, a tool for asking questions that shouldn't be asked. For going too far, the investigator considers the cyst, the shadow, the space where nothing is. That right there? The investigator thinks. Yeah, where I come from, we'd call that a clue. Chapter 23 Holden Come on. Holden said to the empty desert and the man who wasn't there. You show up every time I don't want you around, but I get something I want to talk to you about, and nothing. The thing that had been Miller didn't answer. Holden sighed, hoped, and waited. Illus had lost some of its strangeness. The moonless sky still felt too dark, but no darker than a new moon on Earth. His nose had become accustomed to the planet's strange scents. Now it just smelled like night and the aftermath of rain. His growing familiarity was both comforting and sad. Humans would go out to the thousand worlds of the gate network. They would settle down in little towns like First Landing, then spread out and build farms and cities and factories, because that's what humans did. And in a few centuries, most of those worlds would be very similar to Earth. The frontier would give way to the civilizations that followed it, remaking it in the image of their original home. Holden had grown up in the Montana district of North America, a region filled with nostalgia for lost frontiers. It had held out against urban creep longer than most places in the former United States. The people there clung to their farms and ranches, even when those things stopped making economic sense. And because of that, Holden couldn't help but feel the allure of the untamed place, the romantic notion of sights no one else had seen, ground no one else had walked. This new frontier would last throughout Holden's lifetime, conquering and taming a thousand-plus planets was the work of generations, no matter how much of a head start the proto-molecules masters had given them. But in his heart, Holden knew that conquered and tamed they would be, and then there would be a thousand Earths with steel and glass cities covering them. Holden felt a shadow of that distant future's loss of mystery as though it were his own. In the moonless black sky, a star moved too quickly. One of the ships, the Israel or the Barba Piccola. The Rosinante was too small and too black to reflect the light. Did the people up there think about how momentous what they were all doing was? Holden worried that they didn't. That the strangeness had already become normal, like the night sense of Illus. That all they saw now was the conflict to be won and the treasure to be harvested. With a sigh, Holden turned back toward the town and started walking. Amos would be wondering where he was. Carol, the town administrator, had asked for an after-dinner meeting, so he needed to track her down, too. A fat, dog-shaped thing with a bullfrog's head 
walked in front of him and made a sound like boots crunching on gravel. Mimic lizards, the locals called them. They were sort of scaled like a lizard, but to Holden, the limbs looked all wrong. Holden took out his hand terminal and used it to shine a faint light on the creature. It blinked up at him and made the gravel noise again. You'd be a good pet if you didn't vomit your stomach up periodically, Holden said, crouching down to get a better look at the creature. It croaked back at him. Nothing like the words he'd used, but a surprisingly good imitation of his voice and tones. He wondered if the animals could be taught to speak words like a parrot. The terminal in his hand buzzed. The lizard skittered away, buzzing back at him over its shoulder. Holden here. Yeah, Cap, Alex said. I got some bad news. Bad like the zero-G toilet on the Rossi is out of order, or bad like I should be looking at the sky for incoming missile trails. Well, Alex started, then took a long breath. Holden looked up at the sky. Just stars. You've got me scared now. Spit it out. Naomi. Alex started, and Holden felt his heart drop. She was out installing the remote cutout on the shuttle, and they were doing some kind of group exercise on the outside of the Israel, and they spotted her. Just dumb luck, really. What happened? Is she okay? Please be okay. They got her, Cap. Alex said. Holden felt his chest go empty. Got her. Like, shot her? Oh, no. Captured. She's not hurt. The security guy on the Israel called to make sure I knew she was unharmed. But they're calling it sabotage. And they locked her up. F Fuck. Holden said, able to breathe again. He knew who'd have authorized that. Murtry. And now that the RCE security chief had a big bargaining chip, he'd go all in. Does anyone else know? Well, Amos called up here looking for her a minute ago. Holden didn't hear the rest of what Alex said, because he was already running toward town. The longer he ran without hearing gunfire the more hopeful he became that Amos had realized the sensitivity of the situation, had decided to wait and consult with his captain before taking any action. He hoped Amos wasn't already on the radio with the Israel and a pistol held to Murtry's head demanding Naomi's safe return. He was half right. When he burst into Murtry's security office, he found the RCE security chief pressed to one wall with Amos's left hand around his throat and a pistol against his forehead. At least no one had called the Israel with demands, likely because Amos didn't have a free hand to dial. In addition to Murtry and Amos, four RCE security personnel stood around the room with drawn sidearms, pointed at Amos's back. One of them, a raven-haired woman named Wei, said, Drop the gun or we'll shoot. Okay, Amos said with a shrug. Blast away, sweetie. I guarantee I'd take this piece of shit with me. I'm good. You good? He leaned closer to Murtry, punctuating the question with a jab of the pistol against his forehead. A little trickle of blood had started to run down Murtry's face from the force of the barrel pressed against it. Murtry smiled. Keep barking, dog. We both know there's no bite coming. You shoot me, she's dead. You won't know, Amos said. Don't, Amos, Holden ordered. Oh, do, Murtry said, the words almost a whisper. Holden held his breath, sure the next thing they heard would be a gunshot. Amos surprised him by not firing. Instead, he leaned in even farther until his nose was touching Murtry's and said, I'm gonna kill you. When? 
Murtry replied. That is exactly the question that should stay on your mind, Amos said and let the man go. Holden started breathing again with a gasp. I've got this, Amos. The big mechanic holstered his gun to Holden's relief, but made no move to leave. Seriously, I've got it. I need you to go back to the rooms and get on the line with Alex. Get me a full report. I'll be back there in a minute. For a moment, Holden thought Amos would argue with him. The mechanic stared back, face flushed with rage, his jaw clenched hard enough to crack his teeth. Okay, he finally said, and then left. The other four security people kept their guns trained on him the entire time. That was smart, Murtry said. He pulled a tissue out of a box on his desk and wiped the blood from his forehead. He had an ugly bruise forming around the cut Amos's pistol had left. Your boy almost didn't make it out of this room, mediator. Holden surprised himself by laughing. I've never seen Amos pick a fight he didn't plan to win. I'm not sure what he had in mind, but even at five to one, my money would be on him. Everyone loses eventually, Murtry said. Words to live by. That's quite the killer you have working for you, as critical as you are of my methods. There's a difference. Amos is willing to lose face to protect something he loves. He doesn't need to win more than he needs to keep his friends alive. And that's why you're nothing alike. Murtry agreed with a nod and a shrug. So if you weren't here to save your man, then what? We keep escalating, Holden said. Some of that is my fault. I asked Naomi to deal with the shuttle. Sabotage, Murtry started. But I did that in response to finding out you'd weaponized it. We keep reacting to what the person before us did, justifying ourselves like kids on a playground. He started it. So you'll be the first to break the cycle? If I can, Holden said. You've gone too far, Murtry. Disable the shuttle. Give me Naomi back. Let's see if we can find a way to stop the escalation. Murtry's vague smile shifted into an equally vague frown. The man leaned back on his desk and touched another tissue to the cut on his forehead. It came away with a single crimson spot. Then he folded his arms, casual but immovable. Holden knew that it was a deliberate affectation intended to look natural. He was both impressed and worried by anyone who had that level of self-awareness and control. I've acted entirely within the purview of my assignment here, Murtry said. I've protected RCE assets and personnel. You've killed a bunch of colonists and kidnapped my XO, Holden replied, trying to keep the anger out of his voice and failing. I've killed fewer squatters than they've killed of us all of which were actively engaged in plotting and carrying out attacks on RCE assets and personnel, which, as I said, is my job. And Naomi? And I captured a saboteur, and am holding her pending an investigation. Kidnapping is not only a provocative term, it's inaccurate. You want this to blow up? Holden sighed. You can't wait for the next chance to make things worse, can you? The frown shifted back to the smile. Neither meant anything. Just different masks. Holden wondered what it looked like inside Murtry's head and shuddered. I've done the minimum necessary at each step, the man said through his disquieting grin. No, Holden replied. You could have left. You had the Israel. After the first attack on the shuttle, you could have pulled your people out and waited for the investigation. A lot of people would still be alive if you had. 
Oh, no, Murtry said, shaking his head. He stood up and uncrossed his arms, every movement slow and deliberate and conveying threat. No, that's one thing we won't do. We won't give up a centimeter of ground. These squatters can throw themselves against us until every one of them is shattered into dust. But we're not going anywhere. Because that, Murtry's smile sharpened, is also my job. The walk from the RCE security shed back to his room at the community center wasn't a long one, but it was very dark. Miller's faint blue glow illuminated nothing, but it was oddly comforting anyway. Hey, old man, Holden said in greeting. We need to talk. Miller grinned at his own joke. He made jokes now. He was almost like a real person. Somehow, that was more frightening than when he'd been insane. I know, but I'm kind of busy with keeping these people from killing each other. Or, you know, us. How's that working for you? Terrible, Holden admitted. I've just lost the only real threat I had to make. Yeah, Naomi being on their ship makes the Rosinante a non-factor. Letting her anywhere near that ship was a dumb mistake. I never told you about that. Should I pretend I'm not inside your head? Miller asked with a belter shrug. I'll do it if it makes you feel more comfortable. Hey, Miller, Holden said. What am I thinking now? Points for creativity, kid. That'd be difficult to pull off, and less fun than you might expect. So, stay out. Miller stopped walking and grabbed Holden's upper arm. Again, he was surprised at how real it felt. Miller's hand felt like iron gripping him. Holden tried to pull away and couldn't, and all of it was just the ghost pushing buttons in his brain. Wasn't kidding. We need to talk. Spit it out, Holden replied, finally yanking his arm away when Miller let go. There's a spot, away north of here, I need to go look at. By which you mean you need me to go look at. Yeah, Miller said with a belter nod of one fist. That. Against his will, Holden felt his curiosity piqued. What is it? So, turns out our coming here caused a little ruckus with the locals, Miller said. May have noticed. Lot of leftover stuff waking up all over the planet. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you about that. Is that you? Can you control it? Are you kidding? I'm a suck puppet. Proto-molecules got its arm so far up my ass, I can taste its fingernails. Miller laughed. I can't even control myself. It's just that some of it seems dangerous. That robot, for instance? And you were able to turn off the station in the slow zone. Because it wanted me to. You can order the sun to come up if you time it right. I'm not driving this bus. Making it do what I want would be like talking someone out of a seizure. Okay, Holden said. We have got to get off this planet. Before that, though, there's this thing. This not thing. Look. I've got a pretty good map of the global network. Lots of leftover stuff coming up, checking in, except one spot, like a big ball of nothing. Holden shrugged. Maybe it's just a place where there are no nodes on the network. Kid, this whole planet is a node on the network. There shouldn't be any place that's off limits to me. So what does it mean? Maybe it's just a spot that's really 
really broken. Miller said, That'd be interesting, but useless. And the useful thing? It's a leftover bit of whatever killed this place. They stood in silence for a moment, the cool evening wind of Illus ruffling Holden's pants and not affecting the detective at all. Holden felt a chill start at the base of his spine and slowly climb his back. The hairs on his arms stood up. I don't want to find that, he finally said. And I do, Miller replied with his best attempt at a friendly smile. Free will left the conversation for me a while back. But that's where the clues are. You should come with. It's going to happen eventually anyway. Why is that? Because real monsters don't go away when you close your eyes. Because you need to know what happened here just as bad as I do. Miller's expression was still friendly, but there was a dread in it, too. A fear that Holden recognized and shared. Naomi first. I don't go anywhere until we get her back. Miller nodded again and flew apart into a spray of blue fireflies. Amos was waiting for him when he got back to the bar. The big man sitting alone at a table with a half-empty bottle of something that smelled like antiseptic and smoke. I'm guessing you didn't kill him after I left, Amos said as Holden sat down. I feel like I'm walking a tightrope so narrow I can't even see it. Holden replied. He shook his head when Amos offered him the bottle, so the mechanic took a long swig from it instead. This ends in blood, Amos said after a moment. His voice sounded distant, dreamlike. No way around that. Well, since my job is pretty much exactly the opposite of that, I hope you're wrong. I'm not. Holden lacked a compelling argument, so instead he said, What did Alex have to say? We put together a list of demands for the captain of the Israel. Make sure Naomi gets well taken care of while she's there. What will he give up in exchange? Alex isn't blowing the Israel into its component atoms right this second. I hope they agree we're being generous. He is, however, Amos continued, keeping a constant railgun lock on the Israel's reactor. Holden ran his fingers through his hair. So, not too generous, then. Say pretty please but carry a one-kilo slug of tungsten accelerated to a detectable percentage of C. I believe I've heard that said, Holden replied, then stood up. He suddenly felt very tired. I'm going to bed. Naomi's in Murtry's goddamn brig, and you can sleep? Amos said and took another drink. No, but I can go to bed. Then tomorrow... I'm going to figure out how to get my first officer back from the RCE maniac holding her hostage so that I can go find the scary alien bullet fragment embedded in the planet. Amos nodded, as if that all made sense. Nothing in the afternoon, then. Chapter 24 Elvi Elvi slept, and she dreamed. In her dream, she was back on Earth, which was also the corridors of the Edward Israel. A sense of urgency pressed at her, shifting quickly toward dread. Something was on fire somewhere, because she hadn't turned in the right forms. She had to file the forms before everything burned. She was in the bursar's office at the university, and Governor Trying was there, too. Only he was waiting for his death certificate and it was taking too long. She couldn't submit her forms. She looked at the onion-skin papers, trying to find the submission deadline, but the words kept changing. First, the line at the bottom read, L.V. Okoy, lead researcher and argonaut, 
and the next time she read it, fines to be paid directly at the temple, rabbits and hogs. The urgency pushed at her, and when she shouted, the onion skin started coming apart in her fingers. She tried to press the forms back together, but they wouldn't go. Someone touched her shoulder, and it was James Holden, only he looked like someone else. Younger, darker, but she knew it was him. She realized she'd been naked this whole time. She was embarrassed, but also a little pleased. His hand touched her breast and... Elvi, wake up! Her eyes opened, the lids heavy and slow. Her eyes struggled to focus. She didn't know where she was, only that some bastard was interrupting something she didn't want interrupted. The dark lines before her slowly became familiar, the roof of her hut. She shifted, reaching out for someone, but already uncertain who. She was alone in her bed. Her hand terminal glowed dimly. Her analysis equipment flickered as data from her work flew up and out, through the vast darkness to the Ring and Medina station, to Earth, and answering information flew back out to her, which was all fine and as it should be, so why the hell was she awake? A soft knock came at the door, and Fiez's voice. Elvi, wake up! You've got to see this! Elvi yawned so deeply, her jaw ached with it. She pulled herself up to sitting. The dream was already fading quickly. There had been something about a fire, and someone touching her, whom she had badly wanted to be touched by. The details lost all coherence as she sat up and reached for her robe. Elvi, are you there? When she spoke, her words were slow, heavy, a little slurred. If this isn't important, I will rip your throat open and piss down your lungs. Fayez laughed. There were other voices behind his. Sudyam saying something too low to make out the words. Ema Chapel, the geochemistry lead, too. Elvi paused, threw off the robe, and pulled on her real clothes and work boots to go with them. When she stepped out of her hut, a dozen of the people in the research teams were standing in pairs or small groups all across the night-dark plain. They were all looking up. And in the high darkness, something larger than a star glowed a sullen red. Fayez, squatting on the ground, glanced over at her. What is that? Elvi asked, her voice instinctively low, as if she might startle it. One of the moons. She stepped forward, her neck back, scowling up at the night. What's it doing? Melting. Why? Right? Fayez said, standing up. Sudyam, to their left, raised her voice. Makes you wish we'd sent probes there, doesn't it? We're one ship, and this is a whole damn planet, Fayez said. Plus which, we've been focusing a lot of effort on killing each other. Point being? Sudyam asked. Fayez spread his hands wide. We've been busy. The moon shifted colors for a moment, turning from dull red to a bright orange to yellow-white, and then back down the spectrum again, waning as suddenly as it had waxed. Is anyone recording this? Elvi asked. Kasky and Faringier aborted the high-altitude refraction study and started sucking down data from it as soon as they saw it was happening. Mostly it's visible light, heat, and about 30% more gamma particles than background. The sensor array on the Israels showing about the same thing. Is it dangerous? Elvi asked, knowing the answer even as she spoke the words. Maybe. Maybe it was dangerous. Maybe it wasn't. Until they knew what it was, all they could do was guess. In the starlight, Fayez's expression was difficult to make out, the apprehension at the corners of his mouth and in the curve of his eyes, 
might only have been her imagination. Another kind of dream. Do the others know? I guess so, Fayez said. Assuming they're not too busy taking each other prisoner and setting people on fire. You told Mertry? I didn't. Someone probably did. And Holden, what about him? Does he know? Even if he does, what's he going to do about it? Speak to it reassuringly? Elvie turned toward first landing. The few lit houses were like a handful of stars fallen to the ground. She took out her hand terminal, setting its screen to white and using it as a torch. Where are you going? Fayez called from behind her. I'm going to talk to Captain Holden, she said. Of course you are, Fayez said with an impatient grunt. Because what would be useful for him is a biologist's perspective on it. The words stung a little, but Elvie didn't let herself be drawn into the conversation. Fayez was a good scientist and a friend, but his habit of making fun of everything and derailing anything serious for the sake of humor also made him less useful than he should have been. One of the others should have made sure everyone knew that something was happening overhead. It shouldn't have had to be her. And still, she quietly did hope that she would be the one to bring the news. The dry air smelled like dust and the tiny, night-blooming flower analogs. Where there had been a few tough, ropey plants, months of foot traffic had made paths, and Elvie followed them as easily in the near darkness as she would have in the day. It occurred to her, not for the first time, that the scattering of huts, the ruins, and even first landing itself, had become as familiar to her as any place else she'd lived. She knew the land, the feel of the breezes, the smells that rose and fell at different times of day. Over the past month, she had been the ears and eyes of the whole scientific community back in the solar system, even when the terrorists had killed Reeve and Mercury had come down. At least a part of her day had been running samples and transmitting data back home. She had spent more time not just in, but with this environment than anyone else. Above her, the tiny red moon reminded her that she still didn't know much. Normally, that would have been a delight and a challenge. In the darkness of the new Terran night, it felt like a threat. Her steps took on a rhythm, her boots tapping against the wind-paved stones. In the town, people were in the streets, much like they had been out by the RCE huts. They stood in the streets and on their little cobbled-together porches, looking up at the glowing dot as it drifted toward the horizon. Helvey couldn't say if they were curious or apprehensive, or just wanting something to think about that wasn't the conflict between RCE and the squatters, between us and them. Or maybe they were seeing it as an omen, the burning eye looking down on them all, judging them and preparing for war. She'd heard a folk tale like that once, but she didn't remember where. Way and one of the other RCE security men were walking down the main street, rifles at the ready. Elvie nodded to them, and they nodded back, but no one spoke. Probably someone had told Holden, but she'd come all this way. She should at least be sure. In the street outside the commissary where Holden was living, Yasek Merton was pacing. The boy's body leaned into the motion his hands at his sides clenched in fists. His gaze was fixed about three feet in front of him, like someone looking at a screen, and his shoulders were hunched in like he was protecting something. She was about to say hello when a small warning bell chimed in her head. Between one heartbeat and the next, she wasn't L.V. Okoy going in the middle of the night to see Captain Holden on pretenses that even she could see were pretty damned flimsy.
That wasn't the son of Lucia and Bossia Merton, brother of Felsia, in front of her. This wasn't even a town. She was a biologist in the field, seeing a primate. And in that frame of reference, some things were perfectly clear. The boy was working himself up to violence. She hesitated and started to turn back. Way was only a few dozen meters and a corner or two away. If Elvie shouted, the security people would probably come at a run. Her pulse was quick. She could feel it in her throat. The long hours after Reeve's death came back to her like a recurring nightmare. She should scream. She should call for help. Except the boy wasn't just a primate, wasn't just an animal. He was Felsia's brother, and if she called for help, they might kill him. She swallowed, caught between fear and courage, uncertain. What would Fayez do, she wondered? Offer the kid a beer? He stopped and looked up at her. His eyes were empty. He wore a light jacket that pulled down a little on one side, like he had something heavy in his pocket. Hi, she said, smiling. A moment later, Yasek said, Hi. Weird, isn't it? She pointed up at the red dot. It seemed more portentous than ever. Yasek glanced up at the sky, but didn't seem to react to it. Weird, he agreed. They stood in front of each other, the silence rich and tense. The light spilling from the commissary windows left the boy half in light, Half in shadow, Elvie struggled, trying to find something to say, some way to diffuse everything and make it all okay. Fayez would have made a joke, something that the boy could laugh at, and that would put them both on the same side of the laughter, and Elvie didn't know what it was. I'm scared, she said instead, her voice breaking a little. It surprised the boy as much as it did her. I'm just so scared. It's okay, Yasek said. It's just some kind of reaction up there. It's not like it's doing anything but melting up in orbit. Still scared, though. Yasek scowled at his feet, torn between the errand he'd been stealing himself for and the impulse to say something kind and reassuring to this obviously unstable, vulnerable, strange woman. It'll be okay? He tried. You're right, she said, nodding. It's just, you know, I mean, you do know, don't you? I guess. I was coming to see Captain Holden, she said and Yasek's eyes flickered like she'd said something insulting. Were you too? She could see in his face as he tried to bring back the blankness he'd had before, the tightness and anger and emptiness. He wasn't someone for whom violence came naturally. He'd had to put effort into it. It was that effort she'd seen in him. He took my father away, Yasek said. Mom worries we'll never see him again. Is that why you came? To ask? Yasek looked confused. Ask... What? To talk to your father. The boy blinked, and he took an unconscious step toward her. He won't let me talk to him. He took him prisoner. People talk to prisoners all the time. Did someone tell you that you couldn't talk to your dad? Yasek was silent. He put his hand into his jacket pocket, the heavy one, and then took it out again. No. Come on, then, Elvie said, moving toward him. Let's go ask him. Inside the commissary, Holden was pacing from the front of the room to the back to the front again. The big man... Amos sat at a table with a pack of cards, playing solitaire with an unnerving focus. Holden's face was paler than usual, 
and the sense of barely restrained emotion gave his body a tension that she didn't picture him with. Amos looked up as she walked in, her hand on Yasik's shoulder. His eyes were flat and empty as marbles, and his voice was just as cheerful as ever. Hey there, Doc. What's up? Couple things, Elvie said. Holden stopped. It seemed to take him a second to focus. Something was bothering him. His gaze locked on her, and he tried to smile. An unexpected tightness came to her throat. She coughed. Uh, Yasek <clears throat> was wondering if there was any way he could talk with his father, Elvie said. There didn't seem to be much air in the room. She was having a hard time catching her breath. Maybe she was developing allergies. Sure, Holden said, then looked over his shoulder at Amos. That's not a problem, is it? Radios still work, Amos said. Might want to give Alex the heads up to expect that his hands are kind of full right now. Good point, Holden said, nodding to himself as much as any of them. I'll set that up. Do you have a hand terminal? It took Yasek a moment to realize the question was directed at him. It doesn't work. We don't have a hub. It's all just line of sight. Bring it over when you can, and I'll see if I can't put it on our network. That'll be easier than setting up times for you to use mine. Will that work? I... yeah. Sure. She could feel the boy's shoulder trembling. Yasek turned and walked out without meeting anybody's gaze, but especially avoiding hers. The door closed behind him. Kid was packing, boss, Amos said. I know, Holden replied. What did you want me to do about it? No, that's all. Okay, I know, but I really don't have time to get shot right now. He turned his attention to her. A lock of hair was dropping down over his forehead, and he looked tired like he was carrying the whole planet on his back. Still, he managed a little smile. Is there anything else? Because we're a little... Is this a bad time? Because I can... Our XO got arrested by Murtry, Amos said, and the flatness of his eyes had gotten into his voice now. Maybe a little while before there's a really good time. Oh. Elvie said, her heart suddenly picking up its pace. The XO is Holden's lover, and Holden has a lover, and Holden may not have a lover anymore, and Jesus, what am I doing here? All collided somewhere in her neocortex. Elvie found she was very unsure what to do with her hands. She tried putting them in her pockets, but that felt wrong, so she took them out again. I'd been thinking, she said, her voice rising at the end of the word, even though it wasn't a question. About the thing, in the desert, and now with the moon. Which moon? The one that's melting down, Cap, Amos said. Right, that one. I'm sorry. I've got a lot of things going on right now. If it's not something I can actually do something about... It's not sinking in the way it probably ought to, Holden said, and then, I'm not supposed to do anything about the moon thing, am I? We can let the scientists tell us if we're supposed to freak out, Amos said. It's all right. I've been thinking about hibernation failure rates, and that maybe what we were seeing was analogous. Holden lifted his hands. I couldn't tell you. It's just that hibernation is a really very risky strategy. We only see it when conditions are so bad that the usual kinds of survival strategy would fail. Uh, bears, for instance? They're top predators. The food web in wintertime couldn't sustain them. Or spadefoot toads in the deserts? 
In the dry periods, their eggs would just desiccate. So the adults go dormant until there's rain, and then they come back awake and go out to the puddles and mate furiously. Just this mad kind of puddle orgy, and... Um, anyway, and then they... They lay their eggs in the water before they can dry out again. Okay, Holden said. My point is, Elvie said, not all of them wake up. They don't have to. As long as enough of the organisms reactivate when the time comes, enough that the population survives, even if individuals don't. It's never a hundred percent, and shutting down and coming back up is a complicated, dangerous process. Holden took a deep breath and ran his hands through his hair. He had thick, dark hair. It looked like he hadn't washed it in a while. Amos lost his game, scooped up the cards, and started shuffling them with slow, deliberate movements. So, Holden said, you think that these things we're seeing are artifacts or organisms or something trying to wake up? And failing, at least sometimes, she said. I mean, the moon melted, and that thing in the desert was clearly broken. Or anyway, that's what it was looking like to me. Me too, Holden said. But just because it was moving, we kind of knew things were waking up. No, that's not the point, Elvie said. There are always a small percentage of organisms that don't wake up, or wake up wrong. These things, if that's the model, they're the ones waking up wrong. Following you so far, Holden said, failure rates are usually low, so why aren't we seeing a bunch of things waking up right? Holden went over to the table and sat on its edge. He looked frightened, vulnerable. It was strange seeing a man who'd done so much, who'd made himself known across all civilization by his words and deeds, look so fragile. So, you think there are more of these things, maybe a lot more, that are activating and we're just not seeing it? It would fit the model, she murmured. All right, he said, and a moment later... This isn't making my day better. Chapter 25 Basia Basia sat alone on the operations deck of the Rosinante. He was belted into a crash couch next to what he'd been told was the comm station. The controls were quiet, waiting for someone to request a connection, occasionally flashing a system status message across its screen. The messages were incomprehensible mixtures of acronyms, system names, and numbers. The text was in a gentle green font that made Bossia think they weren't particularly urgent. Alex was in the cockpit, the hatch closed. That didn't mean anything. The hatches closed automatically to seal each deck from the others in case of atmosphere loss. It was a safety measure, nothing more. It still felt like being locked out. The panel startled him with a burst of static, followed by a voice. The volume was just loud enough that Basia could tell it was a conversation between two men without understanding any of the words. A red recording status blinked in one corner of the screen. The Rosinante monitoring and recording all of the radio transmissions around Illus. Maybe Holden was doing that on purpose to have a record of his mission when he returned to Earth. Or maybe warships did it by default. It wasn't something that a welder had to worry about, or a miner, or whatever he'd been with Coop and Kate. Basia was looking for a way to turn up the volume and listen in when Alex's voice blared from the panel. Got a call coming in. Okay, Basia said not sure if the pilot could hear him. He didn't know if he needed to press a button to respond. The message on the comm panel changed, and a male voice said, 
You don't need to do anything. For a moment, Bossier had the irrational feeling that the person speaking had read his mind. He was about to reply when another voice, younger, male, said, Just talk? Yasek. The second voice was Yasek. And now Basia recognized the older voice as Amos Burton, the man who'd guarded him at the landing field. Yeah, Amos said. I've opened a connection to the Rossi. Hello, Yasek said. Hey, son. Basia replied around the lump in his throat. They made our hand terminal work again, Yasek said. By they, Basia guessed he meant Holden and Amos. Oh, yeah, Basia said. That's real good. It only talks to the ship, Yasek said, his young boy's voice bright with excitement. It doesn't play videos or anything like it used to. Well... Maybe they can make it do that, too, later. They said someday we'll be on the network, like every place in Soul System. Then we can do whatever. That's true, Basia said. Water was building up in his eyes, making it hard to see the little messages flashing by on the screen. We'll get a relay and a hub, and then we can send data back and forth through the gates. We'll have everything on the network, then. There's still going to be a lot of lag. Yeah, Yasek said, then stopped. There was a long silence. What's the ship like? Oh, it's pretty great, Basia said with forced enthusiasm. I have my own room and everything. I met Alex Kamal. He's a pretty famous pilot. Are you in jail? Yasek asked. No, no. I get to go anywhere I want on the ship. They're real nice. Good people. I love you. I am so sorry. Please, please be all right. Does he let you fly it? <laughs> I never asked, Basia said with a laugh. I'd be scared to, though. It's big and fast. Lots of guns on it. There was another long silence, then Yasek said, You should fly it and blow up the RCE ship. I can't do that, Basia said, putting as much smile in his voice as he could, making it a joke. But you should. How's your mom? Okay, Yasek said. Basia could almost hear the shrug in his voice. Sad. I started playing soccer more. We have enough for two teams, but we trade players a lot. Oh, yeah? What do you play? Fallback right now, but I want to play striker. Hey, defense is important. That's an important job. It's not as fun, Yasek said, again with the verbal shrug. There was a long silence while both of them reached for something to say something that could be said. Yasek gave up first. I'm gonna go now, okay? Hey, wait a minute, Basia said, trying to keep the thickness in his throat from changing his voice, trying to keep his tone light, fun. Don't run off yet. I need to ask you to do something. Got a game, Yasek said. Pretty soon, they'll get mad. Your mom. Basia said, then had to stop and blow his nose into the sleeve of his shirt. Mom what? Your mom will work too much if you don't watch her. She gets to looking things up at night, medical things, and she won't get enough sleep. I need you to make sure she gets some sleep. Okay. It's serious, boy. I need you to look after her. Your sister's gone, and that's good, but it just leaves you to help out. You gonna help out with this? Okay, Yasek said. Basia couldn't tell if the boy was sad or angry or distracted. See you, son, Basia said. See you, Pop, Yasek replied. Love you, Basia said.
but the signal had already died. Basia wiped his eyes with the sleeves of his shirt. He floated against his restraints, breathing deep, ragged breaths for a full minute, then pulled himself over to the crew ladder. He moved aft, deck hatches opening at his approach and slamming shut behind him as he went, the sound echoing through the empty ship. He changed shirts in his room, then spent a few minutes in the head cleaning his face with wet towels. They had a large shower unit. He couldn't remember the last time he'd had a real shower, but it only worked when the ship was under thrust. When he no longer looked like a man who'd been bawling, Basia floated back along the ladder to the cockpit. He was considering whether or not it was polite to knock before entering when he drifted too close to the hatch's electronic eye and it snapped open with a hiss. Alex was belted into the pilot's chair, the large display directly in front of him spooling out ship status reports and a rendering of Illus, its single massive continent dotted with red and yellow marks, and one green dot that was first landing. The pilot scowling at the screen tensely, as though he could will the universe to do something, like he could make it give his crew back. Basia was turning to leave when the deck hatch banged shut, and Alex looked up. Hey, he said, and tapped out something on the panel. Hello, Basia said. How'd your call go? Everything okay? Fine. Thank you for letting me use the radio. No problem, partner, Alex said with a laugh. They don't charge us by the hour. An uncomfortable silence stretched out that Alex pretended not to notice by pressing buttons on his controls. Am I allowed to be up here? Basia finally asked. I don't mind, Alex said. Just, you know, don't mess with anything. Basia pulled himself into the chair behind Alex and belted in. The armrests of the chair ended with complex-looking joysticks, so Basia was careful not to bump them. That's the gunner's seat, Alex said, turning his entire chair around to face Basia. Should I not? No, it's fine. It ain't on. Push buttons there all you want. Hey, want to see something cool? Basia nodded and put his hands on the two control sticks. They were covered with buttons. The gunner's seat. Those sticks might control the Rosinante's lethal weaponry. He wished Yasek could see him sitting there, holding the controls. Alex turned around and did something on his own panel, and the screen in front of Basia came to life with a view matching Alex's own. Basia looked at the bright limb of his planet, trying to find the location of first landing. Without the green dot overlay, it was impossible in daylight. If they were on the night side, he could have spotted them as a spark of light. Alex did something else, and the view shifted to a dull red blob of molten rock. That's the moon going meltdown. It wasn't a very big one, but still... Kind of makes you wonder what could melt a hunk of rock that size. Do we know? Hell no. Some kind of alien protomolecule shit it'd be my guess. Before Basia could ask for more details, the radio squawked at them. Alex here, the pilot said. Kid's gone. Wanted to check in, Amos's voice said. How's the captain doing? Alex asked. Not great. And once again, he stopped me from doing the obvious thing. Shooting the RCE chief in the face? Oh, Amos said. Warms my heart how well you know me. They got her, buddy, Alex said, his voice firm but gentle. Don't do anything that makes it worse. Yeah, yeah. You just watch the captain's back down there, Alex continued. I'll take care of our XO. If they hurt her, then it'll be raining RCE parts down on Illus for a year. Won't actually help, Amos said with a sigh. No, Alex agreed. No, it won't. It'll happen, though. All right. Gonna go find the captain. 
Aim us out. Alex tapped on his controls, and the view swung around away from the planet. For a moment, there was nothing, and then a tiny flicker of light, no more than a single pixel. The view zoomed in until it became a massive ship painted with the RCE colors. After a moment, it zoomed again, the rear of the ship swelling until it filled the screen, a small red crosshair glowing in the center of the view. Got my eyes on you, Alex said under his breath. What's that? Basia asked, pointing at the crosshair. That's where the reactor sits. The Rossi's got a lock on that location. I can send a gauss round right through her heart faster than her first alarm bell can ring. Won't that, you know... He made an explosive motion with his hands. No, it'll just vent. Probably kill a lot of their engineering staff. Do they know you're aiming at them? Not yet, but I'm about to fill them in. That's what'll keep my XO breathing. Nice that you can do something to protect her, Bossia said, and meant to stop, but the words pressed out past his teeth. My daughter is on the Barba Piccola. My wife and son are down on Illus. I can't do anything to help them or protect them. Bossia waited for the empty words of reassurance. Yeah, Alex said. You really fucked that one up, didn't you? Alex tapped something on his screen, and the words, Railgun Armed, glowed red for a second over the image of the Edward Israel. I need to call over to that ship in a sec, Alex said. Warn them. More like threaten them, Alex said. Pretty much the shittiest thing we have to offer for someone we all love, but it's what we got left. He reached out and fiddled with something on the bulkhead, and a stream of cool air shot out of the vent. It ruffled the pilot's thinning black hair and dried the sweat accumulating on his scalp. He closed his eyes and sighed. I don't even have threats, Basia said. It sounded like whining even to him. I don't even have that. Yeah. So I flew for the Mars Navy for twenty years. Alex said, his eyes still closed. Oh, Basia said. He wasn't sure what the correct response was. I was married, Alex continued, moving his head around to let the cool air strike every part of his neck and face. Basia didn't reply. It had the feeling of a story, not a conversation. Alex would tell it, or he wouldn't. Life for a naval spouse is, frankly, Pretty shitty, Alex said after a few moments. Typical tour on an MCRN boat can go from 90 days to four, maybe 500 days, depending on your MOS and fleet locations. MOS? Basia asked before he could stop himself. Your job. Anyway, while you're out on a boat, your partner is back home doing whatever they do. A lot of folks do plural marriages, group partnerships, things like that. But I'm a one-woman kind of guy, and I guess she was a one-man kind of woman. So we did it the old-fashioned way. Basia nodded, even though Alex couldn't see him. When they were building new domes, Basia had done work that kept him at a surface camp for four or five days straight. His wife's medical practice wouldn't have let her travel with him, even if they hadn't had children. Those were long weeks. Basia tried to imagine stringing ten or twenty of those weeks in a row, and failed. But that meant she stayed home while I flew, Alex said after a quiet moment. She had her own work. Software engineer. Good one, too. So it's not like she was pining away at home for me. But still, if you love somebody, you want to be with them. And we loved each other. Faithful to each other, if you can imagine that. My tours were tough on us both. I'd get home and we'd break the bed. Alex reached out and turned down the air vent, then spun his chair to face Bossia. His broad, dark face held a sad smile. It was a crap situation, but she stuck with me. 
Through twenty years of me being on ships, she stuck with me. And when I was in port, things were good. She'd work from home and I'd take a lot of leave, and we'd wake up late and make breakfast together, work in the garden. Alex closed his eyes again, and for a moment Basia thought he might have fallen asleep. Ever been to Mars? No, Basia replied, but my wife has. The newer areas, the ones built after we had some idea of what folks need to feel happy, were built different. No more narrow stone corridors. They built wide corridors with lots of green space down the middle for plants. Like on Ceres, Basia said. I've been to Ceres. Yeah, that's right. They do that on Ceres, too. Anyway, you could apply for a permit to care for a section of that space, plant what you wanted. We had a little chunk in the corridor outside our home. My wife planted an herb garden, some flowers, a few hot pepper plants. We'd work in it. Sounds nice, Basia said. Yeah, Alex nodded, eyes still closed. I didn't know it at the time, but it really was. I kind of thought it was a pain in the ass, to be honest. Never been much for gardening. But she liked it, and I liked her. And back then, that was enough. Did she die? Basia asked. What? Goodness, no. So, what happened? What happened is that she waited twenty years for me to retire. And I did. And then we didn't have to spend time apart anymore. She went to part-time with her work. I took a part-time gig flying suborbital shuttles. We spent a lot of time in bed. Alex opened his eyes and winked. He seemed to be waiting for a response, so Basia said, And then? And then one day I put into port at the Mariner Orbital Transit, and while they were unloading my cargo, I almost walked into an MCRN recruiting office and signed up again. Do they take? No, I didn't do it. And yeah, I was too damn old anyway. But when I landed, we had a big fight over something stupid. I don't even remember what. Hell, I didn't know what we were fighting about even at the time. Except I sort of did. Leaving. No, actually, it was never about leaving her. I never stopped wanting to be with her. But I needed to fly. She'd waited twenty years for me. And she'd done it thinking we'd have all the time in the world after I was through. She'd done her tour, just as much as I had. And she deserved the part that came after. Basia felt what was coming like a punch in the stomach, unable to avoid comparing it to his own situation. But you left anyway. Alex didn't reply for a time, didn't move, just floated in the straps of his pilot's chair like a corpse in water. When he spoke again, his voice was strained and quiet, like a man admitting something shameful, hoping no one will hear. One day I left work at the transit office, and I walked across the street to the Pern Clean Water Company, and I signed a five-year contract to fly long-haul freighters out to Saturn and back. That's who I am. I'm not a gardener or a shuttle pilot or, turns out, a husband. I'm a long flight pilot. Pushing a little bubble of air-filled metal across an ocean of nothing is what I was born to do. You can't blame yourself for what happened, Basia started. No, Alex said, a deep frown cutting into his forehead. A person can fail the people they love just by being who they are. I'm who I am, and it wasn't what my wife wanted me to be, and something had to break. You decided to do what you did down on that planet, and it put you up here with me, instead of with your family. Alex leaned forward, grabbing Bossia's hands in his own. It's still on you. I will never live down not being the person my wife needed after she spent twenty years waiting for me. I can never make that right. Don't go feeling sorry for yourself. You fucked up. You failed the people you love. They're paying the price for it right now. And you demean them every second you don't own that shit. Basia recoiled as if from a slap to the face. 
He bounced off the chair and back into the straps. A fly caught in a spider's web. He had to stop himself from ripping at the straps to get free. When he'd stopped struggling, he said, Then what? Shit, Alex said, leaning back. I barely figured out my own mess. Don't ask me to figure out yours. What was her name? Basia asked. Talissa, Alex said. Her name is Talissa. Even just saying it makes me feel like ten kilos of manure in a five-kilo sack. Talissa, Basia repeated. But I can tell you this. I'll never let someone I care about down again. Never again. Not if I can help it. Speaking of which, I need to make a call, he said with a bright, frightening smile. Chapter 26 Havelock It was hard to say exactly what changed on the Edward Israel after they captured the saboteur, but Havelock felt it in the commissary and the gym, at his desk as he worked, and in the hallways as he passed by the crew members and RCE staff. Part of it was fear that someone had taken action directly against the ship— Part of it was excitement that after months of floating and frustration, something, anything, had happened that wasn't at ground level. But more than that, it felt to him like the mood of the ship had clarified. They were the Edward Israel, the rightful explorers of New Terra, and everyone was against them. Even the UN mediators couldn't be trusted. And so, strangely, they were free. The remaining crew of the Rosinante wasn't doing anything to change their opinions. If you try to break orbit, the man on the screen said, your ship will be disabled. His name was Alex Kamal, and he was the acting captain of the Rosinante. If RCE's intelligence was accurate, he was also the only remaining crew member of the Corvette, and had the one remaining squatter terrorist on the ship with him, awaiting transport back to Earth for trial. Havelock crossed his arms and shook his head as the list of threats went on. If we find that any harm has come to Naomi Nagata, your ship will be disabled. If she is subjected to torture, your ship will be disabled. If she is killed, your ship will be destroyed. Well, ain't that just ducky? Captain Marwick said. You recall we were talking about not having people want to kill my ship? It's just talk, Havelock said as Kamal went on. We have already sent our petition to the United Nations and Royal Charter Energy demanding Naomi Nagata's immediate and unconditional release. Until that petition is answered and she's back on the Rosinante, the Edward Israel and all RCE personnel and employees are advised to do everything in their power to avoid any further escalation of this situation. This message serves as final verbal notification before the actions I've outlined are taken. A copy of this message is being included in the packet to the UN and RCE's corporate headquarters. Thank you. The round-faced... Balding man looked into the camera for a moment, then away, and then back before the recording ended. Marwick sighed. Not the most professional production, he said, but made his points effectively enough, I'd say. Sneeze and he shoots us, Havelock said. Look like we're going to sneeze and he shoots us. Make sure his chief engineer doesn't catch cold or he shoots us. Give her a blankie at night, and a cup of warm milk, or he shoots us. Did have a certain sameness to his thinking, didn't he? Marwick said. Havelock looked around the cabin. The captain's rooms were smaller than the security station, but he'd placed steel mirrors at the sides and along the tops of the walls to make it feel big. It was an illusion, of course but it was the kind of illusion that could make the difference between sanity and madness over the course of a few years in confined spaces. The screen set into the wall hiccuped and shifted to a starscape, not the real one outside, but the one from Seoul. 
Seeing the old constellations was disconcerting. Who's seen this? Havelock asked. Sent to me and Murtry, Marwick said. Don't know who Murtry's shown it to, but I've run it past you. All right, Havelock said. What do you want me to do about it? Want? I want you to pop the lady free and set her back home with a stern talking to, Marwick said. After that, I want to get my ship back under thrust and go the hell home, the way my contract said. What I expect is that you find out whether this is really all talk, or if my ship's going to come under fire. They have the firepower. I'm deeply aware of that. But do they have the will and expertise to use it? I'm only asking because the lives of my crew are in threat here, and it's making me a bit nervous. I understand, Havelock said. Do you now? I do, and I'll find out what I can, but in the meantime, let's start by assuming that he means it. Yeah, Marwick said, running a hand through his hair. He sighed. When I signed up for this, I was thinking it was a hell of an adventure. First alien world. No stations or relief ships if things went pear-shaped. A whole new system full to the top with Christ only knows what. And instead, I get this shite. Right there with you, sir, Havelock said. Havelock's paintball militia, emboldened by the capture, had pressed for immediate action. They had the emergency airlock. The orbital mechanics of the Rosinante had clearly brought it close enough for a transit. Go now, they'd said. Take the Rosinante when they weren't expecting it and get the whole charade over with. Havelock had been tempted. If he hadn't seen what point defense cannons could do to a human body, he might have given the go-ahead. Instead, they'd pulled power on the prisoner's suit and hauled her back to the Israel before she suffocated. Since then, she'd been in the drunk tank cell in Havelock's office. With the security team down to less than a skeleton crew, he'd given the prisoner access to the privacy controls. He didn't have enough women left on the team to put one on guard duty full-time. In fact, when he got back to his office, the place was empty except for Nagata in her cell. She looked over, greeting him with a little chin lift. She wore a red paper jumpsuit, and her hair floated around her head in a dark starburst. Enemy capture protocol didn't allow her hairband, a hand terminal, or her own clothes. She'd been in the cell for the better part of two days. Havelock knew from training exercises that he'd have been half-crazed with claustrophobia by now. She'd gone from looking embarrassed to retreating into her own thoughts. It was a belter thing, he assumed. A few generations living and dying without the sky and enclosed spaces lost the atavistic terror of premature burial. He sloped across the room to her. Nagata, he said, I had some questions for you. Don't I have the right to an attorney or union representative? she asked, her voice making it clear that she was at least half-joking. You do, Havelock said, but I was hoping you'd help me out of your kind and generous spirit. Her laugh was sharp, short, and insincere. He pulled up the video file on his hand terminal and set it floating just outside the steel mesh of the cell door. My name is Alex Kamal, and I am acting captain of the Rosinante. In light of recent events, Havelock shifted back to his desk, strapping himself in at the couch from force of habit more than anything. He watched Naomi's face without actually staring at her. The woman had a great poker face. It was hard to tell whether she felt anything at all as she watched her shipmate of years threaten them all on her behalf. When the file ended, he reached out and pulled the hand terminal back to himself. Don't see what you need me for, she said. He used small words. You're hilarious. The question I have is this. 
Are you really going to let your shipmates turn themselves into criminals and murderers so that you can postpone answering for your crimes? Her smile could have meant anything, but he had the sense he'd touched on something, or close to it. I feel like you're asking me for something, friend, but I don't know quite what it is. Will you tell the Rosinante to back off? Havelock said. It won't do you any damage. It's not like we're letting you go regardless. And if you cooperate, that'll speak well for you when we get back to Earth. I can, but it won't matter. You haven't shipped with those men. When you listen to that, you hear a list of threats, right? What do you hear? Alex saying how it is, Naomi said. All that stuff he told you? Those are just axioms now. I'm sorry to hear you say that, Havelock said. Still, if you'll record something for him assuring him that you're in good condition and aren't being mistreated, it'll only help. She shifted the microcurrents of air and the constant drift of microgravity, bringing her back against the cell's far wall. She touched it gently, steadying herself. Alex isn't the problem, she said. Let me tell you a little about Jim Holden. All right, Havelock said. He's a good man, but he doesn't turn on a dime. Right now, there's a debate going on in his head. On the one hand, he was sent out here to make peace, and he wants to do that. On the other hand, he protects his own. His woman? His crew, Naomi said, biting the words a little. It's going to take him a while to decide to stop doing what he agreed to do and just tip over the table. Havelock's hand terminal chimed. It was a reminder to review the next week's schedules. Even in the depths of crises, minor office tasks demanded their tribute. He pulled up the scheduling grid. You think he will, though, Havelock said. He's got Amos with him, Naomi said as if that explained everything. And then they'll assault the ship and get me out. Havelock laughed. We're stretched a little thin, but I don't see how they can expect to get through to you. You're talking about the man who got a load of people off Ganymede when it was still a war zone, Naomi said, and went on to the alien station at Medina by himself and scuttled the Agatha King by himself when it had two thousand protomolecule zombies on it. He fought his way off Eros in the first outbreak. Rushing in where angels fear to tread, Havelock said, and making it through. I can't tell you how many last goodbyes I've had with him, and he always comes back. Sounds like a rough guy to have for a boyfriend, Havelock said. He is, actually, she said with a laugh but he's worth it. Why? Because he does what he says he's going to do, she said. And if he says he's going to pop me out of this cell, then either that will happen or he'll die. Her expression was calm, her tone matter-of-fact. She wasn't boasting. If anything, he thought there was a hint of apprehension in her voice. It disturbed him more than the acting captain's list of threats. He closed the scheduling grid, considered his hand terminal for a few seconds. It would be afternoon on the surface, a little over halfway through one of the long, fifteen-hour days. Excuse me, he said to the prisoner. I've got to make a call. He thumbed the privacy controls down, and the steel mesh of the cage deformed into a pearly opacity. He requested a connection to Murtry, and a few seconds later, his boss appeared on the screen. The sun had darkened his skin, and a tiny scab on his forehead looked almost like a cast mark. He nodded to Havelock. What can I do for you? Murtry said. I wanted to touch base with you about the prisoner, Havelock said. Check our strategy. Saw the pilot's little tantrum, did you? You know, boss, 
All that you said before about how they have the biggest guns and if they want to take us down, they can? Because that's still true. In the background of the feed, a door slammed, and Murtry looked up, nodded, and refocused on Havelock. Less an issue now than ever. As long as one of theirs is on the ship, they won't shoot. Won't? We'll be less likely to, Murtry amended. And what's the plan when RCE orders us to release her, Havelock said. Might be worth cutting her loose early. Get out in front of it, get some goodwill back. We're way past goodwill. I'm just not sure we have the authority to hold her, and if... Are you in her brig? Havelock blinked. Sorry? Are you in her brig? No, sir. Right. She's in yours. You have the jail, and you have the pistol, and that makes you the sheriff, Murtry said. If the Home Office doesn't like what we're doing, we'll appeal the decisions. If we lose the appeal, they can send someone out and have a meeting face to face. By that time, all this will look so different they might as well not try. And the Home Office knows that, Havelock. What we've got here is a very free hand. Yeah, all right. I just wanted to check. My door's always open, Murtry said in a voice that meant maybe Havelock shouldn't bother him with any more stupid ideas. The connection dropped, and Havelock considered the default screen for a few seconds before he pulled the grid back up. A few seconds later, he deactivated the privacy shield. Naomi was floating in the cage, pushing herself from side to side like a bored kid. Your privacy equipment sucks, she said. Really? Really. You heard that, then? A very free hand, she said. Sorry. That was supposed to be between me and him. I know, but it came right through. Honestly, can you hear me peeing in here? Just that the vacuum comes on, Havelock said, feeling a little blush in his neck and a sharp embarrassment at being embarrassed. It's pretty loud. Old ships, she said. He went back to the business of running his staff. A report came in complaining of theft from one of the ship technician's personal lockers. He routed it to the woman on duty. As long as things stayed pretty calm and the crew was all focused on the dangers outside, he could hold the place together. Having a common enemy actually helped with that. A lot of common enemies. Naomi started humming to herself, a soft melody that hovered just on the edge of recognizable. Havelock let himself enjoy it a little. It was that, or be annoyed. He wasn't the only one, he said. Sorry, Naomi said. He wasn't the only one who got off Eros during the outbreak. My old partner was there. He got off, too. Then he went back later, when it hit Venus. Wait, you knew Miller? Yeah, Havelock said. Small universe. He was one of maybe six decent people working Ceres Station when Star Helix had the contract. Warned me to quit Protogen before they imploded, too. I was sorry about it when he died. He'll be flattered, she said. We're not the bad guys here. RCE didn't start any of this. You said you liked Holden because he always does what he says he'll do. That's us. RCE are the ones who asked permission and made a plan and came out here to do what everyone agreed we should do. Not the people in First Landing. They didn't agree. No, because they were breaking the rules that we were following. I'm just... I know how weird and dangerous this all is, but before your friends start blasting railgun rounds through our reactor, I want you to see that we're not the bad guys here. His voice had gotten thinner and higher as he spoke. At the end, he was almost shouting. He pressed his hands together, 
bit his lips. Under a little pressure, she said. Some, he agreed. Let me out. I'll put in a good word for you, she said. And it'll keep Holden from doing anything stupid. Really? It'll keep him from doing a couple particular stupid things, she said. He may come up with something else. He's clever that way. I can't, he said. I know. The ship passed invisibly into the planet's shadow, the decks clicking and groaning as the expansion plates adjusted to the change in radiant heat. Havelock felt a little rush of shame. She was his prisoner. He was the jailer. He shouldn't need her approval. If she thought he and his people were baby-killing fascist power freaks, it didn't change anything he had to do. Naomi went back to humming. It was a different song now, something slow in a minor key. After a while, she let it drift into silence. They weren't the only ones, she said as he finished the week's duty roster. They were the only ones that were trapped in the outbreak, but the place was locked down before that. A bunch of thugs in stolen riot armor, making sure everyone did what they were told, and shooting the ones who didn't. Getting ready for it. A few people made it past them. Really? Who? Naomi shrugged. Me, she said. Chapter 27 Elvie Elvie sat on the crest of the hill, looking west. The morning light behind her caught the wings of thousands of butterfly-like animals. She hadn't seen them before, but today they filled the air from the ground to twenty meters high. A vast school of tiny animals or insects, or whatever other name humanity eventually assigned to this foreign kingdom of life. For her, right now, they were butterflies. They moved together like a school of fish, independent and coherent. Bursts of color, blue and silver and crimson and green, flashed through them, seeming almost to come in patterns for a moment and then dissolving into chaos. The column of them rose, narrowing, then broadened and flattened. They moved past her in a rush, and for a few seconds she was inside the cluster, palm-sized wings fluttering gently against her, with a sound like sheets of paper falling, and a clean, astringent smell like mint without being mint. She smiled and raised her arms up into the cloud of them, taking joy in the beauty and the moment, and then they passed and she turned to watch them flow through the air, tumbling to the south as if they were going somewhere in particular. She stood and stretched, adjusting her collection satchel against her hip. The sunlight pressed against her shoulders and the nape of her neck as she walked forward into the dusty, stone-paved field. The ruins rose to the north, with first landing not even a smudge next to them, all human artifacts hidden by the curve of the planet and the shape of the hills. All except her. Here and there, a few butterflies remained, possibly dead, possibly quiescent. She squatted beside one, looking into the vibrant blue of its wings, the coppery complication of flesh where its body, what she thought of as its body, folded together, interarticulated like a hinge. She put on her gloves and lifted the tiny body. It didn't so much as flutter. Even though it meant getting less physiological data, she hoped it was already dead. Sorry, little one, she said, just in case. It's in the name of science. She folded it into the black lattice, sealed it, and triggered the collection sequence. The array of sampling needles clicked and muttered to themselves. Elvie squinted up into the white-blue arch of the sky. The red dot floated about fifteen degrees above the horizon, bright enough to show through the thin, greenish clouds. The satchel coughed, throwing out an error code Elvie hadn't seen before. 
She took out her hand terminal, connecting it to the satchel's output channel. The preliminary data set was a mess. LV felt a deep, cold stab of fear. If the satchel was broken, it could take days before the one functioning shuttle could bring her a spare from the Israel. She wasn't even positive they had a spare in the toolkit, or if they'd all been lost in the wreck of the heavy shuttle. The prospect of years going by collecting data by hand and spending her nights doing discussions like she was back in lower university reared up like a ghost. She took the butterfly out. Its corpse looked almost the same as when she'd put it in. She sat cross-legged beside it and ran the satchel's system diagnostics, chewing her lips as she waited for a fresh error code. The readout came up clean. She looked from the satchel to the butterfly, then back again. A second hypothesis formed, as chilling as the first, maybe worse. She picked up the dead butterfly and marched back toward the huts. Fayez's was a small green geodesic design he'd constructed halfway down a thin hill, high enough that any storm runoff would pass it by, but not at the crest where the wind would catch it. He was sitting on a stool, leaning back against the hut. He was wearing a pair of polyfiber work pants, a t-shirt, and an open bathrobe. He hadn't shaved in days, and the stubble on his cheeks made him look older. This isn't an animal, she said, holding out the butterfly. He let the stool come down, its legs tapping the ground. Good to see you, too, he said. This isn't two biomes coming together. It's three. This, whatever it is, it doesn't have any of the chemical or structural commonalities that you'd expect to see. Lucia Merton was up looking for you. Did you run across her? What? No. Look, this is another machine. It's another thing, like— She pointed at the low, red moon. Like that! All right. What if they're really not coming awake just because we're here? What if they're consistent? It complicates everything. Fayez scratched his scalp just above his left ear. You seem to want something here, Elvie, but I don't know what it is. How am I supposed to make any sense of this place when it keeps changing all the rules? She said, and her voice sounded shrill even to her. She threw the butterfly down angrily, then immediately wished she hadn't. Not that it cared, just that the gesture seemed cruel. Fayez smiled his sharp little smile. You're preaching to the choir. You know what I've been doing all morning? Drinking? I wish. I've been going over surface data from the Israel. There's a chain of islands on the far side of the planet with what looks like a metric ass-ton of volcanic activity. Only so far as I can tell, this planet doesn't have, you know, tectonic plates. So what the hell is mimicking volcanism? Do you know what Michaela's working on? No. There's a pattern in the ultraviolet light that reaches the ground here, like it's some kind of carrier signal. Doesn't exist before the sunlight hits the exosphere, and by the time it comes here, complex, consistent patterning. She's got no idea where it's coming from. Sudyam's work group has what they think might be complex molecules that incorporate stable transuranics. How does that work? I know, right? Fayez said. Elvie hung her hand on her shoulder, letting her elbow hang loose. Sweat trickled down her spine. I have to... Tell Holden, Fayez said. I know. I was going to say review my data. See if maybe there's a common structure between that, she nodded at the butterfly, and the big thing in the desert. Maybe I can make sense of it. If you can't, no one can. Fayez said. Something in his voice caught her attention, and she looked at him more closely. His fox-sharp face looked softer around the eyes and jowls. The flesh around his eyes was puffier than usual. Are you all right? He laughed and spread his arms toward the horizon, 
gesturing at the whole planet, the whole universe, at once. I'm great. Just spiffy. Thanks for asking. I'm sorry. I just... Don't, Elvie, he said. Don't be sorry. Just go on dealing with all of this the way that you do. Pile on another few layers of not thinking about it, and sail on, my dear. Sail on. Whatever keeps you sane and functioning in a place like this, I will carry a flag for it. I'll even pray with Simon on Sunday mornings. That's how bad I've got it. Whatever works for you has my blessings. Thank you? Afwan, he said, waving his hand. Only, before you bury your head back in your data sets again, go see Dr. Merton. She looked worried. The boy sitting on the clinic table was six years old. His skin was the same deep brown as Elvie's own, but with an ashy color to it. Not dryness, but something deeper. His eyes were bloodshot like he'd been weeping. Maybe he had been. His mother stood in the corner, her arms crossed and a vicious scowl on her lips. Lucia's voice was crisp and calm, but her shoulders rode high up beside her ears. So I'm seeing this here, she said, as her finger pulled down on the boy's cheek, opening a thin gap between the lower lid and the roughened surface of the eyeball. The discoloration was almost invisible in the redness, but it was there, the faintest hint of green. I see, Elby said. She smiled at the boy. He didn't smile back. So, Jacob. Jason. Sorry, Jason. How long have you had trouble seeing things? The boy shrugged. Right after my eyes started hurting again. And everything looks green? He nodded. Lucia touched Elvie's arm. Silently, the doctor shone a light into the boy's eye. The iris barely reacted, and Elvie caught a glimpse of something in the fluid behind the boy's cornea, like a badly maintained aquarium. She nodded. Lucia stood up, smiling at the woman. If you'll wait with him here, Amanda, I'll be right back. Amanda nodded once, sharply. Elvie let Lucia draw her through the examining room door and down a short hallway. Outside, a stiff breeze had picked up, rattling the clinic's doors and windows. He's the only one I've seen like this, Lucia said. There's nothing in the literature. His mother doesn't seem to like me very much, Elvie said, trying to make it a joke. Her wife was shot and killed by RCE security, Lucia said. Oh, I'm sorry. The testing array was good, but it was old. Ten years, maybe fifteen. A long scar ran across the bottom of its screen where something had gouged at it. Elvie could believe it had made the long trek from war-torn Ganymede to come here. She was surprised it still worked, but when Lucia thumbed in her access code, the screen came to life. The sample was beautiful in its way, a branching of elegant green like a pictogram meaning tree. It began in the extracellular matrix, Lucia said. Low-level inflammation, but nothing worse than that. I hoped it would clear up on its own. Only now it's in the vitreous humor, Elvie said. I was wondering, Lucia began, but Elvie had already taken out her hand terminal and started sinking it to the array. It only took a few seconds to find a match. Elvie tapped through the data. All right, she said. The closest match is some of the rainwater organisms. Lucia shook her head, and Elvie pointed up. You know how the clouds are greenish? There's a whole biome of organisms up there that have found ways to exploit the moisture and high ultraviolet exposure. Like plants? Fungi? Like them, Elvie said. It's not where we've been burning most of our cycles, but it looks like a pretty crowded niche, a lot of species fighting for resources. I'm guessing this little fellow was in a raindrop that dropped into Jason's eye and found a way to live there. 
He's had several eye infections, but they all came from familiar organisms. This thing, is it contagious, do you think? I wouldn't guess so, Elvi said. We're just as new to it as it is to us. It evolved to spread in open air through a water cycle. It's so tolerant if it's living in us, and that's interesting. If his eyes were already compromised, he may have been vulnerable to it. But unless he starts throwing his tears at people, wouldn't think it would go too far. What about his eyesight? Elvie straightened up. Lucia looked at her seriously, almost angrily. Elvie knew it wasn't directed at her, but at the terrible ignorance they were both struggling under. I don't know. We knew something like this was bound to happen sooner or later, but I don't know what we can do about it. Except tell people not to go out when it's raining. That isn't going to help him, Lucia said. Can you ask the lads back home for help? A hundred objections filled Elvie's mind. I don't control the RCE research teams, and all the data analysis is planned out and running months ahead of where we are now, and I just got another sample of a third biome this morning. She tapped at her hand terminal, saving a copy of the array's data, then translating it into RCE's favorite formats and sending it winging through the air back to the Israel, and then the ring, and then Earth. I'll try, she said. In the meantime, though, we need to let people know it's a problem. Has Carol Chewiwi heard about this? She knows I'm suspicious and that I wanted to bring you in on it, Lucia said. Elvie nodded, already trying to think what the best way would be to bring the issue to Mertry's attention. Well, you let your side know, and I'll tell mine. All right, Lucia said. And then a moment later, I hate that it breaks down that way. Your side and mine. One of my teachers back in school always used to say that contagion was the one absolute proof of community. People could pretend there weren't drug users and prostitutes and unvaccinated children all they wanted. But when the plague came through, all that mattered was who was actually breathing your air. I'm not sure if that's reassuring or awful. There's room for both, Lucia said. This scares me as much as anything that's happened, this little thing. What if we can't fix it? We probably can, Elvie said. And then we'll fix the next one, and the one after that. It's tricky and it's hard, but everything's going to be all right. Lucia lifted an eyebrow. You really believe that? Sure, why not? You aren't scared at all? Elvie paused, thinking about the question. If I am, I don't feel it, she said. It's not something I think about. Take what blessings you can, I suppose. What about the third side? Elvie didn't know what Lucia was talking about, and then she heard Fayez's mocking voice in her memory, and her heart leaped. She hated it a little that her heart leaped. But that didn't stop her. I'll tell him, she said. I'll tell Holden. In the commissary, Holden sat hunched over his hand terminal. He'd shaved and his hair was combed. His shirt was pressed. Cleans up pretty, a voice in the back of her mind said, and she pushed it away. A woman's voice came from the terminal, crackling and sharp. Squeeze all the balls I can get my hands around until someone starts crying, but it will take time. And I know you're thinking of taking this public because you're fucking stupid, and that is what you always think of. You and publicity are like a sixteen-year-old boy and boobs. Nothing else in your head. So before you even begin... Amos lumbered up from the side. His smile was as open and friendly as ever, but Elvie thought there might be a little edge to it. His broad, bald head always made her think of babies, and she had to restrain herself from patting it. Hey, Amos said. Sorry, but the captain's a little busy. Who's he listening to? United Nations, Amos said. 
He's been trying to get your boss to let our XO out. Not my boss, LV said. Mercury Security. It's a whole different organizational structure. That corporate stuff's not my strong suit, he said. I just needed to, she began, and Holden drew himself up, looking into the hand terminal camera. His lips formed a hard little smile, and she lost her train of thought. Let me make it clear, Holden said, his voice low and solid as stone. This was done on my orders. If Royal Charter wants to put me on trial when I get back because I ordered my crew to disable their illegally weaponized shuttle, I would be happy to— Doc, Amos said. What? Sorry. No, it's just that uh, there are some things going on that I thought he needed to know about. Amos shook his head in something that almost passed for sorrow. No, nothing's happening until the XO's clear. No, it is, though, Eldy said. Not just one thing, either. I found more artifacts waking up today. Some of them are passing for local animals, I think. If we'd been here long enough to build a catalog, we could tell which were which. But as it is, everything looks new, so we don't know. So, some of the lizards are protomolecule stuff? Amos asked. Yes, maybe. We don't know yet. And there's more, because the local biome is starting to find ways to invade us, exploit our resources. And the Perimeter Dome never got set up. And so all of our microfauna are just wandering around, mixing with the local ecosphere, and there's no way to get it back, so we're contaminating everything, and everything's contaminating us. She was talking too fast. She hated this. When, if, she ever got back to Earth, she was going to take some communications classes, something that would keep her from rattling on like a can rolling downstairs. It's all accelerating, she said, and maybe it is a reaction to us or to something we're doing, or maybe it's not, and I know we're having trouble figuring out the politics and getting along with each other, and I'm really sorry about that. There were tears in her eyes now. Jesus, what was she, twelve? But we have to look at what's happening, because it's really, really dangerous, and it's happening right now. And it's all going to hit a crisis point, and then something really, really bad will happen. And then Holden was there, his eyes on her, his voice soothing. She wiped her tears with the back of her hand and wondered whether any of Jason's invading blindness fungus had been on her hands when she did it. Hey, Holden said, are you all right? I am, she said. I'm fine. I'm sorry. It's okay, Holden said. You said something about a crisis? She nodded. All right, he said. What would that look like? I don't know, she said. I won't know. Not until it's happened. Chapter 28 Basia Basia floated above the world. Seventeen hundred kilometers below, Illus spun past at a dizzying pace. Alex had told him that the Rosinante had an orbital period just under two hours, but Basia couldn't feel it. Floating outside the ship in microgravity, his inner ear told him that he was drifting, motionless. So instead, the universe appeared to spin far too quickly like some giant child's toy, every hour moving from dark to light and then an hour later back to darkness, the sun rising from behind Illus, spinning around behind him and setting again briefly. Basia had been outside long enough to see the change three times, the center of his own cosmos. The planet's one vast ocean was in night. The string of islands that crossed it tiny black spots in a larger darkness. One of the islands, the largest of them, was outlined in a faint green light, luminescence in the waves crashing against its beaches and cliffs. 
The day side was dominated by Illus's single massive continent. The southwestern quarter was the enormous desert. First landing would be just to the north of it. In daylight, it was far too small to see with the naked eye. Even the huge alien towers where he'd met with Coop and Kate and all the others, in some previous lifetime, were too small to find. You okay out there, partner? Alex's voice said over the radio. Been drifting a while now. That hatch ain't gonna fix itself. As he spoke, the Edward Israel passed into the daylight side of the planet and flashed like a tiny white spark. It was almost too far away to be seen, but, in orbital terms, very, very close. Alex was holding the Rosinante locked in a matching orbit so he could keep his gun pointed at them. It's beautiful, Bossia said, looking back down at the planet spinning by. When we came in on the barb, I never took time to just look at it. But Illus is beautiful. So, Alex said, his drawl adding an extra syllable to the word. Remember when we talked about the euphoria you can get on a spacewalk? I'm not new at this, Bossia replied. I know what the happies are like, and I'm good. The hatch is almost done. Just taking a break. They'd eaten all their meals together. Alex had shared his collection of 22nd century noir revival films with him. Just the night before, they'd watched Naked Comes the Gun. Bossia found noir too bleak, too hopeless to enjoy. It had led to a lengthy conversation over drinks about why Alex thought he was wrong to feel that way. And, true to Naomi's promise, Alex had dug up a list of open repair projects for Basia to work on, one of which was a sticky actuator arm on one of the Rosinante's two torpedo loading hatches. The hatch lay open next to him, a door in the flank of the warship a meter wide and eight meters long. A massive white tube sat just below the opening, one of the ship's torpedoes. It looked too big to be just a missile almost a small spaceship in its own right. It didn't look dangerous, just well-crafted and functional. Bossia knew that in its heart lay a warhead that could reduce another spaceship to molten metal and plasma. It was hard to reconcile that with the gentle white curves and sense of calmness and solidity. The faulty actuator had already been cut out, and floated next to the ship at the end of a magnetic tether, waiting to be taken inside. With an effort, Basia turned away from the stunning view of Illus and pulled the new actuator off the web harness on his back. Going back to work now, he said to Alex. Roger that, the pilot replied. Be glad to have that working. Planning to need it? Basia asked. Nope. But I'd like to have the option if it comes up. Alex laughed. He laughed, but he was also serious. Bossia began attaching the new arm to the hull mounts and the missile hatch. He knew almost nothing about electronics and had worried that wiring up the new device would be beyond his skills. But it turned out that it had a single plug that went into a port inside the actuator housing which made sense when he thought about it. They would design warships around the idea that damage was inevitable, that repairs would sometimes take place in hostile environments. Making everything as modular and easy to swap out as possible wasn't just sensible, it was a survival trait. He wondered if the Martians had had a belter on the design team. The Barbapicola is on our side of Villas. Alex said, still in that same lazy, sleepy voice. Can you show me? Basia looked around, but could see nothing but the glowing planet below and the white spark of the Edward Israel. Hold on. A moment later, a tiny green dot appeared on Basia's heads-up display, drifting slowly. It's the dot? Well, Alex said. 
It's where the dot is. But it's too far away to see right now. Just a sec. A green square appeared on Bossio's HUD, then zoomed in like a telescope until the distant freighter was the size of his thumbnail. That's it fifty times, Alex said. Space is too big, Bossio replied. It's been said, and this is just the space in low orbit around one planet. Breaks the head a bit to think about. I try not to. Wise man. The Barba Piccola looked like a big metal shipping container, with the squat bell housing of a drive at one end, and the blocky superstructure of command and control on top. She was ugly and utterly functional, a thing of the vacuum that would never know the heat of atmospheric drag. The large cargo bays that took up most of the interior would be full of the raw lithium ore they'd already pulled off Illus waiting to fly to the refineries on Palace Station, waiting to be traded for food and medicine and soil enrichments, all the things the fledgling colony needed to survive, waiting to take his daughter away. Can we talk to them? he asked. Huh? The barb? Sure. Why? My daughter is over there. All righty, came the reply followed by a burst of static. A few moments after that, a voice with a thick belter accent replied. Que? Sa bueno. Basia Merton, me? Suchanach Felsia Merton. Donde? Sasa, the voice said, the tone a fight between curiosity and irritation. The connection stayed open, but silent. While he waited, Basia finished mounting the actuator arm and plugged it in. He called down on the ship channel to have Alex test it, and it opened and closed several times without binding or twisting the hatch. The motor made a smooth vibration in the hull beneath his magnetic boots that set his helmet to humming. Papa? came a hesitant voice. Baby, Felsia, it's me, honey, he replied trying to keep from babbling like an idiot and mostly failing. Papa, she said, delight coloring her voice. Deeper now, richer, but still the voice of the little girl that had squealed, Papa, when he came home from work. It still melted all the hard, angry, adult places in his heart. I'm up here with you, honey. On the Barbapicola? she said in confusion. No, I mean in orbit, over Illus. I can see your ship, honey, flying by. Let me find a screen. Where are you? I can look for you. No, don't worry about that. I'm pretty far away. I had to magnify a lot to see you. Just keep talking to me for a minute before you go around the planet again. Okay, she said. Are they nice to you over there? Basia laughed. Your brother wanted to know the same thing. They're fine. The best jailers ever. And you? Everyone is nice, but worried. Maybe the RCE ship won't let us leave. Everything will be fine, honey, Basia said, patting at the empty space as if she could see him and take comfort from it. Holden's working it out. He made you a prisoner, Papa. He did me a favor, Felsia. He saved me, Basia said, and realized it was true as he said it. Mertry would have killed him, and his son and wife were still down on the planet. I just wanted to say hello, not talk about that stuff. So, hello, Papa, she replied with her grown-up little girl's voice. Hello, Podling, he replied, calling her by a nickname he hadn't used in years. She made a strange noise, and it took Basia a moment to realize she was crying. Never going to see you again, Papa, she said, her voice thick. He started to reply with objections, with reassurances, but his conversation with Alex came back to him, 
and instead he said, Maybe, Podling. That's nobody's fault but mine. Remember that, okay? I tried to do what I thought was right, but I messed up, and it's on no one but me if I have to pay for it. I don't like that, Felsia said, still crying. Me either, honey, he thought, but said. Is what is, Sasa. Is what is. Doesn't change that I love you and your mama and Yasik. And Katoa, who I left to die. They say I have to go, Felsia said. The tiny green dot that hid the massive spaceship his daughter lived on was moving away, toward the horizon, into radio blackout. He could see it happening, watch the unimaginable distance between them getting wider until a planet came between them. Okay, honey, he said. Bye now. I love you. Whatever she might have said in reply was lost, as the Barba Piccola slipped behind Illus and the channel broke up into static and died. No relay satellites in orbit around the new world yet. Back to line of sight, like nineteenth-century primitives bouncing radio around inside their atmosphere. Basia thought of his home, really just a shack in a tiny village with two dusty roads. Maybe that was appropriate. Seventeen hundred kilometers below, his world spun. Beneath his feet, a spaceship capable of flying across the solar system hummed to itself with barely restrained power. Maybe not just like a nineteenth-century primitive. You ready to come back in? Alex said, breaking into his reverie. In a minute, Basia replied. Can you find first landing and point it out? Sure. It's moving away, but you can still see it. Another tiny green dot appeared on his HUD over a spot just north of Illus's great southern desert. Knowing where to look, Basia thought he could detect the open bowl of the mining operations north of the village, but that might just have been wishful thinking. Lucia would be down there, seeing patients, looking after Yasek. It was daylight in the village, so Lucia would definitely still be working. Basia tried to imagine what she was doing at that moment. The temptation to have Alex call down to the village so he could talk to her was almost overpowering, but he'd been selfish enough already calling Felsia. He was a source of pain to his family now. The only comfort to be had came at their expense. So instead, he began packing up his tools and the damaged actuator. If he never came back, would Lucia find someone else? He tried to tell himself that he was the sort of man who'd want that for her, that her happiness was more important than his fears about losing her. He tried the idea on like a new outfit, seeing if he could find a way to make it fit. It didn't. He saw with clarity, as perfect as if Alex were zooming his HUD in on the idea, that he was not that sort of man. It was hard to tell if that was a flattering testament to his commitment to his marriage or a scathing commentary on his own insecurities and selfishness. Like almost everything else that had happened to him over the last months, it was murky and difficult to navigate. He would go back with Holden, probably to the UN complex on Luna. The OPA would claim he was their citizen, but Ganymede had originally been a U.N. colony. The legality of which people were citizens of which government was still being worked out, and would be for decades. Plenty of time to try him as a U.N. citizen for crimes against a U.N.-based company and thrown him in prison for all eternity. Years of trials, probably. Basia began slowly walking across the hull of the Rosinante, dragging his webbed-together bundle of tools and spare parts behind. At the stern of the ship, he stopped and planted both feet, waiting for the bundle to float past him and stop at the end of its line. The weight, 
pulled his arms out painfully for a moment as he killed its momentum. Open the cargo bay hatch, he said. Roger, Alex replied, and the ship started to vibrate under Bossia's feet. The two heavy doors of the cargo bay slowly slid open. When they were about halfway, he yanked down on the line and the bundle of tools swung around the edge of the ship and into the cargo bay. He let go of the line and let them sail inside without yanking him off the edge after them. In the corner of his vision there was a bright burst of light, like the flash of a distant camera. Basia turned to look, expecting to see one of the other two ships moving into the sunlight. Instead, there was a growing point of white light centered over Illus's largest island. It was bright enough to overpower the faint green luminescence of its beaches and rapidly expanding. In seconds, the dark side of the planet was lit up as brightly as if a second sun had risen. The other islands in the chain, suddenly visible in stark black and white, casting long shadows across the ocean as the white spot grew. He felt his heart start to race. Alex, he said. The ocean around the big island heaved up, bulging out beyond the curve of the planet in what must have been a tsunami miles high. But before Bossia could grasp the enormity of the forces involved in such an uprising, it was gone. The island, the massive upwelling of the ocean, the smaller nearby islands, they all disappeared in a column of white fire and a rapidly rising mushroom cloud. Basia's visor darkened dramatically, and he had a sense that if it hadn't, the light coming from the planet below might have blinded him. But even through the welder-shield darkness of the helmet, he could see the column of fire growing, hurling white vapor up until it broke free of the planet's atmosphere and became glittering crystals of ice, speeding away from the gravity well like a shower of glass from a bullet-shattered window. A massive ripple, like wind across a field of grass, sped away from the growing pillar of fire through the surrounding ocean. Intellectually, Bossia knew the ripples had to be waves, hundreds or thousands of feet high, rushing away from the blast. But the intellectual part of his brain was rapidly disappearing behind the screaming primitive who was relieving his bladder into the suit's condom catheter in fear. Basia had grown up in the Jupiter system. He'd seen video of Io up close more than once. Io was famous for having the most massive volcanoes ever seen by man. Gigantic geysers of sulfur blasting out of the surface of the moon until particles were flung into Jupiter's plasma torus and faint ring system. They made Io an almost insanely inhospitable place. The explosion Bossia was looking at from orbit dwarfed those eruptions. It looked like half the planet was being flattened by the force of the blast. His initial thought was that it was a very good thing first landing was on the other side of the world. His second, that the shockwave was heading that direction and not even traveling around the planet was going to slow it down much. Jesus Christ! Alex yelled across the radio. Are you seeing that shit? Call down! Basia tried to yell back. It came out as a panicky whimper. You have to warn them! Warn them to do what? Alex asked. He sounded dazed. What do you do when the planet you're standing on tries to kill you? Basia didn't know. Chapter 29 Holden Holden stood on a low hill overlooking First Landing, trying to enjoy the beauty of the planet while his brain chewed on the half-dozen insoluble problems that he was somehow supposed to solve. The usual dust had been tamped down by the recent run of gentle rains. It made the town look clean, well-tended, peaceful. Above, the sky was a stunning indigo blue with just the faintest streamers of high-altitude clouds breaking it up. 
His hand terminal was reporting the temperature as 22 degrees Celsius, with a gentle four-knot wind coming out of the northeast. The only thing that would have made it better was Naomi there with him, or at least back safe on the Rosy. But that would have made it a lot better. I miss planets, Olden said, closing his eyes and facing the sun. I don't, Amos replied. He'd been so quiet during their afternoon walk that Holden had sort of forgotten he was there. You never miss a breeze, the sun on your skin, a gentle rain? Those are not the parts of planetary life that imprinted on my memory, Amos replied. Want to talk about it? Holden asked. Nope. Okay. Holden didn't take the mechanic's refusal personally. Amos had, as he described it, a lot of past in his past. He didn't like people digging around there, and Holden was the last person to pry. Holden already knew more about Amos's brutal upbringing on Earth than he wanted to. Better head back, I guess, Holden said after a few more pleasant moments in the breeze. Might have an RCE reply to my requests. Yeah, Amos snorted. If the RCE bigwig sent a reply seconds after receiving your message, they should be arriving just about now. I won't let your facts about light delay get in the way of my optimism. Not much does. Holden was silent for a long moment. He licked his lips. If they say no, he said, if they're committed to letting Murtry hold on to her, I'm going to have to make a decision about whether she's more important than keeping this place from devolving into a shooting war. Yup. I'm pretty sure I know what I'm going to pick, too. Yup. There will be people who think I'm very selfish. True, Amos said. But also, fuck them. They're not us. That us and them thing is the problem at the base of all this. Holden started, but his hand terminal interrupted, a high-priority alarm sounding. It was the alert reserved for crew person in danger. Naomi. He thought, something happened to Naomi. Amos took a few steps toward Holden, his brow furrowing and hands clenching into fists. His mind had gone to the same place. If something had actually happened to Naomi, there was no way he'd be able to stop Amos from killing Murtry this time. Probably he wouldn't even try. Holden here, he said, trying to keep his voice level. Cap, we got a problem, Alex replied. His voice was shaky, terrified. Holden had flown with Alex through half a dozen battles. Not even when the missile trails filled the sky around them had he ever heard his pilot panic. Whatever it was, it was bad. Is she hurt? What? Who? You mean Naomi? Naomi's fine, as far as I know, Alex replied. You're in deep shit, Captain. Holden looked around. First landing looked quiet. A new shift of belters were boarding the carts that would take them to the mine. A few people walked the streets, going about their business. The two RCE security people on patrol were chatting amiably with a local and sipping some sort of hot drink from a thermos. The only violent thing happening within line of sight was a mimic lizard slowly dragging a stomach-engulfed bird back through its gullet. Okay, Holden said. Something blew up on the other side of the planet, Alex said, talking fast enough to stumble over his words, most of his drawl disappearing. Absolutely flattened an island chain over there. I mean, it's like someone dropped a rock. Kill the dinosaurs kind of thing. Shockwave is heading around the planet right now. You have about six hours, maybe. Amos had traded his angry face in for one of genuine surprise. It wasn't an expression he wore often, and it made him look vaguely childlike. Six hours until what, Alex? Holden said. Details, please. Figure two, three hundred kilometer an hour winds, lightning, torrential rains. You're far enough inland to avoid the three kilometer high tsunami. 
Basic Wrath of God package minus drowning, Holden said, reaching for humor to hide his rising fear. How certain is this? Uh, Captain, I'm watching the other side of the planet rip itself to shreds right now. This isn't a prediction. This is thousands of clicks of planet between you and the apocalypse disappearing fast. Got some video to send? Yep, said the pilot. Got fresh underwear for after you watch it? Send it anyway. I may need it to convince the locals. Holding out. So, Cap, Amos said. What's the plan? I haven't got a clue. Run it again, Murtry said, after Holden played the apocalyptic video Alex had shot with the Rosinantes telescopes. Holden, Murtry, and Carol Chiwiwi were in the town hall, Holden's terminal synced up to the big screen hanging on one wall. Holden obliged and played through the recording a second time. Again, the big island disappeared in a flash of light and a column of fire. Again, the other islands vanished under a massive wall of water, and then the spreading clouds of steam and ash. Again, the shock wave raced away from the center of the explosion, dragging massive waves behind it. As the video played, Murtry talked quietly on his hand terminal with someone. Carol shook her head gently, as though it were possible to deny the evidence playing on screen. The video ended, and Murtry said, This is matching our data. The geoengineering group thinks there was some kind of fission reaction down near the bottom of the ocean. Holden prickled at the implication he might be lying about something so serious, but held his tongue. Like a bomb? Carol Chiwiwi said. Or an alien power plant failing out, Murtry said. Can't really speculate. How quickly can we evacuate? Carol said, her voice surprisingly firm for a person who'd just looked Armageddon in the eye. That's what we're here to talk about, Holden said. What's our best plan for protecting the colony? Evacuation is one option, but we're down to a little over five hours now. Evacuation won't work, Murtry said, at least using our shuttle. The window's too tight. We'd be taking off in the face of that shockwave, with turbulence and atmospheric ionization doing its best to knock us out of the sky. Better to survive down here, and still have a shuttle available afterward for relief. Holden frowned and nodded. I hate to admit it, but I agree. Alex says he can't put the Rosie down and get it back off the ground before the blast. And if we do try to evacuate... We'll probably have riots on our hands. How do you tell someone that their kid doesn't get to leave on the shuttle? Riots won't be a problem, Murtry said. The calm of his voice was chilling. How do we protect everyone, the entire colony? Holden said, again choosing to ignore the provocation. There's mines, Amos said. He hovered over Holden like an anxious parent. He'd started doing that whenever Murtry was around. No, Carol shook her head. It's low ground. It'll flood if we get too much rain. I think we should count on anything that can go wrong doing so, Holden agreed. So no pits and caves that can fill up with water. I'm thinking the ruins. Murtry leaned back in his chair, frowning. What makes you think those'll hold up the 300-kilometer-an-hour winds? Honestly, I have no good reason to believe that, Holden said, but they've been there a very long time. That's what I've got. Hope that if they made it this far, they can make it through what's coming. Better than those huts you guys are living in, Amos added with a beefy shrug. I can kick down any building in this town in ten minutes. Murtry leaned back even farther in his chair, staring up at the ceiling and making clicking noises with his tongue. After a few seconds, he said, Okay, that's as good a plan as any I have. 
We just need to outlive that initial shock wave. What comes after will be bad, but we'll be able to take any survivors off through it. So, let's play it your way. I'll get my people moving. Better get the word out. Carol, find as many people as you can to spread the news, Holden said. Make sure everyone brings as much food and water as they can reasonably carry, but nothing else. The planet's on fire. Can't stop to save mementos. I'll give her a hand, Amos said. We're on the clock, Holden reminded them, punching an alert into his hand terminal as he said it. I want to see all of you inside the structure in four hours, not a minute later. We'll try, Carol said. It took longer to move the colonists than Holden had hoped. Each person told had to express shock and disbelief. Then they had to have a conversation about their surprise. Then they had to have a conversation about what items they'd bring with them. Some argued about bringing personal items, each one sure that their particular case was unique. Every time Holden heard it happen, he wanted to start shouting. It was the blue sky and gentle breeze. The disaster just wasn't real to them. Not when they could look out across the sky and see nothing but wisps of cloud. They were playing along because Holden and Carol and Murtry were in charge. And you did what the people in charge asked you to do, unless there was a compelling reason not to. But Holden could see the disbelief in their eyes, hear it in every silly delay and argument. Across the street, a man was clutching a bundle of clothing under one arm while he dragged a large plastic container of water behind him. Amos walked over and traded a few smiling words with the man. The man vigorously shook his head and tried to walk off. Amos grabbed the bundle of clothes out of his hands and threw them on top of a nearby hut, then picked up the water and shoved it into the man's arms. The man started to argue, but Amos stared him down with a vague smile, and eventually the other man turned and left, trudging after the others headed to the alien ruins. Captain, a tentative voice said to his back. He turned around to find Elvi Okoy smiling up at him, a large sack thrown over one shoulder. Hello, he said. What have you got there? It's blankets. Fayez and Sudyam and I are bringing all the blankets we had at the compound. The temperature's sure to drop significantly once the debris cloud covers us. The nights will get cold. Good thinking. We should probably tell some more people to bring blankets. So, she added, still with her unsure half-smile. I wanted to ask for some help for the chemical sciences group. Help? The chemical analysis deck is pretty heavy, and they're having trouble moving it. One or two more people would make the job a lot easier. Holden laughed in disbelief. We won't be doing science up there, Elvie. Tell them to ditch it and carry water or food instead. It makes water, she said. They can carry... It makes what? It can sterilize and distill water, she said, nodding as if by doing so she could make him agree faster. We might need it for when, you know, the bottles run out. Yes, he said, feeling like an idiot. Yes, she agreed, smiling helpfully. Amos, he yelled. When the big man came over, he pointed at Elvie and said, Find someone to help you, then follow her. There's a big piece of equipment they need help moving. Equipment? Amos frowned. Wouldn't food or water be... It makes water, Holden and Elvie said at the same time. Roger, Amos said and left in a hurry. Holden noticed that a subtle darkening of the sky had begun. The sun was still high. It was barely past midday and into the early afternoon. But the sunlight was shifting toward red, and the world was darkening along with it, as though a beautiful sunset were starting about five hours early. Something about the change sent a shiver up his spine. Get up there, 
Holden said, giving Elvie a gentle push toward the alien towers. Go now. Tell your people to hurry. To her credit, she didn't argue, just took off at a dead run back toward the RCE science compound. All around him, the colonists were moving faster, arguing less, and casting the occasional frightened glance at the sky. Holden hadn't been inside the alien structure since he'd looked it over as a crime scene. It had the same eerie and inhuman aesthetic sense he'd seen before, first on Eros after the infection, and later on the ring station at the heart of the gate network. Curves and angles that were subtly wrong, and yet weirdly beautiful at the same time. He tried to imagine what use the protomolecule masters had made of the buildings, and failed. He couldn't picture them housing machines like a factory, nor could he picture them as dwellings, scattered with furniture and personal items. It was as if, standing empty as they were, they still fulfilled whatever alien function they'd always been meant to serve. It was also where Bossia Merton and the others had hidden their explosives, where they'd killed the security team. The bloodiest crimes that had been committed on the planet had all been centered right here, where they were all going now. Give me another recount, Carol Chewiwi said to her aides. Who are we missing? Find out who we're missing. She'd been doing head counts of the colonists ever since she'd arrived, almost the last person in. They kept coming up with new numbers over and over, as stragglers drifted in and people milled around. It was an impossible task, but Holden respected her commitment to ensuring they left no one behind. The RCE science team huddled together in one rounded corner of the building's large central room, Elvie among them. Several scientists were fiddling with a large machine, getting it ready to purify large quantities of water, Holden hoped. Lucia drifted across the room to exchange a few words with Elvie, her son Yasek in tow. Holden breathed a sigh of relief they'd both made it. Basia would be up on the Rosinante going out of his mind with worry, and Holden was happy he'd be able to report that they were as safe as he could make them. Hey, Cap, Amos said, coming out of a side room with several colonists trailing. We got a problem. Another one? Worse than the cataclysmic storm heading our way? Related, I guess you could say, Amos replied. We've been going through the head counts, and it looks like the Dalkey family is missing. We're sure about that? Pretty, Amos said with a shrug. Carol saw them talking and made her way through the crowded room toward them. One hundred percent sure, she said. Clay Dalkey was in town picking up supplies when we warned him. He headed out to get his wife and daughter. They've got the house farthest outside of town. I should have sent someone along, but I was stupid. You had plenty to do, Holden reassured her. How far from here is the Dalkey place? Three clicks, Amos said. I'm about to head out with these guys and see if we can find them. Wait a minute, Holden said. I'm not sure you can make a six-kilometer round trip with the time we have left, let alone look for someone. Not leaving that little girl out there, Chief, Amos said. He kept his voice carefully neutral, but Holden could hear the barest presentiment of a threat hiding in it. All right, Holden said, giving in. But let me call up to the Rossi and get an update. At least let me do that. Sure, Amos said agreeably. Someone's looking for a poncho for the kid right now, anyway. Holden headed out of the main room and through the confusion of smaller chambers around it, trying to find the entrance. The alien building was a maze of connecting passages and rooms. As he walked, he pulled out his hand terminal. Alex, this is Holden. Are you listening? The sound coming out of the terminal was filled with static from the atmosphere's heavy ionization, but Holden could still hear Alex when he said, 
Alex here. What's the word? Give me an update. How close are we? Oh, boss, you just need to look west. The fear in Alex's voice was audible even over the heavy static. Holden stepped out of the alien tower's main entrance and looked toward the slowly setting sun. A curtain of black covered the horizon as far as the eye could see. It was moving so quickly that even from dozens of kilometers away, it appeared to hurtle toward him. A black, roiling cliff shot through with lightning. The ground beneath his feet trembled and shook, and Holden remembered that sound moved more quickly through a solid than through the air. The vibration he felt now was the sound of all that fury coming through the earth like an early warning. Even as he thought it, a rising roar started in the west. What's it look like? Amos had come into the antechamber and was pulling a light backpack on. His colonist friends stood behind him, their faces a mixture of hope and fear. It's too late, big man, Holden said, looking west and shaking his head. It's way too late. He wasn't sure, as he said it, if he meant for the Dalkies or for all of them. Chapter 30 Elvi. The storm front came, seeming slow at first, a tall, purple-black churn, higher than skyscrapers, with only the slightest stirrings in the warm air to show that it was real, and then between one breath and the next, hit with the violence of a blow. Air and water and mud jetted through the windows, archways, and holes in the ruin like the stream from a fire hose. It did not simply roar, it deafened. Elvie curled with her back against the wall of the ruin, her arms wrapped around her knees, and endured. The walls shuddered against her spine, vibrating with the hurricane gusts. Across from her, Michaela had her hands over her ears, her mouth open in a shriek that Elvie couldn't hear. She had thought the rain would be cold, but it wasn't. The slurry that soaked up on the ruin's floor was warm and salty, and somehow that was worse. She laced her fingers together, squeezing until her knuckles ached. The mud-thick water filled the air until the spray made it hard to breathe. Someone lurched through the archway to her left, but she could no more make out who than stop the catastrophe by willing it. She felt certain that the ruins would fail, the more than ancient walls snap apart, and she and all the rest of them would be thrown into the storm, crushed or drowned, or both. All she could think of was being in the heavy shuttle, the confusion and the panic when it was going down, the trauma of the impact. This felt the same, but it went on and on and on, until she found herself almost missing the sudden impact of the crash. That, at least, had ended. She knew that it was daytime, but the only lights were the cold white of the emergency lights and the near-constant barrage of lightning that caught people's faces like a strobe. A young man, his face set and stony like an image of suffering and endurance. A child no more than eight years old, his head buried in his mother's shoulder. Way and Murtry in uniform, standing as close as lovers and shouting into each other's ears in the effort to be heard, their faces flushed red. The vast shifts of barometric pressure were invisible, but she felt them in the sense of overwhelming illness, of wrongness, that washed through her body. She couldn't tell if the shaking came from the walls of the storm-battered ruins, more little earthquakes, or her own overloaded nervous system. At some point, her perception of time changed. She couldn't say if the storm had been hours or days or minutes. It was like the half-awareness of trauma, the doomed patience of being assaulted and knowing the only thing that would end it was the mercy of the attacker. Now and then, she would feel herself rising to some fuller consciousness and will herself back into the stupor. Shock. 
Maybe she was going into shock. Her awareness seemed to blink in and out. She was curled against Fayez, both her hands squeezing at his elbow, and didn't remember how she'd gotten there. The dark slurry of mud was ankle-high all through the ruins, brown and green. She was covered in it. They were all covered in it. When this is over, I'm going to go back to my hut, take a long bath and sleep for a week, she thought. She knew it was ridiculous. Her hut would no more have withstood this than a match could stay lit underwater. But she still thought it, and some part of her believed it was true. A blinding bright flash and crackling detonation came almost simultaneously. She gritted her teeth, closed her eyes, and endured. The first change she noticed was a baby screaming. It was an exhausted sound. She shifted, her shirt and pants soaked and cold, and adhering to her skin with the muck. She craned her neck, trying to find where the grating noise was coming from. She felt the thought shifting at the base of her skull before she knew what it was, a surreal lag between the realization and being conscious of it. She could hear a baby crying. She could hear something, anything, that wasn't the malice and venom of the storm. She tried to stand up, and her legs buckled under her. Kneeling in the muck, she gathered herself, squared her shoulders, and tried again. The rain slanted in through the windows of the ruin, but only at about twenty degrees. It still fell in buckets out of a black sky. The wind gusted and pushed and howled. In any other context, it would have been the teeth of a gale. Here and now, it meant the worst was over. Dr. Akoy? Mercury's face was lit from below. The emergency lantern hung over his shoulder. His expression was the same polite smile over sober, focused attention. Her battered mind wondered whether there was anything that could shake the man's soul, and thought perhaps there wasn't. She wanted to be reassured by his predictability, but her body wasn't able to feel comfort. Not now. You all right, doctor? He said, his hand on her shoulder. She nodded, and when he started to step away, she clutched at him. How long? The front hit a little over sixteen hours ago, he said. Thank you, she said, and turned back to the window and the rain. The lightning still played among the clouds and lanced down to the ground, but not so often now. The flashes showed her a transformed landscape. Rivers flowed where yesterday had been desert hardpan. The flowers, or what she thought of as flowers, were churned into nothing. Not even sticks remained. She couldn't imagine how the mimic lizards could have survived, or the bird-like animals she'd thought of as rock sparrows. She'd meant to go to the wash east of First Landing and collect samples of the pink lichen that clung in the shadows there. She wouldn't get to now. The sense of loss was like a weight on her throat. She had glimpsed an ecosystem unlike anything anyone had ever seen before, a web of life that had grown up apart from anything she had known. She and her work groups had been the only people ever to walk in that garden, and now it was gone. The usual state of nature is recovering from the last disaster, she said. It was a truism of ecological biologists, and she said it the way a religious person might pray, to make sense of what she saw, to comfort herself, to give the world some sense of purpose or meaning. Species rose in an environment, and that environment changed. It was the nature of the universe, as true here as it had 